Preface of the Elder Eddas by Seyman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snor Sturlson. Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. Preface Saymund, son of Sigfus, the reputed collector of the poems bearing his name, which is sometimes also called the Elder and the Poetic Edda, was of a highly distinguished family, being descended in a direct line from King Harald Hildeton. He was born at Odi, his paternal dwelling in the south of Iceland, between the years 1054 and 1057, or about fifty years after the establishment by law of the Christian religion on that island. Hence it is easy to imagine that many heathens, or baptized favors of the old mythic songs of heathenism, may have lived in his days and imparted to him the lays of the times of old, which his unfettered mind induced him to hand down to posterity. The youth of Saymond was passed in travel and study in Germany and France, and according to some accounts in Italy. His cousin, John Ogmundson, who later became first bishop of Holum, and after his death was received among the number of saints, when on his way to Rome fell in with his youthful kinsman, and took him back with him to Iceland in the year 1076. Saymond afterwards became a priest at Odi, where he instructed many young men in useful learning, but the effects of which were not improbably such as to the common people might appear as witchcraft or magic, and indeed Saymond's predilection for the sagas and songs of the old heathen times, even for the magical ones, was so well known that among his countrymen there were some who regarded him as a great sorcerer, though chiefly in what is called white or innocuous and defensive sorcery, a repute which still clings to his memory among the common people of Iceland, and who will long adhere to it through the numerous and popular stories regarding him, some of them highly entertaining, that are orally transmitted from generation to generation. Saman died at the age of seventy-seven, leaving behind him a work on the history of Norway and Iceland, which is now almost entirely lost. The first who ascribed to Saman the collection of poems known as the Poetic Edda was Binjolf Svensson, Bishop of Skaholt. This prelate, who was a zealous collector of ancient manuscripts, found in the year 1643 the old vellum codex, which is the most complete of all the known manuscripts of the Edda. Of this he caused a transcript to be made, which he entitled, Era Semundi Multiskii. The transcript came into the possession of the royal historiographer Torfeus. The original, together with the other manuscripts, were presented to the king of Denmark, Frederick the Third, and placed in the royal library at Copenhagen, where it now is. As many of the Eddic poems seem to have been orally transmitted in an imperfect state, the collector has supplied the deficiencies by prose insertions whereby the integrity of the subject is to a certain degree restored. The collection called Samen's Edda consists of two parts, the mythological and the heroic. It is the former of these which is now offered to the public in an English version. In the year 1797 a translation of this first part by A. S. Cottle was published at Bristol. This work I have never met with, nor have I seen any English version of any part of the Edda, with the exception of Gray's spirited but free translation of the Vectomskrida. The Lay of Volund celebrates the stories of Volund's doings and sufferings during his sojourn in the territory of the Swedish king Nidud. Volund is the Scandinavian and Germanic Vulcan, and Daedalus. In English, his story, as a skilful smith, is traceable to a very early period. In the Anglo-Saxon poem of Beowulf, we find that hero desiring, in the event of his falling into conflict with Grendel, that his corslets may be sent to Hegelic, being, as he says, the work of Weyland, and King Elfred, in his translation of Bothius de Consolatione, renders the words Fidelis osa fabricii, etc., by fate, Belondus. Where are now the bones of the famous and wise goldsmith Wayland? Evidently taking the proper name of Fabricius for an appellative to Faber. In the Exeter Book too, there is a poem in substance closely resembling the Eddic Lay. In his novel of Kenilworth, Walter Scott has been guiltily of a woeful perversion of the old tradition, travestied from the Berkshire legend of Wayland Smith. As a land boundary, we find Wayland Smithy in a charter of King Adred, A.D. 955. On the lay of Helgi Hjörvord's son, there is nothing to remark beyond what appears in the poem itself. The lays of Helgi Hundingside form the first of the series of stories relating to the Volsung race and the Gyokungs, or Niflungs. The connection of the several personages celebrated in these poems will appear plain from the following tables. 
The Attic series of the Volsung and Niflung lays terminates with the lay of Hamdir. The one entitled Gunnar's Melody is no doubt a comparatively late composition, yet being written in the true ancient spirit of the North is well deserving of a place among the Attic poems. Nor indeed does the claim of the lay of Garotti to rank among the poems collected by Samond by any means clear. We know it only from its existence in the Skalda. Yet on account of its antiquity, its intrinsic worth, and its reception in other editions of the Edda, both in original and translation, the present work would seem, and justly so, incomplete without it. The prose, or younger Edda, is generally ascribed to the celebrated Snorr Stilson, who was born of a distinguished Icelandic family in the year 1178, and after leading a turbulent and ambitious life, and being twice the supreme magistrate of the Republic, was killed, A.D. 1241 by three of his sons-in-law and a stepson. When Snorri was three years old, John Lobston of Odi, the grandson of Samund the Wise, took him into fosterage. Snorri resided at Odi until his twentieth year, and appears to have received an excellent education from his foster-father, who was one of the most learned men of that period. How far he may have made use of the manuscripts of Samund and Eri, which were preserved at Odi, it is impossible to say. Neither do we know the precise contents of these manuscripts but it is highly probable that the most important parts of the work, now known under the title The Prose Edda, formed a part of them, and that Snorri, who may be regarded as the Scandinavian humorous, merely added a few chapters, in order to render the mythology more conformable to the erroneous notions he appears to have entertained respecting its signification. Be this as it may, the Prose Edda, in its present form, dates from the 13th century, and consists of one formale, or the prologue, two, Gilfa Ginning, the deluding of Gilfi, three, Braga Rodur, conversations of Bragi, four, Eptermali, after discourse, or epilogue. The prologue and epilogue were probably written by Snorri himself, and are nothing more than an absurd syncretism of Hebrew, Greek, Roman, and Scandinavian myths and legends, in which Noah, Priam, Odin, Hector, Thor, Aeneas, etc., are jumbled together much in the same manner as the romances of the Middle Ages. These dissertations, utterly worthless in themselves, have obviously nothing in common with the so-called prose edda, the first part of which, containing fifty-three chapters, forms a complete synopsis of Scandinavian mythology, derived principally from the poetical edda. End of the preface Footnotes 1. The following, the first among many, may serve as a specimen. Samond was residing in the south of Europe with a famous master, by whom he was instructed in every kind of lore, while on the other hand he forgot, apparently through intense study, all that he had previously learned, even to his own name, so that when the holy man John Ugmundson came to his abode, he told him that his name was Cole, but on John insisting that he was no other than the same in Sigfusson born at Odi in Iceland, and relating to him many particulars regarding himself, he at length became conscious of his own identity, and resolved to flee from the place with his kinsmen. For the purpose of deceiving the master, John continued some time into the place, and often came to visit him in Samund, till at last one dark night they betook themselves to flight. No sooner had the master missed them than he spent in pursuit of them, but in vain, and the heavens were too overcast to admit according to his custom, of reading their whereabouts in the stars. So they travelled day and night, and all the following day. But the next night was clear, and the master at once read in the stars where they were, and set out after them at full speed. Then Samond, casting his eyes up the heavens, said, Now is my master in chase of us, and sees where we are. And on John asking what was to be done, he answered, Take one of my shoes off, fill it with water, and set it on my head. John did so, and at that same moment the master, looking up at the heavens, says to his companion, Bad news, the stranger John has drowned my pupil, there is water about his forehead, and thereupon returned home. The pair now again prosecute the journey night and day, but in the following night the master again consults the stars, when, to his great amazement, he sees the star of Samon directly above his head, and again sets off after the fugitives. Observing this, Samon says, The astrologer is again after us, and again we must look to ourselves. Take my shoe off again, and with your knife stab me in the thigh, fill the shoe with blood, and place it on the top of my head. John does as directed, and the master again, gazing at the stars, says, there is blood now about the star of Master Cole, and the stranger has for certain murdered him, and so returns home. The old man now has once more recourse to his art, but on seeing Samon's star shining brightly above him, he exclaimed, My pupil is still living, so much the better, 
I have taught him more than enough, for he outdoes me both in astrology and magic. Let them now proceed in safety. I am unable to hinder the departure. End of footnote one about the stories of Samond. Footnote four. Snorri, at the death of John Lopson, A.D. 1197, does not appear to have possessed any property whatever, though he afterwards became the wealthiest man in Iceland. His rise in the world was chiefly owing to his marriage with Herdisa, the daughter of a priest called Bersi the Rich, a very enviable surname which no doubt enabled the reverend gentleman to brave the decrees of popes and councils and take to himself a wife, who brought him a very considerable fortune. If we may judge from Snorri's biography, Christianity appears to have effected very little change in the character of the Icelanders. We have the same turbulent and sanguinary scenes, the same loose conduct of the woman, perfidy and remorselessness, cruelty of the men, as in pagan times. End of footnote four. End of preface. Introduction of the Elder Eddas by Samen Sikfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson. Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. Introduction to the Voluspa. As introductory to the Voluspa, the following description of a wandering Vala, or prophetess, may be thought both desirable and interesting. We find them present at the birth of children when they seem to represent the norms. They acquired their knowledge either by means of said during the night while all others in the house were sleeping, and uttered their oracles in the morning, or they received sudden inspirations during the singing of certain songs appropriate to the purpose, without which the sorcery could not perfectly succeed. These said women were common over all the north. When invited by the master of a family, they appeared in a peculiar costume, sometimes with a considerable number of followers, e.g., with fifteen young men and fifteen girls. For their soothsaying they received money, gold rings, and other precious things. Sometimes it was necessary to compel them to prophecy. An old description of such a Vala, who went from guild to guild telling fortunes, will give the best idea of these women and their proceedings. Thorbjorg, nicknamed the Little Vala, during the winter attended the guilds, at the invitation of those who desired to know their fate, or the quality of the coming year. Everything was prepared in the most sumptuous manner for her reception. There was an elevated seat on which lay a cushion stuffed with feathers. A man was sent to meet her. She came in the evening dressed in a blue mantle fastened with thongs and set with stones down to the lap. Round her neck she had a necklace of glass bead, and on her head a hood of black lambskin lined with white catskin. In her hand a staff, the head of which was mounted with brass and ornamented with stones. Round her body she wore a girdle of agaric, from which hung a bag containing her conjuring apparatus. On her feet were rough calfskin shoes with long ties and tin buttons. On her hands, catskin gloves, white and hairy within. All bade her welcome with a reverent salutation. The master himself conducted her by the hand to her seat. She undertook no prophecy on the first day, but would have first passed a night there. In the evening of the following day she ascended her elevated seat, caused the women to place themselves around her, and desired them to sing certain songs which they did in a strong, clear voice. She then prophesied of the coming year, and afterwards all that would advanced and asked her such questions as they thought proper, to which they received plain answers. In the following grand and ancient lay, dating most probably from the time of heathenism, are set forth as the utterances of Vala, or wandering prophetess, as above described, the story of the creation of the world from chaos, of the origin of the giants, the gods, the dwarves, and the human race, together with other events relating to the mythology of the north and ending with the destruction of the gods and the world and the renewal end of introduction section two of the elder eddas of samen sikfusen and the younger eddas of snorri sturlson edited by rasmus b anderson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. The Voluspa, the Vala's Prophecy. For silence I pray all sacred children, great and small, sons of Heimdall. They will that I Valfather's deeds recount, men's ancient saws, those that I best remember. The Jotuns I remember early born, those whom me of old have reared. I nine worlds remember, nine trees, the great central tree beneath the earth. There was in times of old where Ymir dwelt, nor sand, nor sea, nor gelid waves. Earth existed not, nor heaven above. 
twas a chaotic chasm and grass nowhere before bur suns raised up heaven's vault they who the noble mid-earth shaped the sun shone from the south over the structure's rocks then was the earth begrown with herbage green the sun from the south the moon's companion her right hand cast about the heavenly horses the sun knew not where she a dwelling had the moon knew not what power he possessed the stars knew not where they had a station then went the powers all to their judgment seats the all holy gods and thereon held counsel to-night into the waning moon gave names morn they named and midday afternoon and eve whereby to reckon years the azure met on ida's plain they altar steads and temples high constructed their strength they proved all things tried furnaces established precious things forged formed tongs and fabricated tools at tables played at home joyous they were to them was not the want of gold until there came thirst maidens three all powerful from jotunheim then went all the powers to their judgment seats the all-holy gods and thereon held counsel who should of the dwarves the race create from the sea giants blood and livid bones then was Motsognir created greatest of all the dwarves and durin second therein man's likeness they created many dwarves from earth as durin said Nii and Nidi, Nodri, Sudri, Ostri and Vestri, Althiof, Dval and Nar and Nain, Nipping, Dane, Bivor, Bevor, Bombor, Nori, An and Anor, Ai, Jot, Vitnir, Veig and Gandalf, Vindolf, Thrain, Thek and Thorn, Thror, Vitter and Litter, Nur and Nirad, Regan and Red Speed. Now all the dwarves I have rightly told. Thili, Kili, Funden, Nali, Hepti, Vili, Hanor, Sfior, Billing, Bruni, Bild, Bruri, Frar, Hornbori, Freig, and Loni, Auravang, Iari, Aikinskialdi. Time tis of the dwarves and Dvalin's band, to the sons of men, to Lofor up to reckon, those who came forth from the world's rocks, earth's foundations, to Yora's plains. There were Dropnir and Dolgthrasir, Har, Hogsbori, Hulvang, Gloi, Skivir, Divir, Skefid, Ai, Alf, and Yingve, Aiken, Skialdi, Fialar, and Frosty, Find, and Ginnar, Hari, Hokstori, Hilildorf, Moin, that above all, while mortals live, the progeny of Lofor accounted be. Until there came three mighty and benevolent Asia to the world from the assembly, they found on earth nearly powerless Ask and Embla, void of destiny spirit they possessed not sense they had not blood nor motive powers nor goodly colour spirit gave odin sense gave honir blood gave loder and goodly colour i know an ash standing yggdrasil height a lofty tree laved with limpid water thence come the dews into the dales that fall ever stands it green over urd's fountain thence come maidens much knowing three from the hall which under that tree stands Erd hight the one, the second for Dandi, and on a table they graved, schooled the third. Laws they established, life allotted to the sons of men, destinies pronounced. Alone she sat without when came that ancient dread Asia's prince, and in his eyes she gazed. Of what wouldst thou ask me? Why tempest thou me, Odin? I know all where thou thine eye didst sink in the pure well of Mim. Mim drinks mead each morn from Valfather's pledge, understand ye yet or what the chief of hosts gave her rings and necklace useful discourse and a divining spirit wide and far she saw o'er every world she the valkyrie saw from afar coming ready to ride to the god's people skuld held a shield skogel was second then gun hild gundul and gir skogel now are enumerated harian's maidens the valkyrie ready over the earth to ride she that war remembers the first on earth when golvig they with lances pierced and in the high one's hall her burnt thrice burnt thrice brought her forth oft not seldom yet she still lives heidi they called her with soer she came the well-foreseeing vala wolves she tamed magic arts she knew magical arts practised ever was she the joy of evil people then went the powers all to their judgment seats the all-holy gods, and thereon held counsel whether the Asia should avenge the crime, or all the gods receive atonement. Broken was the outer wall of Asia's burr. 
the vanir foreseeing conflict tramp o'er the plains odin cast his spear and mid the people hurled it that was the first warfare in the world then went the powers all to their judgment seats the all holy gods and thereon held counsel who had all the air with evil mingled or to the jotun race odds maiden had given there alone was thor with anger swollen he seldom sits when of the like he hears oaths are not held sacred nor words nor swearing nor binding compacts reciprocally made she knows that heimdall's horn is hidden under the heaven-bright holy tree a river she sees flow with foamy fall from valfather's pledge understand ye yet or what east sat the crone in yard viadir and there reared up fenrir's progeny of all shall be one especially the moon's devourer in a troll semblance he is seated with the last breath of dying man the god's seat he with red gore defiles swart is the sunshine then for summers after all weather turns to storm understand you yet or what there on a height sat striking a harp the giantess's watch the joyous egg deer by him crowed in the bird wood the bright red cock which feel our height crowed o'er the azure gulunkambi which wakens hears with the sire of hosts but another crows beneath the earth a suit red cock in the halls of hell i saw of balder the blood-stained god odin's son the hidden fate there stood grown up high on the plain slender and passing fair the mistletoe from that shrub was made as to me it seemed a deadly noxious dart hoder shot it forth but frig bewailed in fenselir valhall's calamity understand ye yet or what bound she saw lying under hvaraland a monstrous form to loki like there sits sigyn for her consort's sake not right glad understand ye yet or what then the vala knew the fatal bonds were twisting most rigid bonds from entrails made from the east of river falls through venom dales with mire and clods slid is its name on the north there stood on nida falls a hall of gold for sindri's race and another stood in okolnir the jotun's beer hall which brumir hight she saw a hall standing far from the sun in nostrand its doors are northward turned venom drops falls in through its apertures and twined is that hall with serpents backs there she saw waiting the sluggish dreams bloodthirsty men and perjurers and him who the ear beguiles of another's wife there nid hug sucks the corpses of the dead the wolf tears men understand ye yet or what further forward i see much can i say of ragnarok and the gods conflict brothers shall fight and slay each other cousins shall kinship violate the earth resounds the giantesses flee no man will another spare hard is it in the world great whoredom an axe age a sword age shield shall be cloven a wind age a wolf age ere the world sinks mim's sons dance but the central tree takes fire at the resounding gyalor horn loud blows heimdall his horn is raised odin speaks with mim's head trembles yggdrasil's ash yet standing groans that aged tree and the jotun is loose loud bays garm before the nupa cave his bonds he runs asunder and the wolf runs Hrim steers from the east the waters rise the mundane snake is coiled in jotun rage the worm beats the water and the eagle screams the pale of beak tears carcasses nagfar is loosed that ship fares from the east come will muspel's people o'er the sea and loki steers the monster's kin goes all with the wolf and then their brother as of by lyst on their course surt from the south comes with flickering flame shines from his sword the vow god's son the stony hills are dashed together the giantesses totter men tread the path of hell and heaven is cloven how is it with the azure how with the alfar all jotunheim resounds the azure are in council the dwarves groan before their stony doors the sages of the rocky walls understand ye yet or what then arises flee second grief when odin goes with the wolf to fight and the bright slayer of belly with cert then will frigg's beloved fall then comes the great victor sire son vidar to fight with the deadly beast he with his hands will make his sword pierce to the heart of the giant's son, then avenges he his father. 
Then comes the mighty son of Flodin. Odin's son goes with the monster to fight. Midgard's Vior in his rage will slay the worm. Nine feet will go Fjorgin's son, bowed by the serpent who feared no foe. All men will their homes forsake. The sun darkens, earth and ocean sinks, fall from the heaven the bright stars. Fire's breath assails the all-nourishing tree. Towering fire plays against heaven itself. She sees arise a second time earth from ocean, beauteously green, waterfalls descending, the eagle flying over which in the fell captures fish. The Azure meet on Ida's plain, and of the mighty earth encircler speak, and there to memory call their mighty deeds, and the supreme God's ancient lore. There shall be again the wondrous golden tables and the grass be found, which in the days of old had possessed the ruler of the gods and Fiolnor's race. Unsown shall be the fields bring forth, all evil be amended. Baldur shall come, Hoder and Baldur, the heavenly gods, Hrop's glorious dwelling shall inhabit. Understand ye yet, or what? Then can Honir choose his lot, and the two brothers' sons inhabit the spacious Vindheim. Understand ye yet, or what? She a hall standing, then the sun brighter, with gold bedecked in Gimel. There shall be righteous people dwell, and for evermore happiness and joy. Then comes the mighty one to the great judgment, the powerful from above who rules o'er all. He shall dooms pronounce and strife allay, holy peace establish, which shall ever be. There comes the dark dragon flying from beneath the glistening serpent, from Nidafels, on his wings bears Nidhogg, flying o'er the plain, a corpse now she will descend. End of the Voluspa Section 3. The Lay of Athrudnir, of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlsson, edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The Lay of Athrudnir. Odin visits the giant Jotun Vathrudnir for the purpose of proving his knowledge. They proposed questions relative to the cosmogony of the northern creed on the condition that the baffled party forfeit his head. The Jotun incurs the penalty. Odin. Counsel thou me now, Frigg, as I long to go to Vafthrudnir to visit. Great desire, I say I have, an ancient lore with that all-wise Jotun to contend. Frigg. At home to bide Herfather I would counsel, and the gods' dwellings, because no Jotun is, I believe, so mighty as is Vafthrudnir. Odin. Much have I journeyed, much experienced, mighty ones many proved, but this I fain would know, how in Vafthrudnir's halls it is. Frigg. In safety mayest thou go, in safety return, in safety on thy journeyings be, may thy wit avail thee, when thou father of men shalt hold converse with the Jotun. Then went Odin, the lord to prove of that all-wise Jotun, to the hall he came which Im's father owned, Yig went forth within. Odin, hail to thee, Vafthrudnir, to thy hall I am now come, thyself to see, for I would fain know whether thou art a cunning and all-wise Jotun. Vafthrudnir, what man is this that in my habitation by word addresses me? Out thou goest not from our halls, if thou art not the wiser. Odin, Gangrad is my name, for my journey I am come thirsty to thy halls, needing hospitality. For I long have journeyed, and kind reception from thee, Jotun. Vafthrudnir. Why then, Gangrad? Speakest thou from the floor? Take in the hall a seat, then shall be proved which knows most, the guest or the ancient talker. Gangrad. Or poor man should, who to a rich man comes, speak usefully, or hold his tongue. Over much talk brings him, I ween, no good, who visits an austere man. Vafthrudnir. Tell me, Gingrad, since on the floor thou wilt prove thy proficiency, how the horse is called that draws each day forth over humankind. Gingrad. Skinfaxi he is named, that the bright day draws forth over humankind. Of coursers he is best accustomed among the reed goths. Ever sheds light that horse's mane. Vafthrudnir. Tell me now, Gingrad, since on the floor thou wilt prove thy proficiency, how that steed is called which from the east draws night o'er the beneficent powers. Gangrad. 
Hrimfaxi he is called, that each night draws forth over the beneficent powers. He from his bit lets fall drop every morn, whence in the dales comes dew. Fafthrudnir. Tell me, Gangrad, since on the floor thou wilt prove thy proficiency, how the stream is called which earth divides between the Jotuns and the gods. Gangrad. Ifing the stream is called which earth divides between the Jotuns and the gods, open shall it run throughout all time, on that stream no ice shall be. Fafthrudnir. Tell me, Gangrad, since on the floor thou wilt prove thy proficiency, how that plain is called where in fight shall meet Surt and the gentle gods. Gangrad. Vigrid, the plain is called where in fight shall meet Surt and the gentle gods. A hundred ras it is on every side, the plain is to them decreed. Vafthrudnir. Wise art thou, O guest? Approach the Jotun's bench, and sitting, let us together talk. We will our heads in the hall pledge, guest, for wise utterance. Gingrad, tell me first if thy wit suffices, and thou, Vafthrudnir, knowest whence first came the earth in the high heaven, thou sagacious Jotun. Vafthrudnir, from Ymir's flesh the earth was formed, and from his bones the hills, the heaven from the skull of that ice-cold giant, and from his blood the sea. Gingrad, Tell me, secondly, if thy wit suffices, and thou, Fafthrudnir, knowest, whence came the moon which over mankind passes, and the sun likewise. Fafthrudnir. Mundilfuri hight he, who the moon's father is, and ache the sun's. Round heaven's journey each day they must, to count years for men. Gangrad. Tell me, thirdly, since thou art called wise, and if thou, Vafthrudnir, knowest whence came the day, which over people passes, and night with waning moons. Vafthrudnir. Delling hight he who the day's father is, but night was of Norvi born, the new and waning moons the beneficent powers created, to count years for men. Gangrad. Tell me fourthly, since they pronounce thee sage, and if thou, Vafthrudnir, knowest, whence winter came and warm summer first among the wise gods. Vafthrudnir. Then Sval hight he who winter's father is, and Svasud summers. Yearly they both shall ever journey, until the powers perish. Gangrad. Tell me fifthly, since they pronounce thee sage, and if thou, Vafthrudnir, knowest which of the Asia earliest, or of Ymir sons in the days of old existed. Vafthrudnir. Countless winters ere earth was formed was Bergelmir born. Thrudgelmir was his sire, his grandsire, Algelmir. Gangrad. Tell me sixly, since thou art called wise, and if thou, Vafthrudnir, knowest, whence first came Argelmir among the Jotun's son, thou sagacious Jotun. Vafthrudnir. From Elvagar sprang venom drops which grew till they became a Jotun, but sparks flew from the south world. To the ice the fire gave life. Gangrad. Tell me seventhly, since thou art called wise, and if thou knowest, Vafthrudnir, how he children begot the bold Jotun, as he had no giantess's company. Vafthrudnir. Under the armpit grew, to said, of the Hymthurs, a girl and boy together, foot with foot begat, and that wise Jotun a six-headed son. Gangrad. Tell me eighthly, since thou art called wise, and if thou knowest Vafthrudnir, what thou doest first remember, or earliest knowest, thou art an all-wise Jotun. Vafthrudnir. Countless winters ere earth was formed, Bergomir was born, that I first remember, when that wise Jotun in an ark was laid. Gangrad. Tell me ninthly, since thou art called wise, and if thou knowest Vafthrudnir, whence the wind comes that over ocean passes, itself invisible to man. Vafthrudnir. Preisvelg is he called, who at the end of heaven sits, a Jotun in an eagle's plumage, from his wings come, it is said, the wind that over all men passes. Gangrad, tell me tenthly, since thou knowest all the origin of the gods knowest, Vafthrudnir, whence Niord came among the Aesir's sons, or fanes and offersteads he rules by hundreds, yet was not among the Aesir born. Vafthrudnir, in Vanaheim wise powers him created, and to the gods a hostage gave. At the world's dissolution he will return to the wise Vanir. Gangrad, tell me eleventhly, since all the condition of the gods thou knowest, Vafthrudnir, what the Ein Harar do in Herefather's halls, unto the powers perish. 
Vafthrudnir. All the Einheriar in Odin's halls each day together fight. The fallen they choose, and from the conflict ride. Beer with the azure drink, of Seychrimnir eat their fill, then sit in harmony together. Tell me twelfthly, as thou all the condition of the gods knowest, Vafthrudnir, of the Jotun's secrets, and of all the gods say what truce is, thou all-knowing Jotun. Vafthrudnir, of the secrets of the Jotuns, and of all the gods, I can truly tell, for I have over each world travelled, to nine worlds I came, to Niflhel beneath. Here die men from hell. Gungrad, much have I journeyed, much experienced, mighty ones many proved. What mortals will live when the great thimble winter shall for men have passed? Vafthrudnir, Lif, and Lifthrasir, but they will be concealed in Hodmimir's holt. The morning dews they will have for food, from them shall men be born. Gangrad, much have I journeyed, much experienced, mighty ones many proved. Whence will come the sun in that fair heaven, when Fenrir has this devoured? Vafthrudnir, a daughter shall Alfrodo bear, ere Fenrir shall have swallowed her. The maid shall ride when the powers die on her mother's course. Gangrad, much have I journeyed, much experienced, mighty ones many proved. Who are the maidens that o'er the ocean travel, wise of spirit to journey? Vafthrudnir, o'er people's dwellings three descend of Mogthrasir's maidens, the sole Hamengir, who are in the world, although with Jotuns nurtured. Gangrad, much have I journeyed, much experienced, mighty ones many proved. Which of the Asia will rule o'er the gods' possession when Surt's fire shall be quenched? Vafthrudnir, Vidar and Vali will be the gods' holy fanes inhabit. When Surt's fire shall be quenched, Modi and Magni will Mjolnir possess, and warfare strive to end. Gangrad, much have I journeyed, much experienced, mighty ones many proved. What of Odin will the life's end be when the powers perish? Vafthrudnir, the wolf will the father of men devour, him Vidar will avenge. He his cold jaws will cleave in conflict with the wolf. Gangrad, much have I journeyed, much experienced, mighty ones many proved. What said Odin in his son's ear, ere he on the pile was laid? Vafthrudnir, that no one knoweth what thou in days of old saidst in thy son's ear. With dying mouth my ancient saws I have said, and the god's destruction. With Odin I have contended in wise utterances. Of men thou ever art the wisest. End of section 3 Section 4 The Lay of Grimnir Of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The Lay of Grimnir The subject is wholly mythological. King Hraudung had two sons, one named Agnar, the other Geirod. Agnar was ten, and Geirod eight winters old. They both rowed out in a boat with their hooks and lines to catch small fish. But the wind drove them out to sea. In the darkness of the night they were wrecked on the shore, and went up into the country, where they found a cottager with whom they stayed through the winter. The cottager's wife brought up Agnar, and the cottager, Gerod, and gave him good advice. In the spring the man got them a ship, but when he and his wife accompanied them to the strand, the man talked apart with Gerod. They had a fair wind and reached their father's place. Gerod was at the ship's prow. He sprang on shore, but pushed the ship out, saying, Go where an evil spirit may get thee. The vessel was driven out to sea, but Gerod went up to the town where he was well received. But his father was dead. Gerod was then taken for king and became a famous man. Odin and Frigg were sitting in Hlidskjalf, looking over all the world. Odin said, Seest thou Agnar, thy foster son, where he is, getting children with the giantess in a cave? While Gerod, my foster son, is a king residing in his country. Frigg answered, he is so inhospitable that he tortures his guests, if he thinks that too many come. Odin replied that that was the greatest falsehood, and they wagered thereupon. Frigg sent her waiting maid Fulla to bid Gerod be on his guard, lest the troll man who was coming should do him harm, and also say that a token whereby he might be known was, that no dog, however fierce, would attack him. 
but that King Gerod was not hospitable was mere idle talk. He nevertheless caused the man to be secured whom no dog would assail. He was clad in a blue cloak, and was named Grimir, and would say no more concerning himself, although he was questioned. The king ordered him to be tortured to make him confess, and to be set between two fires, and there he sat for eight nights. King Gerod had a son ten years old, whom he named Agnar after his brother. Agnar went to Grimnir, and gave him a full horn to drink from, saying that the king did wrong in causing him to be tortured, though innocent. Grimnir drank from it. The fire had then so approached him that his cloak was burnt, whereupon he said, Fire, thou art hot, and much too great flame. Let us separate. My garment is singed, although I lift it up, my cloak is scorched before it. Eight nights have I sat between fires here, and to me no one food has offered, save only Agnar, the son of Gerod, who alone shall rule over the land of Goths. Be thou blessed, Agnar, as blessed as the god of men bids thee to be. For one draught thou shalt never get better recompense. Holy is the land which I see lying to Asia and Alfar near, but in Thrudheim Thor shall dwell until the powers perish. Yedalir it is called, where Ullr has himself a dwelling made. Alfheim the gods to Frey gave in days of yore for a tooth gift. The third dwelling is, where the kind powers have with silver decked the halls. Balaskial it is called, which for himself acquired the ass in days of old. Sokvabek the fourth is named o'er which the gelid waves resound. Odin and Saga there, joyful each day, from golden beakers quaff. Gladsheim the fifth is named, there the golden bright Valhall stands spacious, there Hropt selects each day those men who die by weapons. Easily to be known is, by those who to Odin come, the mansion by its aspect, its roof with spears is laid, its halls with shields is decked, with corslets are its benches strewed. Easily to be known is, by those who to Odin come, the mansion by its aspect. A wolf hangs before the western door, over it an eagle hovers. Thrymheim the sixth is named, where Thiasi dwelt that all-powerful Jotun, but Skadi now inhabits, the bright bride of gods, her father's ancient home. Breidablik is the seventh, where Baldur has built for himself a hall, and that land in which I know exists the fewest crimes. Huminbjörk is the eighth, where Heimdall, it is said, rules o'er the holy flames. There the god's watchman in his tranquil home drinks joyful the good mead. Folkvang is the ninth, there Freya directs the sittings in the hall. She half the fallen chooses each day, but Odin the other half. Glitnir is the tenth. It is on gold sustained and eke with silver decked. There Forseti dwells throughout all time and every stripe and lays. Noatun is the eleventh. There Niord has himself a dwelling made, prince of men, guiltless of sin, he rules o'er the high-built fane. O'er grown with branches and high grass is Vidar's spacious Lanfidi. There will the sun descend from the steed's back, bold to avenge his father. Antrimnir makes an Eldhrimnir, Sehrimnir to boil, of meats the best, but few know how many Ein Harar it feeds. Jerry and Freki, the war want sates, the triumphant sire of hosts but on wine only the famed in arms Odin ever lives. Hugin and Munin fly each day over the spacious earth. I fear for Hugin that he come not back, yet more anxious am I for Munin. Thund roars, joyful in Theotvitnir's waters lives the fish. The rapid river seems too great for the battle steed to ford. Belgrind is the lattice called, and the plain that stands holy before the holy gates, Ancient is that lattice, but few only know how it is closed with lock. Five hundred doors, and forty eke, I think, are in Valhall. Eight hundred Ein Heriar will at once from each door go when they issue with the wolf to fight. Five hundred floors, and forty eke, I think, has Bilskrinir with its windings. Of all the roofed houses that I know is my son's the greatest. Hydrun, the goat is called that stands o'er Odin's hall and bites from Laird's branches. A bowl shall fill with the bright mead, that drink shall never fail. Eichthrenir, the heart, is called, that stands o'er Odin's hall, and bites from Laird's branches. From his horns fall drops into Hvelgamir, whence all waters rise. Sid and Vid, Soakin, and Eichin, Svol, and Gunthro, Fjorm, and Fimbulthul, Rin, and Renandi, Gipul and Gopul, Gomul, and Gjarvimul, 
they round the god's dwelling wind thind and vind thol and hol grad and gunthorin vina one is called a second fegsvin a third theodnuma nit and non and horn slid and hrid silg and yilg vid and fan vond and strond gial and leipt these two fall near to men but fall hence to hell Quarmt and ormt and the care logs twain these thor must wait each day when he to council goes at yggdrasil's ash for the ash-bridge is all on fire the holy waters boil glad and gilir glare and skydbrimir silfintop and sinir gisl and falhofnir goldtop and let feti on these steeds the azure each day ride when they to council go at yggdrasil's ash three roots stand on three ways under yggdrasil's ash hell under one abides under the second the hymthrusar under the third mankind ratatosk is the squirrel named which has to run in yggdrasil's ash he from above the eagle's words must carry and beneath to nidhogg repeat hearts there are also four which from its summits arc necked gnaw dain and dvalin dunair and durathror more serpents lie under yggdrasil's ash than any one would think of witless mortals Goin and Moin, they are Grafitnir's sons, Greyback and Grafvolund, Ofnir and Svafnir, will, I ween, the branches of that tree ever lacerate. Yggdrasil's ash hardship suffers greater than men know of. A heart bites it above, and in its side it rots, Nidhogg beneath tears it. Hrist and Mist the horn shall bear me, Skegold and Skogul, Klok and Hetfjortur, Hildi and Thrudi, Gol and Gerolol, Randgrid and Raidgrid and Regenleif, these bear beer to the Einherjar. Arvakr and Alsvid, theirs tis up hence fasting the sun to draw. Under their shoulder the gentle powers, the Aesir, have concealed an iron coolness. Svalin the shield is called, which stands before the sun, the refulgent deity. Rocks and ocean must, I ween, be burnt, fell it from its place. Skoll the wolf is named, that the fair-faced goddess to the ocean chases another hati height he is rotfit near sun he the bright maid of heaven shall proceed of ymir's flesh was earth created of his blood the sea of his bones the hills of his hair the trees and plants of his skull the heaven and of his brows the gentle powers formed midgard for the sons of men but of his brain the heavy clouds are all created Ullers and all the gods' favour shall have, whoever first shall look upon to the fire, for open will the dwelling be, to the Aesir sons, when the kettles are lifted off. Ivaldi's sons went in days of old, skid blood near to form, of ships the best for the bright fray, Njord's benign son. Yggdrasil's ashes of all trees most excellent, and of all ships skid blood near of the Aesir, Odin and his horses sleep near, by frost of bridges, and of scalds bragi hebrook of hawks and of dogs garm brimir of swords now i my face have raised to the gods triumphant sons at that will welcome help awake from all the azure that shall penetrate to ogre's bench to ogre's compotation i am called grim i am called gangleri harian and hyamberi thek and thridi thund and ud helblindi and har sad and svipal and sanjatal Hertate, Ninkar, Bileg, Beleg, Bolverk, Fjolnir, Grim, and Grimnir, Glapsvid, and Fjolsvid, Sidhot, Sidskeg, Sigfoder, Hinkud, Alfoder, Valfoder, Atrid, and Farmatir. By one name I never have been called since among men I have gone. Grimnir I am called at Gerods, and at Asmunds, Yalk, and Kialar when a sledge i drew thror at the public meetings vidur in battles oski and omi jafnhar and biflindi gondlir and harbard with the gods svidir and svidrir i was at sokmimir's cult and beguiled that ancient jotun when of mitvitnir's renowned son i was the sole destroyer drunken art there geraud thou hast drunk too much thou art greatly by me beguiled much didst thou lose when thou wast of my help bereft of all the einherjars and odin's favour many things i told thee but thou hast few remembered thy friends mislead thee my friend's sword lying i see with blood all dripping 
the fallen by the sword yig shall now have thy life is now run out wroth with thee are the desir odin thou now shalt see draw near to me if thou canst odin i now am named yig i was called before before that thund vakar and skilfing vefudr and froptatir with the gods gaut and yalk ofnir and svafnir all which i believe to be names of me alone King Gerod was sitting with his sword lying across his knees, half drawn from the scabbard, but on finding that it was Odin, he rose for the purpose of removing him from the fires, when the sword slipped from his hand, with the hilt downwards, and the king, having stumbled, the sword pierced him through and killed him. Odin then vanished, and Agnar was king for a long time after. End of section 4《Section 5. Baldur's Dreams of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson, edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. — Baldur's Dreams Together were the Aesir all in council, and the Asnir all in conference, and they consulted the mighty gods why Baldur had oppressive dreams. To that god his slumber was most afflicting, his auspicious dreams seemed departed. They the Jotuns questioned, why seers of the future, whether this might not forebode calamity. The responses said that to death destined was Ullr's kinsman, of all the dears that caused grief to Frigg and Svafnir, and to the other powers on a course they resolved that they would send to every being assurance to solicit Baldur not to harm. All species swore oaths to spare him. Frigg received all their vows and compacts. Valfather fears something defective. He thinks the Hamingior may have departed. The Aesir he convenes, their council craves, at the deliberation much is devised. Up rose Odin, lord of men, and on sleep near he of the saddle laid, rode thence down to Niflhel, a dog he meant from hell coming. It was blood-stained on its breast, on its slaughter-craving throat and nether jaw. It bayed and widely gaped at the sire of magic song. Long it howled. Forth rode Odin, the ground rattled, till to Hel's lofty house he came. Then rode Yig to the eastern gate, where he knew there was a Vala's grave. To the prophetess he began a magic song to chant. Towards the north looked, potent runes applied, a spell pronounced, an answer demanded until compelled she rose and with death-like voice she said vala what man is this to me unknown who has for me increased an irksome course i have with snow been decked by brain beaten and with doom moistened long have i been dead vegtam vegtam is my name i am valtam's son tell thou me of hell from earth i call on thee for whom are these benches strewed o'er with rings that costly couches o'erlaid with gold Vala. Here stands mead for Baldur brood, over the bright potion the shield is laid, for the Azure race are in despair. By compulsion I have spoken, I will now be silent. Begtom. Be not silent, Vala. I will question thee until I know all. I will yet know who will Baldur slayer be, an Odin son of life bereave. Vala. Hodur will hither his glorious brother send, he of Baldur will the slayer be an Odin son of life bereave. By compulsion I have spoken, I will now be silent. Vegtom. Be not silent, Vala. I will question thee until I know all. I will yet know who on Hodur's vengeance will afflict, or Baldur slayer raise on the pile. Vala. Rind a son shall bear in the western halls. He shall slay Odin's son when one night old. He a hand will not wash, nor his head comb, ere he to the pile has borne Baldur's adversary. By compulsion I have spoken, I will now be silent. Begtom. Be not silent, Vala. I will question thee, until I know all. I will yet know who the maidens are that weep at will, and heavenward cast their neck-veils. Tell me but that, till then thou sleepest not. Vala. Not Vegtom art thou, as I before believed, rather art thou Odin, lord of men. Odin, thou art no Vala nor wise woman, rather art thou the mother of three Thursar. Vala, home right thou Odin, and exult, 
thus shall never more man again visit me until loki free from his bonds escapes and ragnarok all destroying comes end of section five Section six of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson. Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. Section six The High One's Lay. All doorways before going forward should be looked to, for difficult is it to know where foes may sit within a dwelling. Givers hail, a guest is come in, where shall he sit? In much haste is he who on the ways has to try his luck. Fire is needful to him who has come in, and whose knees are frozen. Food and raiment a man requires, where'er the fell has travelled. Water to him is needful who for reflection comes a towel and hospitable invitation, a good reception if he can get it, discourse and answer. Wit is needful to him who travels far, at home all is easy, a laughing-stock is he who nothing knows, and with the instructed sits. Of his understanding no one should be proud, but rather in conduct cautious. When the prudent and taciturn comes to a dwelling, harm seldom befalls the cautious, for a firmer friend no man ever gets than great sagacity. A wary guest who to reflection comes, keeps a cautious silence, with his ears listens, and with his eyes observes, so explores every prudent man. He is happy, who for himself obtains fame in kind words, less sure is that which a man must have in another's breast. He is happy, who in himself possesses fame and wit while living, for bad counsels have oft been received from another's breast. A better burthen no man bears on the way than much good sense, that is thought better than riches in a strange place. Such is the recourse of the indigent. A worse provision on the way he cannot carry than too much beer-bibing. So good is not, as it is said, beer for the sons of men. A worse provision no man can take from the table than too much beer-bibing, for the more he drinks the less control he has of his own mind. Oblivion's heron is called that over potations hovers, he steals the minds of men, with this bird's pinions I was fettered in Gunlod's dwelling. Drunk I was, I was over-drunk, at that cunning Fialar's. It's the best drunkenness, when every one after it regains his reason. Taciturn and prudent, and in war daring, should a king's children be. Joyous and liberal every one should be until his hour of death. A cowardly man thinks he will ever live, if warfare he avoids, but old age will give him no peace, though spears may spare him. A fool gapes when to a house he comes, to himself mutters, or is silent, but all at once, if he gets drink, then is the man's mind displayed. He alone knows who wanders wide and has much experience, by what disposition each man is ruled, who common sense possesses. Let a man hold the cup, yet of the mead drink moderately. Speak sensibly, or be silent, as a fault no man will admonish thee, if thou goest betimes to sleep. A greedy man, if he be not moderate, eats to his mortal sorrow. Oftentimes his belly draws laughter on a silly man, who among the prudent comes. Cattle know when to go home, and then from grazing cease, but a foolish man never knows his stomach's measure. A miserable man, and ill-conditioned, sneers at everything, one thing he knows not, which he ought to know, that he is not free from faults. A foolish man is all night awake, pondering over everything. He then grows tired, and when morning comes, all is lament as before. A foolish man thinks all who on him smile to be his friends. He feels it not, although they speak ill of him, when he sits among the clever. A foolish man thinks all who speak of him fair to be his friends, but he will find, if into court he comes, that he has few advocates. A foolish man thinks he knows everything if placed in unexpected difficulty, but he knows not what to answer if to the test he is put. A foolish man who among his people comes had best be silent, for no one knows that he knows nothing unless he talks too much. He who previously knew nothing will still know nothing, talk he ever so much. He thinks himself wise who can ask questions in converse also. Conceal his ignorance no one can, because it circulates among men. He utters too many futile words, who is never silent, 
a garrulous tongue if it not be checked sings often to its own harm for gazing stock no man shall have another although he come a stranger to his house many a one thinks himself wise if he is not questioned and can sit in dry habit clever thinks himself the guest who jeers a guest if he takes to flight knows it not certainly who prates at meat whether he babbles among foes many men are mutually well disposed yet at table will torment each other that strife will ever be guest will guest irritate early meals a man should often take unless to a friend's house he goes else he will sit and mope will seem half famished and can a few things inquire long is and indirect the way to a bad friend's though by the road he dwell but to a good friend's the paths lie direct though he be far away a guest should depart not always stay in one place the welcome becomes unwelcome if he too long continues in another's house one's own house is best small though it be at home is every one his own master though he but two goats possess and a straw thatched cot even that is better than begging one's own house is best small though it be at home is every one his own master bleeding at heart is he who has to ask for food at every mealtide leaving in the field his arms let no man go a foot's length forward for it is hard to know when on the way a man may need his weapon i have never found a man so bountiful or so hospitable that he refused a present or of his property so liberal that he scorned a recompense of the property which he has gained no man should suffer need for the hay did oft despaired what for the deer was destined much goes worse than is expected with arms investments friends should each other gladden those which are in themselves most lightly givers and requiters are longest friends if all else goes well to his friend a man should be a friend and gifts with gifts requite laughter with laughter men should receive but leasing with lying to his friend a man should be a friend to him and to his friend but of his foe no man shall the friend's friend be know if thou hast a friend whom thou fully trustest and from whom thou wouldst good derive thou shouldst blend thy mind with his and gifts exchange and often go to see him if thou hast another whom thou little trustest yet wouldst good from him derive thou shouldst speak him fair but think craftily and leasing pay with lying but of him yet further whom thou littlest trustest and thou suspectest his affection before him thou shouldst laugh and contrary to thy thought speak requital should the gift resemble i was once young i was journeying alone and lost my way rich i thought myself when i met another man is the joy of man liberal and brave men live best they seldom cherish sorrow but a base-minded man dreads everything the niggardly is an uneasy even at gifts my garments in a field i gave away to two wooden men heroes they seemed to be when they got cloaks exposed to insult as a naked man a tree withers that on a hilltop stands protects it neither bark nor leaves such is the man whom no one favors why should he live long hotter than fire love for five days burns between false friends what is quenched when the sixth day comes and friendship is all impaired something great is not always to be given praise is often for a trifle bought with half a loaf and a tilted vessel i got myself a comrade little are the sand grains little the wits little the minds of some men for all men are not wise alike men are everywhere by halves moderately wise should each one be but never over wise of those men the lives are fairest who know much well moderately wise should each one be but never over wise for wise men's heart is seldom glad if he is all wise who owns it moderately wise should each one be but never over wise his destiny let know no man beforehand his mind will be freest from care brand burns from brand until it is burnt out fires from fire quickened man to man becomes known by speech but a fool by his bashful silence he should early rise who another's property or life desires to have seldom a sluggish wolf gets prey or a sleeping man victory early should rise he who has few workers and go his work to see to greatly is he retarded who sleeps the morn away wealth half depends on energy of dry planks and roof shingles a man knows the measure of the firewood that may suffice both measure and time
Washed and refected, let a man ride to the thing, although his garments be not too good. Of his shoes and breeches let no one be ashamed, nor of his horse, although he may not have a good one. Inquire and impart should every man of sense, who will be accounted sage. Let one only know, a second may not, if three, all the world knows. Gasps and gapes when to the sea he comes, the eagle over old ocean. So is a man who among many comes, and has few advocates. His power should every sagacious man use with discretion, for he will find when among the bold he comes that no one alone is doubtiest. Circumspect and reserved every man should be, and wary and trusting friends. Of the words that a man says to another he often pays the penalty. Much too early I came to many places, but too late to others. The beer was drunk or not ready, the dislike seldom hits the moment. Here and there I should have been invited, if I a meal had needed, or two hams had hung, at that true friends, whereof one I had eaten. Fire is best among the sons of men, in the sight of the sun, if his health a man can have, with the life free from vice. No man lacks everything, although his health be bad. One in his sons is happy, one in his kin, one in abundant wealth, one in his good works. It is better to live, even to live miserably. A living man can always get a cow. I saw fire consume the rich man's property, and death stood without his door. The halt can ride on horseback, the one hand did drive cattle, the deaf bite and be useful. To be blind is better than to be burnt. No one gets good from a corpse. A son is better even if born late after his father's departure. Gravestones seldom stand by the wayside unless raised by a kinsman to a kinsman. Two are adversaries. The tongue is the bane of the head. Under every cloak I expect a hand. At night is joyful he who is sure of travelling entertainment. Variable is an autumn night. Many are the weather's changes in five days, but more in a month. He only knows not who knows nothing that many a one apes another. One man is rich, another poor. Let him not be thought blameworthy. Cattle die, kindred die, we ourselves also die, but the fair fame never dies of him who has earned it. Cattle die, kindred die, we ourselves also die, but I know one thing that never dies, judgment on each one dead. Full storehouses I saw at Dives' sons, now bear they the beggar's staff, such are riches, as is the twinkling of an eye, of friends they are most fickle. A foolish man, if he acquires wealth or woman's love, pride grows within him, but wisdom never, he goes on more and more arrogant. Then tis made manifest, if of runes thou questionest him, those to the high ones known, which the great powers invented, and the great talker painted, that he had best hold silence. At eve the day is to be praised, a woman after she is burnt, a sword after it is proved, a maid after she is married, ice after it has passed away, beer after it is drunk. In the wind one should hew wood, in a breeze row out to sea, in the dark talk with the lass, many are the eyes of day. In a ship voyages are to be made, but a shield is for protection, a sword for striking, but a damsel for a kiss. By the fire one should drink beer on the ice slide, Buy a horse that is lean, a sword that is rusty. Feed a horse at home, but a dog at the farm. In a maiden's words no one should place faith, nor in what a woman says. For on a turning wheel have their hearts been formed, and guile in their breasts been laid. In a creaking bow, a burning flame, a yawning wolf, a chattering crow, a grunting swine, a rootless tree, a waxing wave, a boiling kettle. A flying dart, a flowing billow a one night's ice, a coiled serpent, a woman's bed-talk, or a broken sword, a bear's play, or a royal child, a sick calf, a self-willed thrall, a flattering prophetess, a corpse newly slain, a serene sky, a laughing lord, a barking dog, and a harlot's grief, an early-sown field let no one trust, nor prematurely in a son, whether rules the field and the wit the sun, each of which is doubtful. A brother's murderer, though on the high road met, a half-burnt house, an over-swift horse, a horse is useless if a leg be broken, no man is so confiding as to trust any of these. Such is the love of women, who falsehood meditate, as if one drove not rough-shod on slippery ice, a spirited two years old, an unbroken horse, 
or as in a raging storm a helmless ship is beaten or as if the halt were set to catch a reindeer in the thawing fell openly i now speak because i both sexes know unstable are men's minds towards women tis then we speak most fair when we most falsely think that deceives even the cautious fair shall speak and money offer who would obtain a woman's love praise the form of a fair damsel he gets who courts her at love should no one ever wander in another a beauteous countenance oft captivates the wise which captivates not the foolish let no one wonder at another's folly it is the lot of many all powerful desires makes of the sons of men fools even of the wise the mind only knows what lies near the heart that alone is conscious of our affections no disease is worse to a sensible man than not to be content with himself that i experienced when in the reeds i sat awaiting my delight body and soul to me was that discreet maiden nevertheless i possess her not billings lass on her couch i found sunbright sleeping a prince's joy to me seemed not if not with that form to live yet nearer eve must thou odin come if thou wilt talk the maiden over all will be disastrous unless we alone are privy to such misdeed i return thinking to love at her wise desire i thought i should obtain her whole heart and love when next i came the bold warriors were all awake with lights burning and bearing torches thus was the way to pleasure closed but at the approach of morn when again i came the household all was sleeping the good damsel's dog alone i find tied to the bed many a fair maiden when rightly known towards men is fickle that i experienced when that discreet maiden i strove to seduce contumely of every kind that wily girl heaped upon me nor of that damsel gained i aught at home let a man be cheerful and towards a guest liberal of wise conduct he should be of good memory and ready speech if much knowledge he desires he must often talk on good fimbul fambi he is called who little has to say such is the nature of the simple the old jotun i sought now i am come back little got i there by silence in many words i spoke to my advantage in sutung's halls gunlod gave me on her golden seat a draught of the precious mead a bad recompense i afterwards made her for her whole soul her fervent love Rati's mouth i caused to make a space and to gnaw the rock over and under me were the jotun's ways thus my head did peril of a well-assumed form i made good use few things fail the wise for old her for old Hrerir is now come up to men's earthly dwellings tis to me doubtful that i could have come from the jotun's courts had not gunlod aided me that good damsel over whom i laid my arm on the day following came the Thursar to learn something of the high one in the high one's halls after bolverk they inquired whether he with the gods were come or suttung had destroyed him odin i believe a ring oath gave who in his faith will trust suttung defrauded of his drink bereft and gunlod made to weep time tis to discourse from the preacher's chair by the well of erd i silent sat i saw and meditated i listened to men's words of runes i heard discourse and of things divine nor of graving them were they silent nor of sage counsels at the high one's hall in the high one's hall i thus heard say i counsel thee lord fafnir to take advice thou wilt profit if thou takest it rise not at night unless to explore or art compelled to go out i counsel thee lord fafnir to take advice thou wilt profit if thou takest it in an enchantress's embrace thou mayest not sleep so that in her arms she clasp thee she will be the cause that thou carest not for the thing or prince's words food thou wilt shun and human joys sorrowful wilt thou go to sleep i counsel thee another's wife entice thou never to secret converse i counsel thee by befell or firth if thou have to travel provide thee well with food i counsel thee a bad man let thou never know thy misfortunes for from a bad man thou never wilt obtain a return for thy good will i saw mortally wound a man a wicked woman's words a false tongue caused his death and most unrighteously i counsel thee if thou knowest thou hast a friend whom thou well canst trust go off to visit him for with brushwood overgrown and with high grass is the way that no one treads i counsel thee a good man attract to thee in pleasant converse 
and salutary speech learn while thou livest. I counsel thee, with thy friend be thou never first to quarrel. Care gnaws the heart, if thou to no one canst thy whole mind disclose. I counsel thee, words thou never shouldst exchange with a witless fool, for from an ill-conditioned man thou wilt never get a return for good, but a good man will bring thee favour by his praise. There is a mingling of affection where one can tell another all his mind. Everything is better than being with the deceitful. He is not another's friend who ever says as he says. I counsel thee, even in three worlds quarrel not with a worse man, often the better yields when the worse strikes. I counsel thee, be not a shoemaker, nor a shaft-maker, unless for thyself it be, for a shoe if ill-made, or a shaft if crooked, will call down evil on thee. Wherever of injury thou knowest, regard that injury as thy own, and give to thy foes no peace. I counsel thee, rejoiced at evil be thou never, but let good give thee pleasure. I counsel thee, in a battle look not up, like swine that sons of men that become, that men may not fascinate thee. If thou wilt induce a good woman to pleasant converse, thou must promise fair, and hold to it. No one turns from good if it can be got. I enjoin thee to be wary, but not over-weary. At drinking be thou most weary, and with another's wife, and thirdly, that thieves delude thee not. With insult or derision treat thou never a guest or wayfarer. They often little know who sit within, of what race they are who come. Vices and virtues the sons of mortals bear in their breasts mingled, no one is so good that no failing attends him, nor so bad as to be good for nothing. At a hoary speaker laugh thou never, often is good that which the aged utter, oft from a shrivelled hide discreet words issue, from those whose skin is pendant and deckled with scars, and who go tottering among the vile. I counsel thee, rail not at a guest, nor from thy gate thrust him, treat well the indigent, they will speak well of thee. Strong is the bar that must be raised to admit all. Do thou give a penny, or they will call down on thee every ill in thy limbs. I counsel thee, wherever thou beer drinkest, invoke to thee the power of earth, for earth is good against drink, fire for distempers, the oak for constipation, a cornier for sorcery, a hall for domestic strife, and bitter hate invoke the moon, the biter for bite injuries is good, but runes against calamity, fluid let earth absorb. End of the Lay of the High One Footnotes Odin is the High One. The poem is a collection of rules and maxims, and stories of himself, some of them not very consistent with our ideas of a supreme deity. End of section 6 Section 7 Odin's Rune Song of the Elder Eddas of Saman Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. Odin's Rune Song I know that I hung on a wind rocked tree, nine whole nights with the spear wounded, and to Odin offered, myself to myself, on that tree, of which no one knows from what root it springs. Bread no one gave me, nor a horn of drink. Downward I peered to runes applied myself, wailing learnt them, then fell down thence. Potent songs nine from the famed son I learned of Bolthorn, Bastila's sire, and a draught obtained the precious mead, drawn from Odhrere. Then I began to bear fruit and to know many things, to grow and well thrive. Word by word I sought out words, fact by fact I sought out facts. Runes thou wilt find, and explained characters, very large characters, very potent characters, which the great speaker depicted, and the high powers formed, and the powers prince graved. Odin among the Aesir, but among the Alfar Dane, and Dvalin for the dwarves, Asvid for the Jotuns, some I myself graved. Knowest thou how to grave them? Knowest thou how to expound them? Knowest thou how to depict them? Knowest thou how to prove them? Knowest thou how to pray? Knowest thou how to offer? Knowest thou how to send? Knowest thou how to consume? Tis better not to pray than too much offer, a gift ever looks to a return. Tis better not to send than too much consume. So Thund graved before the origin of man, where he ascended, to whence he afterwards came. 
those songs i know which the king's wife knows not nor son of man help the first is called for what will help thee against strifes and cares for the second i know what the sons of men require who will as leeches live for the third i know if i have great need to restrain my foes the weapon's edge i deaden of my adversaries nor arms nor wiles harm aught for the fourth i know if men place bonds on my limbs i so sing that i can walk the fetter starts from my feet and the manacle from my hands for the fifth i know if i see a shot from a hostile hand a shaft flying amid the host so swift it cannot fly that i cannot arrest it if only i get sight of it for the sixth i know if one wounds me with the green tree's roots also if a man declares hatred to me harm shall consume them sooner than me for the seventh i know if a lofty house i see blaze o'er its inmates so furiously it shall not burn that i cannot save it that song i can sing for the eighth i know what to all is useful to learn where hatred grows among the sons of men that i can quickly assuage for the ninth i know if i stand in need my bark on the water to save i can the wind on the waves allay and the sea lull for the tenth i know if i see troll wives sporting in air i can so operate that they will forsake their own forms and their own minds for the eleventh i know if i have to lead my ancient friends to battle under their shields i sing and with power they go safe to the fight safe from the fight safe on every side they go for the twelfth i know if on a tree i see a corpse swinging from a halter i can so grave and runes depict that the man shall walk and with me converse for the thirteenth i know if on a young man i sprinkle water he shall not fall though he come into battle that man shall not sink before swords for the fourteenth i know if in the society of men i have to enumerate the gods asia and alfar i know the distinctions of all this few unskilled can do for the fifteenth i know what the dwarf the odreir sang before delling's doors strength he sang to the asia and to the alfar prosperity wisdom to the hoptretir for the sixteenth i know of a modest maiden's favour and affection and desire to possess the soul i can change the white-armed damsel and wholly turn her mind for the seventeenth i know that the young maiden will reluctantly avoid me these songs lord fafnir thou wilt long have lacked yet it may be good if thou understandest them profitable if thou learnest them for the eighteenth i know that which i never teach to maid or wife of man all is better what one only knows this is the closing of the songs save her alone who clasps me in her arms or is my sister now are sung the high one's songs in the high one's halls to the sons of men all useful but useless to the jotun's sons hail to him who has sung them hail to him who knows them may he profit who has learnt them hail to those who have listened to them End of section seven Section eight The Lay of Himir of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The Lay of Himir Once the celestial gods had been taking fish, and were in competition, ere they the truth discovered, rods they shook and blood inspected when they found at ogier's a lack of kettles sat the rock-dweller glad as a child much like the son of miss Gorblindi. in his eyes looked yug's son steadfastly thou to the azure shalt oft a computation give caused trouble to the jotun the unwelcomed worded as he forthwith meditated vengeance on the gods sif's husband he besought a kettle him to bring in which i beer for all of you may brew the illustrious gods found that impossible, nor could the exalted powers it accomplish, till from true-heartedness, Tai, to Haloriade, much friendly counsel gave. There dwells eastward of Elivagar, the Aluwar's Hamir, at heaven's end. My sire, fierce of mood, a kettle owns, a capacious cauldron, a rest of depth. Thor, knowest thou whether we can get the liquor boiler? Tai, yes, friend, if we stratagem employ rapidly they drove forward that day from asgard till to the giant's home they came thor stalled his goats splendid of horn 
then turned him to the hall that Hamir owned. The son his granddad found him most loathful, had she had nine hundred. But another came all golden forth, fair-browed, bearing the beer-cup to her son. Ye Jotun's kindred, I will you both, ye daring pair, under the kettle's place. My husband is oftentimes niggard towards guest, to ill-humour prone. But the monster, the fierce-souled Hamir, late returned home from the chase. He the hall entered, the icebergs resounded, as the churl approached. The thicket on his cheeks was frozen. Hail to thee, Hamir, be of good cheer. Now thy son is come to thy hall, whom we expected from his long journey. Him accompanies our famed adversary, the friend of man, who we o'er height. See where they sit under the hall's gable, as if to shun thee? The pillar stands before them. In shivers flew the pillar at the Jotun's glance. The beam was first broken in two. Eight kettles fell, but only one of them, a hard-hammered cauldron, whole from the column. The two came forth, but the old Jotun with eyes surveyed his adversary. Augured to him his mind no good, when he saw the giantess's sorrow on the floor coming. Then were three oxen taken, and the Jotun bade them forthwith be boiled. Each one they made by the head shorter, and to the fire afterwards bore them. Sif's consort ate, ere to sleep he went, completely, he alone, two of Hymir's beeves. Seemed to the hoary friend of Hrungir, Glorides' reflection full well large, we three to-morrow night shall be compelled on what we catch to live. Vior said he would on the sea row, if the bold Jotun him with bait supply. To the herd betake thee, if thou in thy courage trustest, crusher of the rock-dwellers, for baits to seek. I expect that thou wilt bait from an ox easily obtain. The guest in haste to the forest went, where he stood an all-black ox before him. The thursar's bane wrung from an ox the high fastness of his two horns. To me thy work seems worse by far, ruler of keels, than if thou hadst sat quiet. The lord of goats, the ape's kinsman, besought the horse of plank farther out to move, but the Jotun declared his slight desire farther to row. The mighty Hamir drew, he alone, two whales up with his hook, but at the stern aback Vior cunningly made him a line. Fixed on the hook the shield of men, the serpent slayer, the ox's head, gaped at the bait the foe of gods, the encircler beneath of every land. Drew up boldly the mighty Thor, the worm with venom glistening, up to the side with his hammer struck, on his foul head summit, like a rock towering, the wolf's own brother. The icebergs resounded, the caverns howled, the old earth shrank together, at length the fish back into the ocean sank. The Jotun was little glad, as they rode back, so that the powerful Hymir nothing spake, but the oar moved in another course. Wilt thou do half the work with me, either the whales home to the dwelling bear, or the boat fast find? Hloridi went, grasped the prow, quickly, with its hold water, lifted the water steed together with its oars and scoop, bore to the dwelling the Jotun's ocean swine, the curved vessel through the wooded hills. But the Jotun yet ever frowned, to strife accustomed with Thor disputed, said that no one was strong, however vigorously he might row, unless he his cup would break. But Hiloridi, when to his hands it came, forth with break an upright stone in twain, sitting, dashed the cup through the pillars, yet they brought it whole to him ere back, until the beauteous woman gave important friendly counsel, which she only knew. Strike at the head of Himir. The Jotun, with food oppressed, that is harder than any cup. Rose then on his knee the stern lord of goats, clad in all his godlike power. Unhurt remained the old man's helm-block, but the round wine-bearer was in shivers broken. Much good I know has departed from me, now that my cup I see hurled from my knees. Thus the old man spake. I can never say again, beer thou art too hot. Now tis to be tried if ye can carry the beer-vessel out of our dwelling. Tie twice essayed to move the vessel, yet at each time stood the kettle fast. Then Modi's father by the brim grasped it, and trod through the dwelling's floor. Sif's consort lifted the kettle on his head, while about his heels its rings jingled. They had far journeyed before Odin's son cast one look backwards. He from the cavern saw, with him here from the east, a troop of many-headed monsters coming. From his shoulders he lifted the kettle down, Mjolnir hurled forth towards the savage crew, and slew all the mountain giants, who with Mir had pursued. Long they had not journeyed when one of Thoridi's goats one laid down half dead before the car. It from the pole had sprung across the trace, but the false Loki was of this the cause. 
now ye have heard for what fabulous can more fully tell what indemnity he from the giant got he paid for it with his children both in his strength exulting he to the gods council came and had the kettle which ymir had possessed out of which every god shall beer with ogier drink at the every harvest tide End of section eight. Section nine. The lay of Thrym, or the hammer recovered, of the elder Eddas the same in Sigfusen, and the younger Eddas the Snorri Sturlson, edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. The Lay of Thrym, or The Hammer Recovered Wroth was Vingthor, when he awoke, and his hammer missed, his beard he shook, his forehead struck, the sun of earth felt all around him. And first of all these words he uttered, Hear now, Loki, what I now say, which no one knows anywhere on earth, nor in heaven above, the ass's hammer is stolen. They went to the fair Freya's dwelling, and he these words first of all said, Wilt thou me, Freya, thy feather garment lend, that perchance my hammer I may find? Freya, that I would give thee, although of gold it were, and trust it to thee, though it were of silver. Flew then Loki, the plumage rattled, until he came beyond the Aesir's dwellings, and came within the Jotun's land. On a mound sat Thrym, the Thursar's lord, for his greyhounds plaiting gold bands and his horses mane smoothing. How goes it with the Aesir, how goes it with the Alfar? Why art thou come alone to Jotunheim? Loki, ill it goes with the Aesir, ill it goes with the Alfa. Hast thou Hlorides hammer hidden? Thrym, I have Hlorides hammer, hidden eight rasps beneath the earth. It shall no man get again, unless he bring me Freya to wife. Flew then Loki, the plumage rattled, until he came beyond the Jotun's dwelling, and came within the Aesir's courts. There he met Thor, in the middle court, who these words first of all uttered. Hast thou had success as well as labor? Tell me from the air the long tidings. Oft of him who sits are the tables defective, and he who lies down utters falsehood. Loki. I have had labor and success. Thrym has thy manor, the Thursor's lord. It shall no man get again unless he bring him Freya to wife. They went the fair Freya to find, and he those words first of all said, Bind thee, Freya, in bridal raiment, we too must drive to Jotunheim. Wroth then was Freya, and with anger chafed, all the Aesir's hall beneath her trembled. In shivers flew the flamed Brisinga necklace. No, me to be of woman lewdest, if with thee I drive to Jotunheim. Straight away went the Aesir all to counsel, and the Asinir all to hold converse, and deliberated the mighty gods how they, Hlorides, hammer, might get back. Then said Heimdall, of Aesir brightest, he well foresaw, like other veneer. Let us clothe Thor with bridal raiment, let him have the famed Brisinga necklace. Let by his side keys jingle, and woman's weeds fall round his knees, but on his breast place precious stones, and a neat quaff set on his head. Then said Thor the mighty ass, Me the Aesir will call womanish, if I let myself be clad in bridal raiment. Then spake Loki, Laufi's son, Do thou, Thor, refrain from such like words, Forthwith the Jotuns will Asgard inhabit, unless thy hammer thou gettest back. Then they clad Thor in bridal raiment, and with the noble Brisinga necklace, let by his side keys jingle, and woman's weeds fall round his knees, and on his breast place precious stones, and a neat quaff set on his head. Then said Loki, Laufi's son, I will with thee as a servant go, we too will drive to Jotunheim. Straightway were the goats homeward driven, hurried to the traces they had faster run. The rocks were shivered, the earth was in a blaze. Odin's son drove to Jotunheim. Then said Thrym, the Thursor's lord, Rise up, Jotuns, and the benches deck. Now they bring me Freya to wife, Niord's daughter, from Noatun. Hither to our court let bring gold-horned cows, All black oxen for the Jotun's joy. Treasures I have many, necklaces many, Freya alone seemed to me wanting. In the evening they early came, And for the Jotun's beer was brought forth. Thor alone an ox devoured, salmons ate, and all the sweetmeats women should have. Sif's consort drank three salds of mead. Then said Thrym, the Thursar's prince, Where hast thou seen brides eat more voraciously? I never saw brides feed more amply, nor a maiden drink more mead. 
sat the all-crafty serving-maid close by, whose words fitting found against the Jotun's speech. Freya has nothing eaten for eight nights, so eager was she for Jotunheim. Under her veil he stooped desirous to salute her, but sprang back all along the hall. Why are so piercing Freya's looks? Methinks that fire burns from her eyes. Sat the all-crafty serving-maid close by, who words fitting found against the Jotun speech. Freya for eight nights has not slept, so eager was she for Jotunheim. In came the Jotun's luckless sister, for a bride gift she dared to ask. Give me from thy hands the ruddy rings, if thou wouldst gain my love, my love and favor all. Then said Thrym, the Thursar's lord, Bring the hammer in, the bride to consecrate, lay me all there on the maiden's knee, unite us each with other by the hand of war. Laughed Loridi's soul in his breast, when the fierce hearted his hammer recognized. He first slew Thrym, the Thursar's lord, and the Jotun's race all crushed. He slew the Jotun's aged sister, her who a bride gift had demanded, she a blow got instead of skillings, a hammer stroke for many rings. So got Odin's son his hammer back. End of section nine. Section ten: The Lay of the Dwarf Elvis of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson, edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. The Lay of the Dwarf Alvis Alvis, the benches they are decking, now shall the bride with me bend her way home, that beyond my strength I have hurried will to every one appear. At home naught shall disturb my quiet. Thor. What man is this? Why about the nose art thou so pale? Hast thou last night with corpses lain? To me thou seem'st to bear resemblance to the Thursar, thou art not born to carry off a bride. Alvis. Alvis I am named, beneath the earth I dwell, under the rock I own a place. The lord of chariots I am come to visit, a promise once confirmed let no one break. Thor. I will break it, for o'er the maid I have, as father, greatest power, I was from home when the promise was given thee. Among the gods I the sole giver am. Alvis, what man is this, who lays claim to power over that fair bright maiden? For far-reaching shafts few will know thee. Who has decked thee with bracelets? Vingthor, Vingthor I am named, wide I have wandered. I am Sidgrani's son. With my descent thou shalt not that young maiden have, nor that union obtain. Alvis, Thy consent I fain would have, and that union obtain. Rather would I possess than be without that snow-white maiden. Bing Thor, The maiden's love shall not, wise guess, be unto thee denied, if thou of every world canst tell me all I desire to know. Alvis, Bing Thor, Thou canst try, as thou art desirous the knowledge of the dwarf to prove, all the nine worlds I have travelled over, and every being known. Bing Thor, Tell me, Alvis, for all men's concern I presume thee dwarf to know, how the earth is called which lies before the sons of men in every world. Alvis, Yord among men tis called, but with the Azure fold, the Vanir call it Vega, the Jotuns Igron, the Alphar Grandi, the power supreme are. Vingthor, tell me, Alvis, how the heaven is called which is perceptible in every world. Alvis, him in tis called by men, but Hlinir by the gods, Vendofni the Vanir call it, Upheimer the Jotuns, the Alfar, Fagrefer, the dwarfs, Drupspansal. Vingthor, tell me, Alvis, how the moon is called which men see in every world. Alvis, Mani tis called by men, but Mylin with the gods, Hephefanda Hephel in hell, they call it, Skindi the Jotuns, but the dwarfs Skin, the Alfar name it Artali. Vink Thor, tell me, Alvis, how the sun is called which men's sons see in every world. Alvis, soul among men tis called, but with the god Suna, the dwarves call it Dvalin's Leica, the Jotun's Eglo, the Alfar, Fagrahevel, the Azure sons, Alskir. Vink Thor, tell me, Alvis, how the clouds are called which with showers are mingled in every world. Alvis, sky they are called by men, 
but skirvan by the gods the vanir call them vindflot the jotuns urvan the alpha of vader megan in hell they are called hjalm hulids vingthor tell me alvis how the wind is called which widely passes over every world alvis winder tis called by men but vafuder by the gods the wide ruling powers call it gnukiad the jotuns opir the alpha dinfari and how they call it hividudur vingthor tell me alvis how the calm is called which has to rest in every world alvis logan tis called by men but lagi by the gods the vanir call it vinslot the jotuns ofli the alpha dagsevi the dwarfs call it dogs vera vingthar tell me alvis what the sea is called which men row over in every world alvis ser tis called by men but selegia with the gods the vane call it vagr the jotuns alheimer the alfar lagastrafer the dwarfs call it diapanmar vingthor tell me alvis how the fire is called which burns before men's sun in every world alvis elder tis called by men but the azure funi the vanir call it vagr the jotuns freker but the dwarfs for brenir and hell they call it rodudur vingthor tell me alvis how the forest is called which grows for the sons of men in every world alvis vidir tis called by men but valar fox by the gods hell's inmates hlidthanger the jotuns eldi the alfar fagr limi the vanir call it vonder vingthor tell me alvis how the night is called that norvi's daughter hight in every world alvis not it is called by men but by the gods niol the wide ruling powers call it grima the jotuns olios the alfar svefnigamen the dwarfs call it draumnioran vingthor tell me alvis how the seed is called which the sons of men sow in every world alvis big it is called by men but by the gods bar the vanir call it vaxter the jotuns eighty the alfar lagastrafer and hell tis snipnins called vingthor tell me alvis how the beer is called which the sons of men drink in every world alvis all it is called by men but by the azure bior the vanir call it vague reina loger the jotuns but in hell tis called mioder sutung sons call it sumbol vingthor in one breast i have never found more ancient lore by great wiles thou hast i tell thee been deluded thou art above ground dwarf at dawn already in the hall the sun is shining end of section ten section eleven the lay of harbard of the elder eddas of samen sigfusen and the younger eddas of snorri strolson edited by rasmus b anderson this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The Lay of Harbard Thor, journeying from the eastern parts, came to a strait, or sound, on the other side of which was a ferryman with his boat. Thor cried out, Who is the knave of knaves that by the sound stands yonder? Harbard Who is the churl of churls that cries across the water? Thor, ferry me across the sound. Tomorrow I'll regale thee. I have a basket on my back. There is no better food. At my ease I ate before I quitted home. Herrings and oats, with which I yet feel sated. Harbard, thou art in haste to praise thy meal. Thou surely hast no foreknowledge. For sad will be thy home. Thy mother, I believe, is dead. Thor, thou sayest now what seems to every one most unwelcome to know, that my mother is dead. Harbard, Thou dost not look like one who owns three country dwellings. Bare-legged thou standest, and like a beggar clothed. Thou hast not even breeches. Thor. Steer hitherward thy boat. I will direct thee where to land. But who owns the skiff, which by the strand thou holdest? Harbard. Hildolf he is named, who bade me hold it. A man in council wise, who dwells in Ranso Sound. Robbers he bade me not to ferry, or horse-dealers, but good men only, and those whom I well knew. Tell me then thy name, if thou wilt cross the sound. Thor. I my name will tell, although I am an outlaw, and all my kin. I am Odin's son, Mele's brother, and Magni's sire, the gods' mighty leader, 
with Thor thou me here mayest speak. I will now ask how art thou called. Harvard. I am Harvard called, seldom I my name conceal. Thor. Why shouldst thou thy name conceal, unless thou crime hast perpetrated? Harvard. Yet though I may crime have perpetrated, I will nathless guard my life against such as thou art, unless I death-doomed am. Thor. It seems to me a foul annoyance to wade across the strait to thee, and wet my garments. But I will pay thee, mannikin, for thy sharp speeches, if o'er the sound I come. Harward. Here will I stand, and here await thee. Thou wilt have found no stouter one since Rungir's death. Thor. Thou now remindest me how I with Rungir fought, that stout-hearted Jotun whose head was all of stone. Yet I made him fall and sink before me. What, meanwhile, didst thou, Harbard? Harbard. I was with Fiolveri five winters through, in the isle which Algren hight. There we could fight and slaughter make, many perils prove, indulge in love. Thor. How did your women prove towards you? Harbard. Sprightly women we had, but they had been meek. Shrewd ones we had, but they had been kind. Of sand a rope they twisted, and from the deep valley dug the earth. To them all I alone was superior in cunning. I rested with the sister seven, and their love and pleasure shared. What meanwhile didst thou, Thor? Thor. I slew Thiasi, that stout-hearted Jotun. Up I cast the eyes of Alvadi's son into the heaven serene. They are signs the greatest of my deeds. What meanwhile didst thou, Harbard? Harbard. Great seductive arts I used against the riders of the night, when from their husbands I enticed them. A mighty Jotun I believed Laerbard to be. A magic wand he gave me, but from his wits I charmed him. Thor. With evil mind, then, thou didst good gifts require. Harbard. One tree gets that which is from another scraped. Each one in such a case is for self. What meanwhile didst thou, Thor? Thor. In the east I was, and slew the Jotun brides, crafty and evil, as they to the mountain went. Great would have been the Jotun race had they all lived, and not a man left in Midgard. What meanwhile didst thou, Harbard? Harbard. I was in Valand and followed warfare. Princes I excited, but never reconciled. Odin has all the jarls that in conflict fall, but Thor the race of thralls. Thor. Unequally thou wouldst divide the folk among the Aesir, if thou but hadst the power. Harbard. Thor has strength over much, but courage none. From cowardice and fear thou wast crammed into a glove, and hardly thoughtest thou wast Thor. Thou durst not then, through thy terror, either sneeze or cough, lest Fialar might hear. Thor, Harbard, thou wretch, I would strike thee dead, could I but stretch my arm across the sound. Harbard, why wouldst thou stretch thy arms across the sound, when there is altogether no offence? What wouldst didst thou, Thor? Thor, in the east I was, and a river I defended, when the sons of Sparing me assailed, and with stones pelted me, though in their success they little joyed. They were the first to sue for peace. What meanwhile didst thou, Harbard? Harbard. I was in the east, and with a certain lass held converse. With that fair I dallied, and long meetings had. I, that gold-bright one, delighted. The game amused her. Thor. Then you had kind damsels there. Harbard. Of thy aid I had need, Thor, in retaining that maiden lily fair. Thor. I would have given it thee, if I had had the opportunity. Harbard. I would have trusted thee, my confidence, if thou hadst not betrayed it. Thor. I am not such a heel-shaper as an old leather shoe in spring. Harbard. What meanwhile didst thou, Thor? Thor. The berserkers' brides I lay so cudgelled. They, the worst, had perpetrated, the whole people had seduced. Harbard. Dastardly didst thou act, Thor, when thou didst cudgel women. Thor. She-wolves they were, and scarcely women. They crushed my ship with the props I had secured, with iron clubs threatened me, and drove away the Alfie. What meanwhile didst thou, Harbard? Harbard, I in the army was, which was hither sent, war banners to raise, lances to redden. Thor, of that thou now wilt speak, as thou wentest forth us hard terms to offer. Harbard, that shall be indemnified by a hand-ring such as arbitrators give, who wish to reconcile us. Thor, where didst thou learn words, than which I never heard more irritating? Harbard, from men I learned them, from ancient men, whose home is in the woods. Thou givest certainly a good name to grave mounts when thou callest them homes in the woods. 
Harbard, so speak I of such a subject. Thor, thy shrewd words will bring thee evil, if I resolve the sound to ford. Louder than a wolf thou wilt howl, I trow, if of my hammer thou gettest a touch. Harbord, Sif has a gallant at home, thou wilt anxious be to find him. Thou shalt that arduous work perform, it will beseem thee better. Thor, thou utterest what comes up most, so that to me it be most annoying, thou dastardly varlet. I believe thou art lying. Harbord, I believe I am telling truth. Thou art travelling slowly, thou wouldst have long since arrived hadst thou assumed another form. Thor, Harbord, thou wretch, rather is it thou who hast detained me. Harbord, I never thought that a ferryman could the course of Asa Thor retard. Thor, one advice I now will give thee, row hither with thy boat, let us cease from threats, approach the sire of Magni. Harbord, go farther from the sound, the passage is refused thee. Thor, show me then the way, if thou wilt not ferry me across the water. Harbord, that's too little to refuse. Tis far to go. Tis to the stock an hour, and to the stone another. Then keep the left-hand way until thou reachest Verland. There will Fjorgen find her son Thor, and point out to him his kinsman's way to Odin's land. Thor, can I get there to-day? Harbord, with pain and toil thou mayest get there while the sun is up, which, I believe, is now high. Thor, our talk shall now be short, as thou answerest with scoffing only. For refusing to ferry me I will reward thee, if another time we meet. Harbord, just go to where all the powers of evil may have thee. End of section 11 Section 12 The Journey or Leia Skirnir of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sikfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The Journey or Lay of Skirnir Frey, son of Njord, had one day seated himself in Hidskliof, and was looking over all regions, when turning his eye to Jotunheim, he there saw a beautiful girl, as she was passing from her father's dwelling to her bower. Thereupon he became greatly troubled in mind. Frey's attendant was named Skirnir. Him Njord desired to speak with Frey, when Skadi said, Rise up now, Skirnir. Go and request our son to speak, and inquire with whom he so sage may be offended. Skinner, harsh words I have from your son to fear if I go to speak with him, and to inquire with whom he so sage may be offended. Skinner, tell me now, Frey, Prince of Gods, for I desire to know, why alone thou sittest in the spacious hall the live-long day? Frey, why shall I tell thee, thou young man, my mind's great trouble? For the off's illuminator shines every day yet not for my pleasure. Skinner, thy care cannot, I think, be so great that to me thou canst not tell it, for in early days we were young together. Well might we trust each other. Frey, in Gimir's courts I saw walking a maid for whom I long. Her arms gave forth light wherewith shone all air and water. It is more desirable to me that maid than to any youth in early days, yet will no one age or alfar that we together live. Skinner, give me but thy steed, which can bear me through the dusk flickering flame, and that sword which brandishes itself against the Jotun's race. Frey, I will give thee my steed, which can bear thee through the dusk flickering flame, and the sword which will itself brandish, if he is bold who raises it. Skinner speaks to the horse. Dark it is without. Tis time, I say, for us to go across the misty fells, over the Thurser's land. We shall both return, or the all-potent Jotun will seize us both. Skinner rides to Jotunheim, to Gimir's mansion, where fierce dogs were chained at the gate of the enclosure that was round Gimir's hall. He rides on where a cowherd was sitting on a mound, and says to him, Tell me, cowherd, as on the mound thou sittest and watchest all the ways, how I to the speech may come of a young maiden for Gimir's dogs? Cowherd, either thou art death-doomed, or thou art a departed one. Speech well thou'll ever lack with the good maid of Gimir. Skinner. Better choices than to whine there are for him who is prepared to die. For one day was my age decreed, and my whole life determined. Gerd. What is that sound of sounds which I now sounding hear within our dwelling? The earth is shaken, 
and with it all the house of Gymir trembles. A serving maid. A man is here without, dismounted from his horse's back. He lets his steed browse on the grass. Gerd. Bid him enter into our hall, and drink of the bright mead, although I fear it is my brother slayer who waits without. Who is this of the Alfars, or of the Aesir's son, or of the wise Vanir's? Why art thou come alone, through the hostile fire, our halls to visit? Skinner. I am not of the Alfars, nor of the Aesir's sons, nor of the wise Vanir's, yet I am come alone through the hostile fire, your halls to visit. Apples all golden I have here eleven, these I will give thee, Gerd, thy love to gain, that thou mayst say that Frey to thee lives dearest. Gerd. The apples eleven I never will accept for any mortal's pleasure, nor will I and Frey, while our lives last, live both together. Skinner. The ring, too, I will give thee, which was burnt with the young son of Odin. Eight of equal weight will from it drop every ninth night. Gerd, the ring I will not accept, burnt though it may have been with the young son of Odin. I have no lack of gold in Gymir's court, for my father's wealth I share. Skinner, seest thou the sword, young maiden, thin, glittering bright, which I have here in hand? I thy head will sever from thy neck if thou speaks not favorably to me. Gerd, Suffer compulsion, will I never to please any man. Yet this I foresee, if thou and Gimir meet, ye will eagerly engage in fight. Skinner. Seest thou this sword, young maiden, thin, glittering bright, which I have here in hand? Beneath its edge shall the old Jotun fall, thy sire's death doomed. With a taming wand I smite thee, and I will tame thee, maiden, to my will. Thou shalt go thither, where the sons of men shall never more behold thee. On an eagle's mount thou shalt early sit, looking and turn towards hell. Food shall to thee more loathsome be than it is to any one the glistening serpent among men. As a prodigy thou shalt be when thou goest forth, Hrimnir shall gaze at thee. All beings at thee stare, more wide known thou shalt become than the watch among the gods, if thou from thy grating scape. Solitude and disgust, bonds and impatience, shall thy tears with grief augment. Set thee down, and I will tell thee of a whelming flood of care, and a double grief. Terror shall bow thee down the livelong day in the Jotun's courts. To the Hymthurser's hall thou shalt each day crawl exhausted. Joyless crawl, wail for pastime shalt thou have, and tears and misery. With a three-headed thirst thou shalt be ever bound, or be without a mate. Thy mind shall tear thee from morn to morn, as the thistle shalt be which has thrust itself on the housetop. To the world I have been, and to the human grove, a magic wand to get, a magic wand I got. Wrath with thee is Odin, wrath with thee is the Asia's prince. Frey shall loathe thee even ere thou wicked maid shalt have felt the gods' dire vengeance. Hear ye, Jotuns, hear ye, Himthrasar, sons of Sutung, also ye, Isir's friends. How I forbid, how I prohibit man's joy unto the damsel, men's converse to the damsel. Hrimgimnir the Thurs is named, thou shalt possess thee. In the grating of the dead beneath, thou shalt wretched thralls from the tree roots goat's water give thee. Other drink shalt thou, maiden, never get, either for thy pleasure or for my pleasure. Thurs I cut for thee, and three letters mere, Ergi and Odi and Othola. So will I cut them out, as I have cut them in, if their need shall be. Gerd, hail to thee, prince youth, and accept an icy cup, filled with old mead, although I thought not that I ever should love one of Vanir race. Skinner, all my errand will I know, ere I hence ride home. When wilt thou converse hold with the powerful son of Njord? Gerd, Bari the grove is named, which we both know, the grove of tranquil paths. Nine nights hence there is to Njord's son Gerd will grant delight. Skinner then rode home. Frey was standing without, and spoke to him, asking tidings. Tell me, Skinner, ere thou thy steed unsettlest, and afoot hence thou goest, what thou hast accomplished in Jotunheim for my pleasure or thine. Skinnir. Bari the grove is named, which we both know, the grove of tranquil paths. Nine nights hence there to Njord's son Gerd will grant delight. Frey. Long is one night, yet longer two will be. How shall I three endure? Often a month to me less the seemed than half a night of longing. End of section 12「Section 13. The Lay of Rig, of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson. Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The Lay of Rig in ancient sagas it is related that one of the Aesir named heimdall being on a journey to a certain seashore came to a village where he called himself rig in accordance with this saga is the following in ancient days they say along the green ways went the powerful and upright sagacious ass the strong and active rig his onward course pursuing forward he went on the midway and to a dwelling came the door stood ajar he went in fire was on the floor the man and wife sat there hoary-haired by the hearth i and edda in old guise clad rig would counsel give to them both and himself seated in the middle seat having on either side the domestic pair then edda from the ashes took a loaf heavy and thick and with bran mixed more beside she laid on the middle of the board there in a bowl was broth on the table set where was a calf boiled of kate's most excellent then rose he up, prepared to sleep. Rig would counsel give to them both, laid him down in the middle of the bed, the domestic pair lay one on either side. There he continued three nights together, then departed on the midway, nine months then passed away. Edda a child brought forth, they with water sprinkled its swarthy skin and named it Thrail. It grew up, and well it throve, of its hands the skin was shriveled, the knuckles knotty, and the fingers thick a hideous countenance it had a curved back and protruding heels he then began his strength to prove bass to bind make of it loads then faggots carried home the livelong day then to the dwelling came a woman walking scarred were her footsoles her arms sunburnt her nose compressed her name was thigh in the middle seat herself she placed by her sat the house's son they spoke and whispered prepared a bed thrail and thigh and days of care children they begat and lived content their names i think were hymir and fiosnir clur and cleggi kefsir fulnir drum drugaldi draught hofsvir lut and lugialdi fences they erected fields manured tended swine kept goats dug turf the daughters were drumba and kumba akvil kalfa and arinfia yusia and ambat Ikintiansa, Trogufia, and Tronubina, whence all sprung the race of thralls. Rig then went on, in a direct course, and came to house. The door stood ajar, he went in. Fire was on the floor, man and wife sat there engaged at work. The man was planning wood for a weaver's beam, his beard was trimmed, a lock was on his forehead, his shirt closed, his chest stood on the floor. His wife sat by, plied her rock with outstretched arms, prepared for clothing. A hood was on her head, a loose sark over her breast, a kerchief round her neck, studs on her shoulders. Afi and Amma owned the house. Rig would counsel give to them both, rose from the table prepared to sleep, laid him down in the middle of the bed, the domestic pair lay one on either side. There he continued three nights together. Nine months then passed, Amma a child brought forth. They with water sprinkled it, and called it Carl. The mother in linen swathed the ruddy redhead, its eyes twinkled. It grew up and well throve, learned to tame oxen, make a plough, houses build, and barns construct, make carts, and the plough drive. Then they home conveyed a lass with pendant keys, and a goatskin kirtle, married her to Carl. Snore was her name. Under a veil she sat. The couple dwelt together, rings exchanged, spread couches, and a household formed. Children they begat, and lived content. Hal and Drang, these were named, Held, Fagin, Smith, Brader, Bondi, Bundenskeg, Bui, and Bodhi, Bratskeg, and Seg. But the daughters were thus called by other names, Snot, Brood, Svani, Svari, Spreki, Fliod, Sprund, and Vith. Fema, Ristil once there sprung the race of churls rig then went thence in a direct course and came to a hall the entrance looked southward the door was half closed a ring was on the doorpost he went in the floor was strewed a couple sat facing each other fadir and modir with fingers playing the husband sat and twisted string bent his bow and arrow shafts prepared 
but the housewife looked on her arm, smoothed her veil, and her sleeves fastened. Her headgear adjusted, a clasp was on her breast. Ample her robe, her sark was blue. Brighter was her brow, her breast fairer, her neck whiter than driven snow. Rig would counsel give to them both, and himself seated in the middle seat, having on either side the domestic pair. Then took Modir a figured cloth of white linen, and the table decked. She then took thin cakes of snow-white wheat, and on the table laid. She set forth salvers full, adorned with silver, and on the table game and pork and roasted birds. In a can was wine. The cups were ornamented. They drank and talked. The day was fast departing. Rig would counsel give to them both. Rig then rose, the bed prepared. There he then remained three nights together, then departed on the midway. Nine months after that passed away. Modir then brought forth a boy, in silk they wrapped him, with water sprinkled him, and named him Jarl. Light was his hair, bright his cheeks, his eyes piercing as a young serpent's. There at home Jarl grew up, learned the shield to shake, to fix the string, the bow to bend, arrows to shaft, javelins to hurl, spears to brandish, horses to ride, dogs to let slip, swords to draw, swimming to practice. Thither from the forest came Rig walking, Rig walking. Runes he taught him, his own name gave him, and his own son declared him, whom he bade possess his elodial fields, his elodial fields, his ancient dwellings. Jarl then rode thence through a murky way, over humid fells, till to a hall he came. His spear he brandished, his shield he shook, made his horse curvet, and his falchion drew. Strife began to raise, the field to redden carnage to make and conquer lands. Then he ruled alone over eight fills, riches distributed, gave to all treasures and precious things, blank-sided horses, rings he dispersed, and collars cut in pieces. The nobles drove through humid ways, came to a hall where Herseer dwelt. There they found a slender maiden, fair and elegant, Erna her name. They demanded her and conveyed her home, to Jarl espoused her. She under the linen went, they together lived and well throve, and offspring and old age enjoyed. Burr was their eldest, Barn the second, Yod and Adal, Arfi, Mog, Nid, and Nidjung. They learned games. Sun and Svein swam and at tables played. One was named Kunt, Khon was the youngest. They grew up Jarl's progeny. Horses they broke, curved shields, cut arrows, brandished spears. But the young Khon understood runes aphid runes and alder runes he moreover knew men to preserve edges to deaden the sea to calm he knew the voice of birds how fires to mitigate assuage and quench sorrows to allay he of eight men had the strength and energy he with rig jarl and runes contended artifices practised and superior proved then acquired rig to be called and skilled in runes the young Khon rode through swamps and forests, hurled forth darts and tamed birds. Then sang the crow, sitting lonely on a bough, Why wilt thou, young Khon, tame the birds? Rather shouldst thou, young Khon, a horse's ride, and armies overcome. Nor Dan, nor Dan, Paul's more costly had, nobler paternal seats than ye had. They well knew how to keel to ride, the edge to prove, wounds to inflict. The rest is wanting. End of section 13。section 14 Ogre's computation or Loki's altercation of the elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusen and the younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson. Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. Ogre's Computation or Loki's Altercation Ogir, who is also named Gimir, had brewed beer for the Aesir, after he had got the great kettle, as has been already related. To the entertainment came Odin and his wife Frigg. Thor did not come, being in the east, but his wife Sif was there, also Bragi and his wife Idun, and Ty, who was one-handed, Fenrisulf, having bitten off his hand while being bound. Besides these were Njord and his wife Skadi, Frey and Freya, and Odin's son Vidar. Loki, too, was there, and Frey's attendants, Bigvir and Bela. Many other Aesir and Alfar were also present. 
Ogier had two servants, Fima Fang and Eldir. Bright gold was there used instead of firelight. The beer served itself to the guests. The place was a great sanctuary. The guests greatly praised the excellence of Ogier's servants. This Loki could not hear with patience, and so slew Fimafang, whereupon the Aesir shook their shields, exclaimed against Loki, chased him into the forest, and then returned to drink. Loki came again, and found Eldir standing without, whom he thus addressed. Tell me, Eldir, ere thou thy foot settest one step forward on what converse the sons of triumphant gods at their potation. Eldir, of their arms converse, and of their martial fame, the sons of the triumphant gods, of the Aesir and the Alfar, that are here within, not one has a friendly word for thee. Loki. I will go into Ogier's halls to see the computation. Strife and hate to the Aesir's sons I bear, and will mix their mead with bale. Eldir. Knowest thou not that if thou goest into Ogier's halls to see the computation, but contumely and clamor pours forth on the kindly powers, they will wipe it all off on thee? Loki. Knowest thou not, Eldir, that if we too with bitter words contend, I shall be rich in answers, if thou sayest too much? Loki then went into the hall, but when those present saw who was come in, they all sat silent. Loki. I lopped am come thirsty into this hall, from a long journey, to beseech the Aesir one draught to give me of the bright mead. Why, gods, are ye so silent, so reserved, that ye cannot speak? A seat and place choose for me at your board, or bid me high me hence. Bragi, a seat and place will the Aesir never choose for thee at their board, for well the Aesir know whom they ought to hold a joyous competition. Loki, Odin, dost thou remember when we in early days blended our blood together? When to taste beer thou didst constantly refuse, unless to both twas offered? Odin, Rise up, Vidar, and let the wolf-sire sit at our computation, that Loki may not utter words of contumely in Ogier's hall. Vidar, then rising, presented Loki with drink, who before drinking thus addressed the Aesir. Hail, Aesir! Hail, Asnir! And ye, all holy gods! All save that one ass who sits within there, Bragi on yonder bench. Bragi a horse and falchion I from my stores will give thee, and also with the ring reward thee, if thou the Aesir will not requite with malice. Provoke not the gods against thee. Loki. Of horse and rings wilt thou ever, Bragi, be in want. Of the Aesir and the Alfar that are here present, in conflict thou art the most backward, and in the play of darts most timid. Bragi. I know that were I without as I am now within the halls of Ogier, I thy head would bear in my hand, and so for lying punish thee. Loki Valiant on thy seat art thou, Bragi, but so thou shouldst not be, Bragi, the bench's pride. Go and fight, if thou art angry, a brave man sits not considering. Idun I pray thee, Bragi, let avail the bond of children, and of all adopted sons, and to Loki speak not reproachful words in Ogier's hall. Loki Be silent, Idun. Of all women I declare thee most fond of men, since thou thy arms carefully washed didst twine round thy brother's murderer. Edun, Loki I address not with opprobrious words in Ogier's hall. Bragi I sooth, by beer excited, I desire not that angry ye fight. Gaphion, why will ye, Aesir twain, herewithin strive with reproachful words? Lopt perceives not that he is deluded, and is urged on by fate. Loki, be silent, Gafion. I will now just mention how that fair youth thy mind corrupted, who thee a necklace gave, and around whom thou thy limbs didst twine. Odin, thou art raving, Loki, and hast lost thy wits. In calling Gefion's anger on thee, for all men's destinies I ween, she knows as thoroughly as I do. Loki, be silent, Odin. Thou never couldst allot conflicts between men. Oft hast thou given to those to whom thou oughtest not. Victory to cowards. Odin, knowest thou that I gave to those I ought not victory to cowards? Thou wast eight winters on the earth below, a milk cow and a woman, and didst there bear children. Now that, methinks, betokens a base nature. Loki, but it is said thou wentest with tottering steps in Samso, and knocked at houses as a vala, in likeness of a fortune-teller, thou wentest among people. Now that, methinks, betokens a base nature. Frigg, 
your doings ye should never publish among men what ye asia twain did in days of yore ever forgotten be men's former deeds loki be thou silent frigg thou art fjorgin's daughter and ever hast been fond of men since fay and Vili. it is said thou vidrir's wife didst both to thy bosom take frigg know thou that if i had in ogre's halls a son like balder out thou shouldst not go from the asia's sons thou shouldst have been fiercely assailed loki but wilt thou frigg that of my wickedness i more recount i am the cause that thou seest not balder riding to the halls freya mad art thou loki in recounting thy foul deeds frigg i believe knows all that happens although she says it not loki be thou silent freya i know thee full well thou art not free from vices of the asia and the alpha there are heron each has been thy paramour freya false is thy tongue henceforth it will i think prate no good to thee wroth with thee are the asia and the asnir sad shalt thou home depart loki be silent freya thou art a sorceress and with much evil blended since against thy brother thou the gentle powers excited and then freya what didst thou do Niord, it is no great wonder if silk-clad dames get themselves husbands lovers but tis a wonder that a wretched ass that has born children should herein enter loki be silent Niord. thou wast sent eastward hence a hostage from the gods hymir's daughters had thee for a utensil and flowed into thy mouth Niord, tis to me a solace as i long way hence was sent a hostage from the gods that i had a son whom no one hates and accounted as chief among the asia loki cease now Niord, and bound contain thyself i will no longer keep it secret it was with thy sister thou hadst such a son hardly worse than thyself Ty, frey is best of all the exalted gods in asia's court no maid he makes to weep no wife of man and from bonds looses all loki be silent Ty thou couldst never settle a strife twixt two of thy right hand also i must mention make which fenrir from thee tore ty i of a hand am wanting but thou of honest fame sad is the lack of either nor is the wolf at ease he in bonds must bide until the gods destruction loki be silent ty to thy wife it happened to have a son by me nor rag nor penny ever hadst thou poor wretch for this injury Frey, I the wolf see lying at the river's mouth, until the powers are swept away, so shalt thou be bound if thou art not silent, thou framer of evil. Loki, with gold thou boughtest Gymir's daughter, and so gavest away thy sword, but when Muspel's sons through the dark forest ride, thou unhappy wilt not have wherewith to fight. Bigvir, know that were I of noble race like Ingun's Frey, and had so fair a dwelling, then maros after i would bray that ill-boding crow and crush him limb by limb loki what little thing is that i see wagging its tail and snapping eagerly at the ears of frey thou shouldst ever be and clatter under mills bigvir bigvir i am named and am thought alert by all gods and men therefore am i joyful here that all the sons of fropt drink beer together loki be silent bigvir thou couldst never dole out food to men when lying in thy truckle bed thou wast not to be found while men were fighting heimdall loki thou art drunk and hast lost thy wits why dost thou not leave off loki but drunkenness so rules every man that he knows not of his garrulity loki be silent heimdall for thee in early days was that hateful life decreed with a wet back thou must ever be and keep watch as guardians of the gods Scotty thou art merry loki not long wilt thou frisk with an unbounded tail for thee on a rock's point with the entrails of thy ice-cold son the gods will bind loki no if on a rock's point with the entrails of my ice-cold son the gods will bind me that first and foremost i was at the slaying when we assailed thiassi Skadi, no if first and foremost thou wast at the slaying when ye assailed thiassi that from my dwellings and fields shall to thee ever cold counsels come loki milder wast thou of speech to laufey's son when to thy bed thou didst invite me such matters must be mentioned if we accurately must recount our vices then came sif forth and poured out mead for loki in an icy cup saying 
hail to thee loki and this cool cup receive full of old mead at least me alone among the blameless asia race leave stainless he took the horn drank and said so alone shouldst thou be hadst thou strict and prudent been towards thy mate but one i know and i think know him well a favoured rival of lord Eddie, and that is the wily loki bela the fells all tremble i think the Loridi is far from home journeying he will bid be quiet him who here insults all gods and men loki be silent bela thou big Vir's wife and with much evil mingled never came a greater monster among the Aesir's sons thou art a dirty strumpet thor then came in and said silence thou impure being my mighty hammer mjolnir shall stop thy prating i will thy head from thy neck strike then will thy life be ended loki now the son of earth is hither come why dost thou chase so thor thou wilt not dare do so when the wolf thou hast to fight and he the all-powerful father swallows whole thor silence thou impure being my mighty hammer mjolnir shall stop thy prating up i will hurry thee to the east region and none shall see thee after loki of thy eastern travels thou shouldst never to people speak since in a glove thumb thou and harry wast doubled up and hardly thoughtest thou as thor thor silence thou impure being my mighty hammer mjolnir shall stop thy prating with this right hand i hrungnir's bane shall smite thee so that thy every bone be broken loki tis my intention a long life to live though with thy hammer thou dost threaten me skrymir's throng seem to thee hard when at the food thou could not get when in full health of hunger dying thor silence thou impure being my mighty hammer mjolnir shall stop thy preting hrungnir's bane shall cast thee down to hell beneath the gratings of the dead loki i have said before the azure i have said before the azure sons that which my mind suggested but for thee alone will i go out because i know that thou wilt fight o gear thou hast brewed beer but thou never shalt henceforth a computation hold all thy possessions which are herein flames shall play over and on thy back shall burn thee after this loki in the likeness of a salmon cast himself into the waterfall of Frannanger, where the azure caught him and bound him with the entrails of his son nari but his other son narfi was changed into a wolf scotty took a venomous serpent and fastened it up over loki's face the venom trickled down from it sigyn loki's wife sat by and held the basin under the venom and when the basin was full carried the venom out meanwhile the venom dropped on loki who shrank from it so violently that this whole earth trembled this causes what are now called earthquakes End of section 14section fifteen the lay of fields fifth of the elder eddas of samen sikfusen and the younger eddas of snorre sturlson edited by rasmus b anderson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org this recording by becky cook the lay of fields fifth from the outward wall he saw one ascending to the seat of the giant race fields fifth along the human ways haste thee back hence here wretch is no place for thee what monster is it before the four courts standing and hovering round the perilous flame whom dost thou seek of what art thou in quest or what friendless being desires thou to know wanderer what monster is that before the four courts standing who to the wayfarer offers not hospitality void of honest fame prattler hast thou lived but hence hie thee home Fjolsvith. Fjolsvith is my name. Wise am I of mind, though of food not prodigal. Within these courts thou shalt never come, so now, wretch, take thyself off. Wanderer. From the eye's delight few are disposed to hurry, where there is something pleasant to be seen. These walls, methinks, shine all round golden halls. Here I could live contented with my lot. Fjolsvith. Tell me, youth, of whom thou art born, or of what race hast sprung wanderer vind called am i called varkalt was my father named his sire rizfiel called tell me fjolsvith that which i will ask thee and i desire to know who here holds sway and has power over these lands and costly halls fjolsvith 
Menglod is her name, her mother her begat with Svath, Thor, and son. Here holds sway, and has power over these lands and costly halls. Vinkald, tell me, Fjolsvith, what the great is called, than which among the gods mortals never saw a greater artifice. Fjolsvith, Thrumgjol is it called, and Solblindi's three sons constructed it. A fetter fastens every wayfair who lifts it from its openings. Vindkald, tell me, Fjolsvith, what the structure is called than which among the gods mortals never saw a greater artifice. Fjolsvith, Grestopnir is it called, and I constructed it of Leirbrimir's limbs. I have so supported it that it will ever stand while the world lasts. Vindkald, tell me, Fjolsvith, what those dogs are called that chase away the giantesses and safety to the fields restore. Fjolsvith, Gifir the one is called, the other Gary, if thou that wouldst know, eleven watches they shall keep until the powers perish. Vindkald, tell me, Fjolsvith, whether any man can enter while those fierce assailants sleep. Fjolsvith, alternate sleep was strictly to them enjoined, since to the watch they were appointed. One sleeps by night, by day the other, so that no wight can enter if he comes. Vindkald, tell me, Fjolsvith, whether there is any food that man can get, such that they can run in while they eat. Fjolsvith, two repasts lie in Vidofnir's rings, if thou that would snow. That is alone such food as men can give them, and run in while they eat. Vindkald, tell me, Fjolsvith, what that tree is called that with its branches spreads itself over every land? Fjolsvith, Mema Medir is it called, but few men knows from what roots it springs. It by that will fall which few us know, nor fire nor iron will harm it. Vindkald, tell me, Fjolsvith, to what the virtue is of that famed tree applied, which nor fire nor iron will harm. Fjolsvith, its fruit shall on the fire be laid for laboring women. Out then will pass what would in remain, so it is a creator of mankind. Vindkald, tell me, Fjolsvith. What the cock is called that sits in that lofty tree, and all glittering is with gold? Fjolsvith. Vidofnir is he called, in the clean air he stands, in the boughs of Mima's tree. Affliction only brings, together indissoluble, the swart bird at his lonely meal. Vindkald. Tell me, Fjolsvith, whether there be any weapon before which Vidofnir may fall to hell's abode. Fjolsvith. If a time that twig is named, and Lopt plucked it down by the gate of death. In an iron chest it lies in St. Mora, and is with nine strong locks secured. Vinkald, tell me, Fjolsvith, whether he will alive return who seeks after, and will take that rod. Fjolsvith, he will return who seeks after, and will take the rod, if he bears that which few possesses, the dame of the glassy clay. Vinkald, tell me, Fjolsvith, whether there is any treasure that mortals can obtain at which the pale giantess will rejoice. Fjolsvith, the bright sickle that lies in Vidofnir's wings, thou in a bag shalt bear, and to St. Mora give, before she will think it fit to lend an arm for conflict. Vinkald, tell me, Fjolsvith, what this hall is called which in girt round a curious flickering flame? Fjolsvith, here is it called, and it will long tremble as on a lance's point. This sumptuous house shall for ages hence be but from hearsay known. Vindkald, tell me, Fjolsvith, which of the Aesir's sons hast that constructed which within the court I saw? Fjolsvith, Uni and Iri, Bari and Ori, Var and Figdrasil, Dori and Uri, Delling and Atvard, Lidskjalf, Loki. Vindkald, tell me, Fjolsvith, what that mount is called on which I see a splendid maiden stand? Fjolsvith, if I aberg, tis called, and long has it a solace been to the bowed down and sorrowful, each woman becomes healthy, although years disease she have, if she can but ascend it. Vind called, tell me, Fjolsvith, how these maids are called who sit at Menglod's knees in harmony together. Fjolsvith, Hlif the first is called, the second is Hlif Thursa, the third Theodvarta, Bjort and Blid, Blidir, Frid, Er, and Aurora. Vind called, tell me, Fjolsvith, whether they protect those who offer to them, if it should, be needful. 
Fjolsfith. Every summer in which men offer to them at the holy place, no pestilence so great shall come to those sons of men, but they will free each from peril. Vind called. Tell me, Fjolsfith, whether there is any man that may in Menclod's soft arms sleep. Fjolsfith. There is no man who may in Menglod's soft arm sleep, save only Sviddag. To him the sunbright maid is for wife betrothed. Findkal, set the doors open, let the gates stand wide. Here thou mayest Sviddag see, but yet go learn if Menglod will accept my love. Fjolsvith, here, Menglod, a man is hither come, go and behold the stranger. The dogs rejoice, the house has itself opened. I think it must be Sviddag. Menglod, fierce raven shall on the high gallows tear out thy eyes, if thou art lying, that hither from afar is come the youth unto my halls. Whence art thou come? Whence hast thou journeyed? How do thy kindred call thee? Of thy race and name I must have a token, if I was betrothed to thee. Sviptog, Sviptog I am named, Solbiart was my father named, thence the winds on the cold ways drove me. Earth's decree may no one gainsay, however light be uttered. Menglod, welcome thou art, my will I have obtained, greeting a kiss shall follow. A sight unlooked for gladdens most persons when one the other loves. Long have I sat on my love till day and night expecting thee, now that it has come to pass which I have hoped, that thou, dear youth, again to my halls art come. Sviptog, longing have I undergone for thy love and thou for my affection. Now it is certain that we shall pass our lives together. End of section 15《Section 16: Section sixteen, the Lay of Hindla of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sikfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturlson, edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The Lay of Hindla. Freya rides with her favorite Ottar to Hindla, Avala, for the purpose of obtaining information respecting Ottar's genealogy son's information being required by him in a legal dispute with Angatir. Having obtained this, Freya further requests Hinla to give Ottar a position that will enable him to remember all that has been told him. This she refuses, but is forced to comply by Freya having encircled her cave with flames. She gives him the potion, but accompanied by a malediction, which is by Freya turned into a blessing. Freya, wake maid of maids, wake my friend Hinla, sister, who in the cavern dwellest, now there is dark of darks, we will both to Valhall ride, and to the holy flame. Let us, Herr Father, pray into our minds to enter. He gives and grants gold to the deserving. He gave to Hermod a helm and corslet, and from him Sigmund a sword received. Victory to sons he gives, but to some riches. Eloquence to the great, and to men wit. Fair wind he gives to traitors, but posy to scalds. Valor he gives to many a warrior. She to Thor will offer, she to him will pray that to thee he may be well disposed, although he bears ill will to Jotun females. Now of thy wolves take one from out the stall, let him run with runic rein. Hindla, sluggish is thy hog, the god's way to tread. Freya, I will my noble palfrey saddle. Hindla, false art thou, Freya, who temptest me by the eyes thou showest it, so fixed upon us, while thou thy man hast on the dead road, the young Ottar, Instein's son. Dull art thou, Hindla, methinks thou dreamest, since thou sayest that my man is on the dead road with me. There where my hawk sparkles with its golden bristles, hight Hild Savini, which for me made the two skilful dwarves, Dane and Nabi. From the saddle we will talk. Let us sit, and of princely families discourse, of those chieftains who from the gods descend. They have contested for the dead's gold, Otter the young, and Angantir. A duty tis to act to the young prince his paternal heritage may have after his kindred an offer said to me he raised with stones constructed now is that stone as glass become with the blood of oxen he newly sprinkled it otter ever trusted in the asnir now let us reckon up the ancient families and the races of exalted men who were the skjoldungs who are the skilfings who the odlings who the yilfings who the hold born who's the hares born the choicest race of men under heaven Hindla thou ottar art of instinct born but instinct was from alf the old alf from ulf or from sefari but sefari from svan the red 
Thy father had a mother for her necklaces famed. She, I think, was named Latus, the priestess. Frodi her father was, and her mother Friant. All that stock is reckoned among chieftains. Ali was of old of men the strongest. Halfdan before him, the highest of the Skjoldungs. Famed were the wars by those chieftains led. His deeds seemed to soar to the skirts of heaven. By Imund aided, chief of men, he Sigtrig slew with the cold steel. He, Almveig, had the wife first of woman. They begot and had eighteen sons. From them the Skjoldungs, from them the Skilfings, from them the Odlings, from them the Yinglings, from them the Holdborn, from them the Harrisborn, the choicest race of men under heaven. All that race is thine, O Tarhamski. Hildegun, her mother, was of Svafa born in the Sea King. All that race is thine, O Tarhamski. Carest thou this to know? Wishest thou a longer narrative? Dog wedded Thor, mother of warriors, of that race was born the noble champions, Fradmar, Geard, and the Frakus, both, Alm, Yoser, Mar, Alf the old. Carest thou this to know? Wishest thou a longer narrative? Ketil their friendship was named, heir of Kleep. He was maternal grandsire of thy mother. Then was Frodi yet before Kari, but the eldest born was Alf. Nana was next, Nokvi's daughter, her son was the father's kinsman. Ancient is that kinship. I knew both Brod and Horfi. All that race is thine, Otter Heimski. Isolf, Asolf, Almad's sons, and Skurhild's, Skekil's daughter. Thou shalt yet count chieftains many. All that race is thine, Otter Heimski. Gunnar, Balk, Grim, Ardskafi, Jarnskjold, Thorir, Ulf, Genandi, Bui and Brami. Bari and Reifnir, Tind and Hirfing, the two Hadingis, all that race is thine, Otter Heimski. To toil and tumult were the sons of Arngrim born, and of Ifura, ferocious berserker, calamity of every kind, by land and sea like fire they carried, all that race is thine, Otter Heimski. I knew both Broad and Horfi, they were in the court of Rolf the Old, all descended from Jormenrek, son in law of Sigurd. Listen to my story, the dread of nations whom who Fafnir slew. He was a king from Volsung sprung, and Hjordis from Hrodung, but I limmy from the Odlings, all that race is thine, Otter Heimski. Gunnar and Hogni, sons of Gyuki, and Gudrun likewise their sister. Guthorm was not of Gyuki's race, although he brother was of them both. All that race is thine, Otter Heimski. Harold Hindenton, born of Freykir, Slongvangbagi. He was a son of Aud. He was a son of Aud. Aud the rich was Ivir's daughter, but Radbard was Randver's father. They were heroes to the gods devoted. All that race is thine, Otterheimski. There was eleven Asia reckoned when Baldur on the pile was laid. Him Vali showed himself worthy to avenge. His own brother, he the slayer, slew. All that race is thine, Otterheimski. Baldur's father was son of Burr. Frey to wife had Gerd. She was Gymir's daughter, from Jotun sprung, and Arboda. Thiasi also was their relation, that haughty Jotun. Skadi was his daughter. We tell thee much, and remember more. I admonish thee thus much to know. Wishes thou yet a longer narrative? Haki was not the worst of Hvedna's sons, and Hjovord was Fedna's father. Hyde and Hrostiof were from Nir's race. All the Valas are from Vidolf, from the soothsayers from Vildvamir. All the sorcerers from Svarthvafti, all the Jotuns come from Ymir. We tell thee much, and more remember, I admonish thee, thus much to know. Wishest thou yet a longer narrative? There was one born in times of old, with wondrous might and doubt, of origin divine. Nine Jotun maids gave birth to the gracious god at the world's margin. Yelp gave him birth, Grape gave him birth, Isla gave him birth, and Agea. Ulfren gave him birth, and Er Giafa, Imd and Atla, and Yansaksa. The boy was nourished with the strength of earth, with the ice-cold sea, and with sun's blood. We tell thee much, and much more remember. I admonish thee thus much to know. Wishest thou yet a longer narrative? Loki begot the wolf Anger Boda, but sleep near he begot with Svidolf Thari. One monster steamed of all most deadly, which from Byleth's brother sprang. Loki, scorched up in his heart's affections, had found a half bird woman's heart. Loki became guileful from that wicked woman. Thence in the world are all giantesses come. Ocean towers with storms to heaven itself flows o'er the land. The air is rent. 
Thence come snows and rapid winds, and then it is decreed that the rain should cease. There was one born greater than all, the boy was nourished with the strength of earth, he was declared a ruler, mightiest and richest, allied by kingship to all princes. Then shall another come, yet mightier, although I dare not his name declare. Few may see further forth than when Odin meets the wolf. Freya, bear thou the memory cup to my guest, so that he may all the words repeat of his discourse, on the third morn when he and Angatir reckon up races. Hindla. Go thou quickly hence, I long to sleep, more of my wondrous power thou gettest not from me. Thou runnest, my hot friend, out at nights, as among he-goats the she-goat goes. Thou hast run thyself mad ever longing, many a one hath stolen under thy girdle. Thou runnest, my hot friend, out at night, as among he-goats the she-goat goes. Freya, fire I strike over thee, dweller of the wood, so that thou goest not ever away from hence. Hindla, fire I see burning, and the earth blazing, many will have their lives to save. Bear thou the cup to otter's hand, the mead with venom mingled, in an evil hour. Freya, thy malediction shall be powerless, although thou, Jotun, may dost evil threaten. He shall drink delicious draughts, all the gods I pray to favor otter. End of section 16 Section 17 The Incantation of Groa Of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sikfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The Incantation of Groa Son, wake up, Groa, wake up, good woman. At the gates of death I wake thee, if thou rememberest that thou thy son badest to thy grave mound to come. Mother, what now troubles my only son? With what affliction art thou burthened, that thou thy mother callest, who to dust is come, and from human homes departed? Son, a hateful game thou crafty woman didst set before me, whom my has father in his bosom cherished, when thou badest me go no one knows whither, men glad to meet. Mother, long is the journey, long are the ways, long are men's desires, if it so fall out, that thou thy will obtainest, the event must then be as it may. Son, sing to me songs which are good, mother, protect thy son. Dead on my way I fear to be, I seem too young in years. Mother, I will sing to thee first one that is thought most useful, which Rhine sang to Rhine, that from thy shoulders thou shouldst cast what to thee seems irksome, let thyself thyself direct. A second I will sing to thee, as thou hast to wander joyless on thy ways. May Erd's protection hold thee on every side, where thou seest turpitude. A third I will sing to thee, if the mighty rivers to thy life's peril fall, horn and rude, may they flow down to hell, and for thee ever be diminished. A fourth song I will sing to thee, if the foes assail thee ready on the dangerous road, their heart shall fail them, and to thee be power, and their minds to peace be turned. A fifth I will sing to thee, if bonds be cast on thy limbs, friendly spells I will let on thy joints be sung, and the lock from thy arm shall start, and from thy feet the fetter. A sixth I will sing to thee, if on the sea thou comest more stormy than men have known it, air and water shall be in a bag attend thee, and a tranquil course afford thee. A seventh I will sing to thee, if on a mountain high frost should assail thee, deadly cold shall not thy carcass injure, nor draw thy body to thy limbs. An eighth I will sing to thee, if night overtake thee, when out on the misty way, that the dead Christian woman no power may have to do thee harm. A ninth I will sing to thee, if with a far-famed spear-armed Jotun thou words exchangest, of words and wit to thy mindful heart abundance shall be given. Go now ever where calamity may be, and no harm shall obstruct thy wishes. On a stone fast in the earth I have stood within the door, while songs I sang to thee. My son, bear hence thy mother's words, and in thy breast let them dwell. For happiness abundant shalt thou have in life, while of my words thou art mindful. End of section 17 Section 18 The Song of the Sun The Elder Eddas of Samen Sikfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson The Song of the Sun 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The Song of the Sun. This singular poem, the authorship of which is, in some manuscripts assigned to Samond himself, may be turned a voice from the dead, given under the form of a dream in which a deceased father is supposed to address his son from another world. The first seven strophes seem hardly connected with the following ones, which, as far as the thirty-second, consists chiefly in aphorisms, with examples, some closely resembling those in the Havamal, and the remaining portion is given the recital of the last illness of the supposed speaker, his death, and the scenes his soul passed through on the way to its final home. The composition exhibits a strange mixture of Christianity and heathenism, whence it would seem that the poet's own religion was in a transition state of the allusions to heathenism it is however to be observed that they are chiefly to persons and actions of which there is no trace in the odinic mythology as known to us and are possibly the fruits of the poet's own imagination the title of the poem is no doubt derived from the allusion to the sun at the beginning of strophes thirty nine through forty five for an elaborate and learned commentary with an interlinear version of the song of the sun the reader may consult les chants des Souls by professor bergman strasbourg and paris 1858. Of life and property a fierce freebooter despoiled mankind. Over the ways beset him by might no one living pass. Alone he ate most frequently. No one invited he to his repast, until weary and with failing strain, a wandering guest came from the way. In need of drink that wayworn man and hungry feigned to be, with trembling heart he seemed to trust him, who had been so evil-minded. Meat and drink to the weary one he gave, all with upright heart. On God he thought, the traveller's want supplied, for he felt he was an evil-doer. Up stood the guest, he evil meditated. He had not been kindly treated, his sin within him swelled. He, while sleeping, murdered his weary, cautious host. The God of heaven he prayed for help, when being struck he woke. But he was doomed the sins of him on himself to take, whom sackless he had slain. Holy angels came from heaven above, and took to them his soul, and a life of purity it shall ever live with the Almighty God. Riches and health no one may command, though all go smoothly with him. To many that befalls which they least expect, no one may command his tranquillity. Unor and Sevaldi never imagined that happiness would fall from them, yet naked they became, and of all bereft, and like wolves ran to the forest. The forest of pleasure has many a one bewailed, Cares are often caused by women, pernicious they become, although the mighty God them pure created. United were Svafud and Skatherin, neither might without the other be, until frenzy they were driven for a woman. She was destined for their perdition. On account of that fair maid neither of them cared for the games or joyous days. No other thing could they in memory bear than that bright form. Sad to them were the gloomy nights, no sweet sleep might they enjoy but from that anguish rose hate intense between the faithful friends hostile deeds are in most places fiercely avenged to the home they went for that fair woman and each one found his death arrogance should no one entertain i indeed have seen that those who follow her for the most part turn from god rich were both ready and fair bogey and thought only of their well-being now they sit and turn their swords to various hearths they in themselves confided, and thought themselves alone to be above all people, but their lot Almighty God was pleased otherwise to appoint. A life of luxury they led in many ways, and had gold for sport. Now they are requited, so that they must walk between frost and fire. To thy enemies trust thou never, although they speak thee fair. Promise them good, tis good to have another's injury as a warning. So it befell sorely the upright when he placed himself in Vigolf's power. He confidently trusted him, his brother's murderer, but he proved false. Peace to them he granted with heart sincere, they in return promised him gold, feigned themselves friends while they together drank, but then came forth their guile. Then afterwards, on the second day, when they in Rigiardal rode, they with swords wounded him who sackless was, and let his life go forth. His corpse they dragged on a lonely way, and cut up piecemeal into a well, and would it hide but the holy Lord beheld from heaven. His soul summoned home the true God into his joy to come, but the evil duel's will, I ween, late be from torments called. Do thou pray the disear of the Lord's words to be kind to thee in spirit, for a week after all shall then go happily according to thy will. For a deed of ire that thou hast perpetrated never atone with evil, 
the weeping thou shalt soothe with benefits that is salutary to the soul on god a man shall for good things call on him who has mankind created greatly sinful is every man who late finds the father to be solicited we opine is with all earnestness for that which is lacking of all things may be destitute he who for nothing asks few heed the wants of the silent late i came though called betimes to the supreme judge's door thither ward i yearn for it was promised me he who craves it shall of the feast partake sins are the cause that sorrowing we depart from this world no one stands in dread if he does no evil good it is to be blameless like unto wolves all those seem who have a faithless mind so he will prove who has to go through ways strewed with gleeds friendly counsels and wisely composed seven i have imparted to thee consider thou them well and forget them never they are all useful to learn of that i will speak how happy i was in the world and secondly how the sons of men reluctantly become corpses pleasure and pride deceive the sons of men who after money crave shining riches at last become a sorrow many have riches driven to madness steeped in joys they seem to men for little did i see before me our worldly sojourn has the lord created in delights abounding bowed down i sat long i tottered of life was most desirous but he prevailed who was all-powerful onward are the ways of the doomed the cords of hell were tightly bound round my sides i would rend them but they were strong tis easy free to go i alone knew how on all sides my pains increased the maids of hell each eve with horror bade me to their home the sun i saw true star of day sink in its roaring home but hell's great doors on the other side i heard heavily creaking the sun i saw with blood-red beams beset fast was i then from this world declining mightier she appeared in many ways than she was before the sun i saw and it seemed to me as if i saw a glorious god i bowed before her for the last time in the world of men the sun i saw she beamed forth so that i seemed nothing to know but gial streams roared from the other side mingled much with blood the sun i saw with quivering eyes appalled and shrinking for my heart in great measure was dissolved in languor the sun i saw seldom sadder i had then almost from the world declined my tongue was as would become and all was cold without me the sun i saw never after since that gloomy day for the mountain waters closed over me and i went called from torments the star of hope when i was born fled from my breast away high it flew settled nowhere so that it might find rest longer than all was that one night when stiff on my straw i lay then become manifest the divine word man is the same as earth the creator god can it estimate and know he who made heaven and earth how forsaken many go hence although from kindred parted of his works each has the reward happy is he who does good of my wealth bereft to me was destined a bed strewed with sand bodily desires men oftentimes seduce of them has many a one too much water of baths was of all things to me most loathsome in the norn seat nine days i sat thence i was mounted on a horse there the giantess's sun shone grimly through the dripping clouds of heaven without and within i seemed to traverse all the seven nether worlds up and down i sought an easier way where i might have the readiest paths of that is to be told which i first saw when i to the worlds of torment came scorched birds which were souls flew numerous as flies from the west i saw von's dragons fly and glaval's paths obscure their wings they shook wide around me seemed the earth and heaven to burst the sun's heart i saw from the south coming he was by two together led his feet stood on the earth but his horns reached up to heaven from the north riding i saw the sons of needy they were seven in all from full horns the pure mead they drank from the heavens god's well the wind was silent the water stopped their course then i heard a doleful sound for their husbands false-faced women ground earth for food gory stones those dark women turned sorrowfully bleeding hearts hung out of their breasts faint with much affliction many a man i saw wounded go on those gleed strewed paths their faces seemed to me all reddened with reeking blood many men i saw to earth gone down who holy service might not have heathen and stars stood above their heads painted with deadly characters i saw those men who much envy harbour at another's fortune bloody runes were on their breasts graved painfully i there saw men many not joyful they were all wandering wild this he earns who by this world's vices is infatuated 
I saw those men who had in various ways acquired others' property. In shoals they went to the castle covetous, and burthens bore of lead. I saw those men who many had of life and property bereft. Through the breasts of those men passed strong venomous serpents. I saw those men who the holy days would not observe. Their hands were on hot stones firmly nailed. I saw those men who from pride valued themselves too highly. Their garments ludicrously were in fire enveloped. I saw those men who had many false words of others uttered, hell's ravens from their heads their eyes miserably tore. All the horrors thou wilt not get to know which hell's inmates suffer, pleasant sins end in painful penalties, pains ever follow pleasure. I saw those men who had much given for God's laws, pure lights were above their heads brightly burning. I saw those men who from exalted mind helped the poor to aid, angels read holy books above their heads. I saw those men who with much fasting had their bodies wasted. God's angels bowed before them, that is the highest joy. I saw those men who had put food into their mother's mouth. Their couches were on the rays of heaven pleasantly placed. Holy virgins had cleanly washed the souls from sin of those men who for a long time had themselves tormented. Lofty cars I saw towards heaven going. They were on the way to God. Men guided them who had been murdered wholly without crime. Almighty Father, greatest Son, Holy Spirit of Heaven, Thee I pray who hast us all created, free us all from miseries. Bugvor and Yistvor sat at Herder's doors. On resounding seat iron gore falls from their nostrils, which kindles hate among men. Odin's wife rose in earth's ship, eager after pleasures. Her sails are reefed late, which on the ropes of desire are hung. I, thy father, and Solkatla's sons, have alone obtained for thee that horn of heart which from the grave mound bore the wise Vigdvalin. Here are the runes which have engraven Njord's daughters nine, Radvord the eldest, and the youngest Kreipvor, and their seven sisters. How much violence have they perpetrated, Svath and Svlathlogi? Bloodshed they have excited, and wounds have sucked after an evil custom. This lay which I have taught thee, thou shalt before the living sing, the sun-song, which will appear in many parts no fiction. Here we part, but again shall meet on the day of men's rejoicing. O Lord, unto the dead grant peace, and to the living comfort. Wondrous lore has in dream to thee been sung, but thou hast seen the truth. No man has been so wise created that has before heard the sun-song. End of section 18section nineteen the lay of voland of the elder eddas of same and sigfusen and the younger eddas of snorri sturlson edited by rasmus b anderson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org this recording by becky cook the lay of voland there was a king in sweden named nidud he had two sons and a daughter whose name was bodvild there were three brothers, sons of the king of the Finns. One was called Slogfid, the second Egil, and the third Voland. They went on snowshoes and hunted wild beasts. They came to Ulfdal, and there made themselves a house, where there is a water called Ulfsiar. Early one morning they found on the border of the lake three females sitting and spinning flax. Near them lay their swan plumages. They were Valkyries. Two of them, Plodgud Svanfit, and Hervor Alvit were daughters of King Hlodver. The third was Olrun, a daughter of Kiar of Valand. They took them home with them to their dwelling. Egil had Olrun, Slagfit, Slangfit, and Voland Alvit. They lived there seven years, when they flew away seeking conflicts, and did not return. Egil then went on snowshoes in search of Olrun, and Slagfit in search of Svanfit. But Voland remained in Ulfdal. He was a most skilful man, as we learn from old traditions. King Nudud ordered him to be seized, so it is here related. Maids flew from the south through the murky wood, Alvit the young, fate to fulfill. On the lake's margin they sat to repose, the southern damsels, precious flax they spun. One of them of maidens fairest, to his comely breast Agil clasped. Svanhvit was the second, she a swan's plumage bore, but the third, their sister, the white neck clasped of Voland. There they stayed seven winters through, but all the eighth were with longing seized, and in the ninth fate parted them. The maidens yearned for the murky wood, the young Alvit fate to fulfill. 
from the chase came the hardened hunters slogfeed and Egil found their houses deserted went out and in and looked around Egil went east after olrun and slogfeed west after svanheit but voland alone remained in ulfdal he the red gold set with the hard gem well fastened all the rings on linden bast and so awaited his bright consort if to him she would return it was told to nidud the niarer's lord that voland alone remained in ulfdal and the night went men in studded corslets their shields glistened in the waning moon from their saddles they alighted at the house's gable thence went in through the house on the bast they saw the rings all drawn seven hundred which the warrior owned and they took them off and they put them on all save one which they bore away came then from the chase the ardent hunter voland gliding on the long way to the fire he went bears flesh to roast soon blazed the brushwood and the arid fir the wind-dried wood before voland on the bear skin sat his rings counted the alfar's companion one was missing he thought that lord fair's daughter had it the young alvit and that she was returned so long he sat until he slept and he awoke of joy bereft on his hands he felt heavy constraints and round his feet fetters clasped who are the men that on the ring's possessor have laid bonds and me have bound then cried nudud the niar's lord whence goddest thou boland alfar's chief our golden ufdal no gold was here in grani's path for i thought our land from the hills of rhine i mind me that we more treasures possessed when a whole family we were at home Flodgud and hervar were of hodfers born known was olver and kiar's daughter she entered into the house stood on the floor her voice moderated now he was not mirthful who from the forest comes king nidud gave to his daughter bodvild the ring which had been taken from the bast in voland's house but he himself bore the sword that had belonged to voland the queen said his teeth he shows when the sword he sees and bodvild's ring he recognizes threatening are his eyes as glistening serpents let be severed his sinew's strength and set him then in serverstad this was done he was hamstrung and then set on a certain small island near the shore called serverstad he there forged for the king all kinds of jewelry work no one was allowed to go to him except the king voland said the sword shines in nidud's belt which i wetted as i could most skilfully and tempered as seemed to me most cunningly that bright blade forever's taken from me never shall i see it borne into voland's smithy now bodfield wears my consort's red gold rings for this i have no indemnity he sat and never slept and his hammer plied but much more speedy vengeance devised on nidud the two young sons of nidud ran in the door to look and save our stad to the chest they came for the keys asked manifest was their grudge when therein they looked many necklaces were there which to those youths appeared of the red gold to be and treasures come ye two alone to-morrow come that gold shall be given to you tell it not to the maidens nor to the household folk nor to any one that ye have been with me early called one the other brother brother let us go see the rings to the chest they came for the keys asked manifest was the grudge when therein they looked of those children he the heads cut off and under the prisons mixen laid their bodies but their skulls beneath the hair he in silver set and to nidud gave and of their eyes precious stones he formed which to nidud's wily wife he sent but of the teeth of the two breast ornaments he made and to bodvild sent then did bodvild praise the ring to voland brought it when she had broken it i dare to no one tell it save alone to thee voland i will so repair the fractured gold that to thy father it shall fairer seem and to thy mother much more beautiful and to thyself in the same degree he then brought her beer that he might succeed the better as on her seat she fell asleep now how have i my wrongs avenged all save one in the woods perpetrated i wish said voland that on my feet i were of the use of which nidud's men have deprived me laughing voland rose in the air bodvild weeping from the isle departed she mourned her lover's absence and for her father's wrath stood without nidud's wily wife then she went in through the hall but he on the enclosure sat down to rest art thou awake niar's lord ever am i awake joyless i lie to rest when i call to mind my children's death my head is chilled cold are to me thy counsels now with voland i desire to speak tell me voland alfar's chief of my brave boys what is become oath shalt thou first to me swear by board of ship by room of shield by shoulder of steed 
by edge of sword, that thou wilt not slay the wife of Voland, nor of my bride cause the death, although a wife I have whom ye know, or offspring within thy court. To the smithy go, which thou hast made, there wilt thou the bellows find with blood besprinkled, the heads I severed of thy boys, and under the prison's mix and laid their bodies. But their skulls beneath the hair I and silver set, and to Nidud gave, and of their eyes precious stones I formed, which to Nidud's wily wife I sent. Of the teeth, of the two breast ornaments I made, and to Bodvild sent. Now Bodvild goes big with child, the only daughter of you both. Word didst thou never speak that more afflicted me, or for which I would more severely punish thee. There is no man so tall that he from thy horse can take thee, or so skilful that he can shoot thee down, thence where thou floatest up in the sky. Laughing, Voland rose in the air, but Nidud sad remained sitting. Rise up, Thrakrad, my best of thralls. Bid Bodvild, my fair-browed daughter, in bright attire come, with her sire, to speak. Is it, Bodvild, true what has been told to me, that thou and Voland in the isles together sat? True it is, Nidud, what has been told to thee, that Voland and I in the isle together sat, in an unlucky hour, would it have never been. I could not against him strive, I might not against him prevail. End of section 19 Section 20. The Lay of Helgi, Hiarvort's son, of the elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusen and the younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson. Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The Lay of Helgi, Hiarvort's son. There was a king named Hiarvord who had four wives, one of whom was named Alfid, their son was named Hayden. The second was named Sered. Their son was named Hunglung. The third was named Sinriod. Their son was Himling. King Hiorvord made a vow that he would have to wife the most beautiful woman he knew of, and was told that King Svafnir had a daughter of incomparable beauty, named Sigurlin. He had a jarl named Idmund, whose son Atli was sent to demand the hand of Sigurlin for the king. He stayed throughout the winter with King Svafnir. There was a jarl there named Franmar, who was the foster-father of Sigurlin, and had a daughter named Alof. This jarl advised that the maiden should be refused, and Atli returned home. One day, when the jarl's son Atli was standing in a grove, there was a bird sitting in the boughs above him, which had heard that his men called the wives which King Hiorvard had the most beautiful. The bird talked, and Atli listened to what it said. The bird said, Hast thou seen Sigurlin's Fafnir's daughter, of maidens fairest, in her pleasant home? Though fair the wives of Hiarvard seem to men in Glassislund. Atli, with Atli Idmund's son, sagacious bird, wilt thou further speak? Bird, I will if the prince will offer to me, and I may choose what I will from the king's court. Atli, choose not Hiarvard, nor his sons, nor the fair daughters of that prince, nor the wives which the king has. Let us together bargain, that is the part of friends. Bird, a fane I will chose, offer steeds many, gold-horned cows from the chief's land, if Sigurlin sleep in his arms, and unconstrained with that prince shall live. This took place before Atli's journey, but after his return, when the king asked his tidings, he said, Labor we have had, but Aaron none performed. Our horses failed us, and the vast fell. We had afterwards a swampy lake to ford, then was denied us Fafnir's daughter with rings adorned whom we would obtain. The king commanded them to go a second time, and also went himself. But when they had ascended a fell, and saw in Svafland the country on fire, and a great reek from the horses of cavalry, the king rode down the fell into the country, and took up his night quarters by a river. Atli kept watch and crossed the river, and came to house on which sat a great bird to guard it, but was asleep. Atli shot the bird dead with an arrow. In the house he found the king's daughter, Sigurlin, and Alof, daughter of Franmar, and brought them both away with him. The jarl Franmar had taken the form of an eagle and protected them from a hostile army by sorcery. There was a king named Hrodmar, a wooer of Sigurlin. He had slain the king of Svavaland, and ravaged and burnt the country. Hiorvord obtained Sigurlin, and Atli Alof. Hiorvord and Sigurlin had a son tall and comely. He was taciturn and had no fixed name. He was sitting on a mound when he saw nine Valkyries, one of whom was a most noble aspect. She said, 
late wilt thou helgi rings possess a potent warrior a rodal svelier so at morn the eagle sang if thou art ever silent although thou prince a fierce mood mayest show helgi what will thou let accompany the name of helgi made of aspect bright since that thou art pleased to give me think well over that thou art saying i will not accept it unless i have thee also valkyrie swords i know lying in sigurd's home fewer by four than five times ten one of them is of all best of shields the bale with gold adorned a ring is on the hilt courage in the midst and the point tear for his use who owns it along the edge a blood-stained serpent lies and on the guard the serpent casts its tail there was a king named elima spava was his daughter she was the valkyrie and rode through air and water it was she who gave helgi that name and afterwards often protected him in battle helgi said hiarvord thou art not a king of wholesome counsel leader of people renowned though thou mayest be thou hast let fire devour the homes of princes though harm to thee they none have done but rodmar shall of the rings dispose which our relations have possessed that chief recks little of his life he thinks only to obtain the heritage of the dead hiarvord answers that he will supply helgi with an army if he will avenge his mother's father helgi thereupon seeks the sword that svava had indicated to him afterwards he and otli went and slew hrodmar and performed many deeds of valor he killed the jotun hati as he sat on a crag helgi and atli lay with their ships in hat fjord atli kept watch in the first part of the night hrimgerd hati's daughter said who are the chieftains in hat fjord with shields are your ships bedecked boldly ye bear yourselves few things ye fear i ween tell me how your king is named atli helgi is his name but thou nowhere canst to the chief do harm iron forts are around the prince's fleet giantesses may not assail us frimgerd how art thou named most powerful champion how do men call thee thy king confides in thee since in the ship's fair prow he gans thee place atli atli i am named fairest i shall prove to thee towards giantesses i am most hostile the human prow i have oft occupied and the night rider slain how art thou called corpse greedy giantess hag name thy father nine rash shouldst thou be underground and a forest grow on thy breast frimgerd frimgerd i am called hati was my father called whom i knew the mightiest jotun he many women had from their dwellings taken until him helgi slew atli thou wast hag before the prince's ships and layest before them in the fjord's mouth the chieftain's warriors thou wouldst to ran consign had a bar not crossed thee now atli thou art wrong methinks thou art dreaming thy brows thou lettest over thy eyelids fall my mother lay before the prince's ships i flodvard's sons drowned in the ocean thou wouldst nay atli if thou wert not a gelding see him gerd cocks her tail thy heart methinks atli is in thy hinder part although thy voice is clear atli i think i shall the stronger prove if thou desirest to try and i can step from the port to land thou shalt be soundly cudgelled if i hardly begin and let thy tail fall hrimgerd hrimgerd just come on shore atli if in thy strength thou trustest and let us meet in varinsvik a rib roasting thou shalt get brave boy if in my claws thou comest atli i will not come before the men awake and o'er the king hold watch it would not surprise me if from beneath our ship some hag arose himgrid keep watch atli and to him gerd pay the blood fine for hati's death if one night she may sleep with the prince she for the slain will be indemnified helgi loden is named he who shall thee possess thou to mankind art loathsome and thali dwells that thurs that dogwise jotun of all rock dwellers the worst he is a fitting man for thee Hrimgerd, helgi would rather have her who last night guarded the port and men the gold-bright maiden she methought had strength she stepped from port to land and so secured your fleet she was alone the cause that i could not the king's men slay helgi hear now hrimgerd if i may indemnify thee say fully to the king was it one being only that saved the prince's ships or went many together hrimgerd three troops of maidens though one made foremost rode bright with helmed head their horses shook themselves and from their manes there sprang dew into the deep dales hail on the lofty trees whence comes fruitfulness to man 
to me all that I saw was hateful. Atli, look eastward now, Hrimgerd, whether Helgi has not stricken thee with death-bearing words. By land and water the king's fleet is safe, and the chief's men also. It is now day, Hrimgerd, and Atli has thee detained to thy loss of life. A ludicrous haven mark twill indeed be, where thou a stone image standest. King Helgi was a renowned warrior. He came to King Elimi and demanded his daughter Svava. Helgi and Svava were united and loved each other ardently. Svava was a Valkyrie as before. Hayden was at home with his father, King Hjorvord in Norway. Returning home alone from the forest on Yule Eve, Hayden met a troll wife riding on a wolf with serpents for reins, who offered to attend him, but he declined her offer, whereupon she said, Thou shalt pay for this at Bragi Cup. In the evening solemn vows were made, and the sun hog was led forth, on which the guests laid their hands, and then made solemn vows at the Bragi Cup. Hayden bound himself by a vow to possess Svava, the beloved of his brother Helgi, but repented it so bitterly that he left home and wandered through wild paths to the southern lands, and there found his brother Helgi. Helgi said, Welcome art thou, Hayden. What new tidings canst thou give from Norway? What art thou, prince, from the land driven, and alone art come to find us? Hayden, of a much greater crime I am guilty. I have chosen a royal daughter, thy bride at Bragi Cup. Helgi, accuse not thyself a true will prove words at drinking uttered by us both me a chieftain has to the strand summoned within three nights i must be there tis to me doubtful whether i return then may well be such befall if it so must be hayden thou saidst helgi that hayden will deserved of thee and great gifts it would beseem thee better thy sword to redden than to grant peace to thy foes helgi so spoke for he had a foreboding that his death was at hand, and that his fiolgir, a tendon spirit, had accosted Hayden, when he saw the woman riding on a wolf. There was a king named Alf, a son of Frodmar, who had appointed a place of combat with Helgi in Sigar's plain within three days. Then said Helgi, On a wolf rode at evening twilight a woman who him offered to attend. She well knew that the son of Sigurlin would be slain on Sigar's plain. There was a great conflict, in which Helgi got his death wound. Helgi sent Sigar riding, after A. Limi's only daughter. He bade her quickly be in readiness, if she would find the king alive. Sigar, Helgi has me hither sent with thee, Svava, thyself to speak. Thee said the king he would fain see, ere the noble-born breathes forth his last. Svava, what has befallen Helgi, he of Ard's son? I am sorely by affliction stricken. Has the sea him deluded, or the sword wounded? On that man I will harm inflict. Sigar, this morning fell at Frekestein, the king who beneath the sun was of all the best. Alf has complete victory, though this time it should not have been. Helgi, hail to thee, Svava, thy love thou must abide. This in this world, methinks, is our last meeting. They say the chieftain's wounds are bleeding, the sword came too near my heart. I pray thee, Svava, weep not, my wife, if thou wilt my voice obey, that for Hayden thou a couch prepare, and the young prince in thy arms clasp. Spava, I had said in our pleasant home, when me for Helgi ring selected, that I would not gladly, after my king's departure, an unknown prince clasp in my arms. Hayden, kiss me, Svava, I will not return, Rogheim to behold, nor Rhoda's field, before I have avenged Shiavard's son, who was of kings under the sun the best. And Helgi and Svava were, it is said, born again. A footnote on Bragi's cup. At guilds the Bragi cup was drunk. It was the custom at the funeral feast of kings and jarls that the heir should sit on a lower seat until the bragaful was brought in, that he should then rise to receive it, make a vow, and drink the contents of the cup full. He was then led to his father's high seat. At an offering guild the chief signed with the figure of Thor's hammer, both the cup and the meat. First was drunk Odin's cup, for victory and power to the king, then Niord's cup, and Frey's, for a good year and peace after which it was the custom with many to drink a brag of full. The peculiarity of this cup was, that it was a cup of vows, that on drinking it a vow was made to perform some great and arduous deed, that might be made a subject for the Song of Scald. End of section 20section 21, the first lay of Helgi Hundingside, of the elder Eddas the same in Sikfusen, and the younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson, edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The First Lay of Helgi Hundingside It was in times of yore, when the eagle screamed, holy waters fell from the heavenly hills. Then to Helgi, the great of soul, Borgild gave birth in Brown. In the mansion it was night, the Norns came. Who should the prince's life determine? They him decreed a prince most famed to be, and of leaders accounted best. With all their might they spanned the fatal threads, when that he Berg should overthrow, in Brayland. They stretched out the golden cord, and beneath the middle of the moon's mansion fixed it. East and west they hid the ends where the prince had lands between. Towards the north Nary's sister cast a chain, which she bade last for ever. One thing disquieted the Yilfing's offspring, and the woman who had the child brought forth. Sitting on a lofty tree, on prey intent, a raven to a raven said, I know something. Stands cased in mail Sigmund's son, one day old. Now is our day come. His eyes are piercing as a warrior's. The wolf's friend he is. We shall rejoice. He to the folk appeared a noble chief to be. Among men t'was said that happy times were come. Went the king himself from the din of war, noble garlic to bring to the young happy prince. Gave him the name of Helgi, and Ringstadir, Solfiol, Snefiol, and Sigars Velir, Ringstad, Hetun, and him Vangar, a sword ornate, to Sinfiotli's brother. Then grew up in his friend's bosom the high-born youth, in joyous splendor. He paid and gave gold for deserts, nor spared the chief the blood-stained sword. A short time only the leader let warfare cease. When the prince was fifteen winters old, he caused the fierce Hunding to fall, who long had ruled over lands and people. The sons of Hunding afterwards demanded from Sigmund's son treasure and rings, because they had on the prince to avenge their great loss of wealth and their father's death. The prince would neither the blood find pay, nor for the slain indemnity would give. They might expect, he said, a terrific storm of grey arrows and Odin's ire. The warriors went to the trysting place of swords, which they had appointed at Lagafjol. Broken was Frodi's peace with the foes. Vidrier's hounds went about the isle, slaughter greedy. The leader sat under the Aristine, after he had slain Alf and Eyjolf, Hiarvord and Harvard, sons of Hunding. He had destroyed all of Gimimir's race. Then gleamed a ray from Lagafjol, and from that ray lightning issued. Then appeared in the field of air a helmed band of Valkyr. Their corslets were with blood besprinkled, and from their spears shone beams of light. Forthwith inquired the chieftain bold, from the wolf congress of the southern Desir, whether they would with the warriors that night go home. Then was a clash of arms. One from her horse, Hogni's daughter, stilled the crash of shields, and to the leader said, We have, I ween, other objects than with princely warriors to drink beer. My father has his daughter promised to the fierce son of Granmar, but I have Helgi, declared Hodbrod, the proud prince, like to a cat's son. That chief will come in a few days unless thou call to a hostile meeting, or the maiden take from the prince. Helgi, fear thou not to some slayer, there shall be first a clash of foes unless I am dead. Then sent messengers the potent prince through air and over water, succors to demand, and abundance of ocean's gleam to men to offer unto their sons. Bid them speedily to the ships to go, and those from Brandy to hold them ready. There the king abode, until thither came warriors and hundreds from Hedensey. From the strands also, and from the Staffnesses, a naval force went out, with gold adorned. Helgi, then of Hjorleif, asked, Hast thou mustered the valiant people? But the young king the other answered, Slowly, said he, are counted from Trunui, the long beak ships under the seafarers, which sail without the Orsund. Twelve hundred faithful men, though in Hattum there is more than half of the king's host, we are to war inured. Then the steersman threw the ship's tents aside, that the prince's people might awake, and the noble chiefs the dawn might see, and the warriors hauled the sails up to meet the mast in Varen's fjord. There was a dash of oars and clash of iron, shield against shield resounded. The vikings rode, warring went, under the chieftains the royal fleet far from the land. So might be heard when together came the tempest sister, and the long keels, as when rock and surge on each other break. Higher still bade Helgi the deep sail be hauled. No port gave shelter to the crews, when Ogier's terrific daughter the chieftain's vessel would o'er realm. 
but from above sigrun intrepid saved them and their fleet also from the hand of ran powerfully was rested the royal ship at nickpoland at eve they halted in unvagar the splendid ships might into port have floated but the crews from Svarn's Haug, in hostile mood, espied the host. Then demanded the god-born Gudmund, Who is the chieftain that commands the fleet, and that formidable force brings to our land? Sinfiotli said, slinging up the yard a red huge shield with golden rim. He at the strait kept watch, and able was to answer, and with noble words exchange. Tell it at eve, when you feed your pigs, and your dogs lead to their food, that the Yilfings from the east are calm, ready to fight at Nippeland. Hold broad with Helgi, find in the fleet's mist a king hard to make flee, who has oft the eagle sated, while thou wast in that mills kissing the thrall wenches. Gudmund, little dost thou remember of ancient saws when of the noble thou falsehoods utterest. Thou hast been eating wolves' dainties, and of thy brother wast the slayer. Wounds hast thou often sucked with cold mouth, everywhere loathed, thou hast crawled in caverns. Sinfiotli, thou wast a Valcrone in Varinci, cunning as a fox a spreader of lies thou saidst thou no man wouldst ever marry no coarse-lidded warrior save sinfiotli a mischievous crone was thou a giantess a valkyrie insolent monstrous in all-father's hall all the einheriar fought with each other deceitful woman for thy sake nine wolves we begat in sagoons i alone was father of them all goodman father thou wast not of fenris wolves older than all as far as i remember since by Gnipland the Thurs maidens thee emasculated upon Thorsness. Thou wast Sigir's stepson, at home under the benches layest, accustomed to the wolf's howl out in the forest. Calamity of every kind came over thee, when thou didst lacerate thy brother's breast. Notorious thou matched thyself by thy atrocious works. Sinfiotli. Thou wast Granny's bride at Bulver. Hadst a golden bit, ready for the course. Many a time have I ridden thee tired, hungry, and saddled through the fells, thou hag. Goodmund, a graceless lad thou wast thought to be, when Golnir's goats thou didst milk. Another time thou wast a giantess's daughter, a tattered wretch. Wilt thou a longer chat? Sinfiotli, I rather would at Frekestein the ravens cram with thy carcass, than thy dogs lead to their meat, or thy hogs feed. May the fiend deal with thee. Helgi, much more seemly, Sinfiotli, would it be for you both in battle to engage, and the eagles gladden, than with useless words to contend, however princes may foster hate. Not good to me appear Grandmar's sons, yet tis right that princes should speak the truth. They have shown, at Moinsheimar, that they have courage to draw the sword. Rapidly they their horses made to run, Svipud and Svegyud, to Solhamar. Over dewy dales, dark mountain sides, trembled the sea of mist, where the men went. The king they met at the burg's gate, to the prince announced the hostile advent. Without stood Hodbrod, with helmet decked, he the speed noticed of his kinsmen. Why have ye Hniflung such wrathful countenances? Hither to the shore are come rapid keels, towering masts and long yards, shields many and smooth-shaven oars, a king's noble host, joyous Yilfings. Fifteen bands are come to land, but they are out at sea, before Nibelund. Seven thousand blue-black ocean beasts with gold adorned, there is by far their greatest multitude. Now will Helgi not delay the conflict. Hodbrod, let a bridled steed to the chief assembly run, but Sportvitnir, to Sparensheide, Melnir, and Milnir, to Mirkvid. Let no man stay behind of those whose swords can brandish. Summon to you Hogni, and the sons of Hring, Atli, and Yingvi, Alf the old, they will gladly engage in conflict. We will let the Volsungs find resistance. It was a whirlwind when together came the fallow blades at Frekestein, Ever was Helgi Hundingsbani foremost in the host, where men together fought, ardent for battle, disdaining flight, the chieftain had a valiant heart. Then came a maid from the heaven, helmed, from above the clash of arms increased, for the king's protection. Then said Sigrun, well skilled to fly in the host of heroes from Hugin's grove, Unscathed shalt thou, prince, possess thy people, pillar of Yngvi's race, and life and joy. Thou hast laid low the slow of flight, the chief who caused the dread warrior's death. And thee, O king, well beseem both red gold rings and a powerful maid, unscathed shalt thou, prince, both enjoy Hogni's daughter and ring study of victory and lands. Then is conflict ended. End of section twenty one.
Section twenty two The Second Lay of Helgi Hundingside of the Elder Eddas the Same in Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturlson. Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The Second Lay of Helgi Hundingside. King Sigmund, son of Volsung, had to wife Borghild of Breland. They named their son Helgi, after Helgi Hjorvard's son. Helgi was fostered by Hagal. There was a powerful king named Hunding, after whom the land was called Hundland. He was a great warrior, and had many sons, who were engaged in warfare. There was enmity, both opened and concealed, between King Hunding and King Sigmund, and they slew each other's kinsmen. King Sigmund and his kindred were called Volsungs and Yilfings. Helgi went forth and secretly explored the court of King Hunding. Hemming, Hunding's son, was at home. On departing, Helgi met a herdsman and said, Say thou to Hemming, that Helgi bears in mind who the mailed warrior was, whom the men laid low, when the grey wolf he had within, and King Hunding thought it was Hamal. Hamal was the son of Hegel. King Hunding sent men to Hegel in search of Helgi, and Helgi had no other way to save himself than by taking the clothes of a female slave and going to grind. They sought, but did not find him. Then said Blind the Baleful, Sharp are the eyes of Hegel's thrall-wench, Of no churlish race is she who at the mill stands. The millstones are split, the receiver flies asunder. Now a hard fate has befallen the warrior, When a prince must barley grind. Much more fitting to that hand is the falchion's hilt than a mill-handle. Hegel answered and said, No wonder tis that the receiver rattles, When a royal damsel the hand turns. She hovered higher than the clouds, and like the Vikings dared to fight, until Helgi made her captive. She is a sister of Sigar and Hogni, therefore has fierce eyes the Yelfing made. Helgi escaped and went on board a ship of war. He slew King Hunding, and was afterwards named Helgi Hundingsbani, and lay with his force in Brunavagar, and carried on strand hog, and ate raw flesh. There was a king named Hogni, whose daughter was Sigrun. She was a Valkyrie, and rode through the air and over the sea. She was Fava regenerated. Sigrun rode to Helgi and said, What men cause a ship along the coast afloat? Where do ye warriors a home possess? What await ye in Brunavagar? Whither desire ye to explore away? Helgi. Heimel causes a ship along the coast afloat. We have home in Helsi. A fair wind we await in Brunavagar. Eastward we desire to explore away. Sigrun. Where, O oh, prince, hast thou wakened war, or fed the birds of conflict sisters? Why is thy corslet sprinkled with blood? Why beneath the helm eat ye rough flesh? Helgi, it was the Yilfing's son last achievement, if thou desirest to know, west of the ocean, that I took bears in Bragalund, and the eagle's race with our weapon sated. Now, maiden, I have said what the reasons were, why at sea we little cooked meat ate. Sigrun, to a battle thou alludest, before Helgi was King Hunding had been doomed to fall. In conflict ye have engaged, when your kindred ye avenged, and stained with blood the falchion's edge. Helgi, why dost thou suppose, sagacious maiden, that it was they who their kin avenged? Many a warrior's bold sons there are, and hostile to our kindred. Sigrun, I was not far, leader of people, eager at many a chieftain's end, yet crafty I account Sigmund son, when in Valruns the slaughter he announces. A while ago I saw thee commanding the warships when thou hadst station on the bloody prow, and the cold sea waves were playing. Now, prince, thou wilt from me conceal it, but Hogni's daughter recognizes thee. Granmar was the name of a powerful prince who dwelt at Svarenshaug. He had many sons. One was called Hodbrod, the second Gudmund, the third Starkadar. Hodbrod was at the assembly of kings, and there betrothed to himself to Sigrun, the daughter of Hogni. But when she was informed of it, she rode with the Valkyrie through the air and over the sea in the quest of Helgi. Helgi was at the time at Lagafjöl, warring against the sons of Hunding, where he slew Alf and Eolf, Hjarvard and Hervard. Being over-fatigued with the conflict, he was sitting under the Aristine, where Sigrun found him, and running to him, threw her arms around his neck, and, kissing him, told him her errand, so as it related in the first Volsung Kvida. Sigrun sought the joyous prince. Helgi's hand she forthwith grasped, kissed, and addressed the helm-decked king. Then was the chieftain's mind the lady turned. She declared that she had loved with her whole heart Sigmund's son, before she had seen him. 
to Hodbrod I was in the assembly betrothed, but I another prince would have. Yet, chieftain, I foresee my kindred's wrath. I have my father's promise broken. Hogni's daughter spoke not at variance with her heart. She said that Helgi's affection she must possess. Cow thou not for Hogni's wrath, nor for the evil mind of thy kin. Thou shalt, young maiden, live with me. Of a good race thou art, as I perceive. Helgi then collected a large fleet and proceeded to Frakestein, and at sea experienced a perilous storm. Lightnings came over them, and the flashes entered the ships. They saw that nine Valkyrie were riding in the air, and recognized Sigrun among them. The storm then abated, and they reached land in safety. The sons of Granmar were sitting on a hill as the ships were sailing towards the land. Gudmund leapt on a horse and rode to explore on the hill by the haven. The Volsungs then lowered their sails, and Gudmund spoke as is before written in the Helga Vida. Who is the leader that commands the fleet, and an appalling house leads to our land? This said Gudmund, Granmar's son. Who is the warrior that commands the ships, and lets his golden banner weigh o'er his prow? No peace seems to me in that ship's front. It casts a warlike glow round the Vikings. Sinfjordli, Sigmund's son, answered, Here may Hodbrod Helgi learn to know the heart of flight in the fleet's midst. He the possession holds of thy race, he the fish's heritage has to him subjected. Gudmund, therefore ought we first at Frakestein to settle together and decide our quarrels. Hodbrod, tis time vengeance to take if an inferior lot we long have borne. Sinfjotli, rather shalt thou, Gudmund, ten goats and steep mountain tops shall climb. Have in thy hand a hazel staff that will better please thee than judgments of the sword. Gudmund rode home with intelligence of the hostile armament whereupon the sons of Granmar collected a host, and many kings came thither. Among them were Hogni, the father of Sigrun, with his sons Bragi and Dag. There was a great battle, and all the sons of Hogni and all their chiefs were slain, except Dag, who obtained peace and swore oaths to the Volsungs. Sigrun, going among the slain, found Hodbrod at the point of death. She said, Not will Sigrun a Sefafiol, King Hodbrod, sink in thy arms, thy life is departed, off the axe's blade the head approaches of Granmar's sons. She then met Helgi, and was overjoyed. He said, Not to thee, all-wise maiden, are all things granted, though I say and somewhat are the Norns to blame. This morn have fallen at Frakestein, Bragi, and Hogni, I was their slayer. But at Stierkleifar, King Starkader, and at Leibjorg, the son of Hrolog, that prince I saw of almost fierce, whose trunk yet fought when the head was far. On the earth lie the greater number of thy kinsmen, to corpses turned. Thou hast not fought the battle, yet t'was decreed that thou, potent maiden, shouldst cause the strife. Sigrun then wept. Helgi said, Sigrun, console thyself. A hill thou hast been to us. Kings cannot conquer fate. Gladly would I have them living who are departed, if I might clasp thee to my breast. Helgi obtained Sigrun, and they had sons. Helgi lived not to be old. Dag, the son of Hogni, sacrificed to Odin for vengeance for his father. Odin lent Dag his spear. Dag met with his relation Helgi in a place called Fjotterland, and pierced him through with his spear. Helgi fell there, but Dag rode to the mountains and told Sigrun what had taken place. Loth am I, sister, sad news to tell thee, for unwillingly I have my sister caused to weep. This morning fell in Fjotterland the prince who was on earth the best, and on the necks of warriors stood. Sigrun, these shall the oaths all gnaw, which to Helgi thou didst swear, in the limpid lapter's water, and at the cold drink wave washed rock. May the ship not move forward which under thee should move, although the wished for wind behind thee blow. May the horse not run which under thee should run, although from enemies thou hast to flee. May the sword not bite which thou drawst, unless it sing round thy own head. Then would Helgi's death be on thee avenged, if a wolf thou wert out in the woods of all good bereft and every joy have no sustenance unless on corpses thou shouldst spring dog sister thou ravest and hast lost thy wits when on thy brother thou callest down such miseries odin alone is a cause of all evil for between relatives he brought the runes of strife thy brother offers thee rings of red gold all vindisve and vigdalir have half the land thy grief to compensate woman ring adorned thou and thy sons Sigrun, so happily I shall not sit at Sefafiel, neither at morn nor night as to feel joy in life, if o'er the people plays not the prince's beam of light. If his war steed runs not under the chieftain hither, to the gold bit of custom, if in the king I cannot rejoice. So had Helgi struck with fear all his foes and their kindred, 
as before the wolf the goat run frantic from the fell of terror full so himself helgi among warriors bore as the towering ashes among thorns or as the fawn moistened with dew that more proudly stalks than all the other beasts and its horns glisten against the sky a mound was raised for helgi but when he came to valhall odin offered him the rule over all jointly with himself helgi said thou hunding shalt for every man a footbath get and fire kindle shalt bind the dogs to the horses look to the swine give wash ere to sleep thou goest a female slave passing at evening by helgi's mound saw him riding towards it with many men is it a delusion which methinks i see or the power's dissolution that ye dead men ride and your horses with spurs urge on or to warriors is a home journey granted helgi tis no delusion which thou thinkst to see nor of mankind the end although thou seest us although our horses we with spurs urge on nor to warriors is a home journey granted the slave went home and said to sigrun sigrun go forth from sefafiol if the people's chief thou desirest to meet the mound is opened helgi is come his wounds still bleed the prince prayed thee that thou wouldst still the trickling blood sigrun entered the mound to helgi and said now am i as glad at our meeting as the voracious hawks of odin when they a slaughter know of warm prey or dewy feathered see the peep of day i will kiss my lifeless king ere thou thy bloody corslet layest aside thy hair is helgi tumid with sweat of death my prince is all bathed in slaughtered dew cold clammy are the hands of hogni's son how shall i prince for this make thee amends helgi thou art alone the cause sigrun of sefafiel that helgi is with sorrows due suffused thou weepest gold adorned cruel tear son bright daughter of the south ere to sleep thou goest each one falls bloody on the prince's breast wet cold and piercing with sorrow big we shall surely drink delicious dress though we have lost life and lands no one shall a song of mourning sing though on my breast he wounds behold now are women in the mound enclosed daughters of kings with us the dead sigrun prepares the bed in the mound here helgi have i for thee a peaceful couch prepared for the yelping son on thy breast i will chieftain repose as in my hero's lifetime i was wont helgi nothing i now declare unlooked for at sefafiol late or early since in a corpse's arms thou sleepest Hogni's fair daughter, and a mound, and thou art living, daughter of kings. Time tis for me to ride on the reddening ways. Let the pale horse tread the aerial path. I towards the rest must go, Vindhjalm's bridge, ere Salgofnir awakens heroes. Helgi and his attendants rode their way, but Sigrun and hers proceeded to their habitation. The following evening Sigrun ordered her serving-maid to hold watch at the mound. But at nightfall, when Sigrun came thither, she said, now would he come if he to come intended sigmund's son from odin's halls i think the hope lessens of the king's coming since on the ashes boughs the eagle sit and all the folk to the dream's tryst are hastening serving maid be not so rash alone to go daughter of heroes to the house of draugs more powerful are in the night season all dead warriors than in the light of day sigrun's life was shortened by grief and mourning it was a belief in ancient times that men were regenerated but that is now regarded as an old crone's fancy helgi and sigrun are said to have had been regenerated he was then called helgi hadden skiadi and she kara halfdan's daughter as it is said in the songs of kara and she was also a valkyrie footnote the superstition commemorated in this strophe is no doubt the origin of some very beautiful ballads in the later literature of scandinavia and germany referring to this superstition when thou my dear art cheerful and easy in thy mind the coffin where i slumber is all with roses lined but oft as thou art in sorrow and bowed with grief so sore and all the while my coffin brim full of blood and gore end of section twenty two section twenty three sinfjordli's end how the elder Eddas the same in Sigfusen, and the younger Eddas the Snorri Sturlson, edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. Sin Fiotli's End. Sigmund, Fulsung's son, was a king in Frankland. 
Sinfiotli was the eldest of his sons, the second was Helgi, the third Hamund. Borghild, Sigmund's wife, had a brother named Gunnar. But Sinfiotli, her stepson, and Gunnar both courted one woman, on which account Sinfiotli slew Gunnar. When he came home, Borghild bade him go away, but Sigmund offered the blood fine, which it was incumbent on her to accept. At the funeral feast, Borghild presented the beer. She took a large horn full of poison and offered it to Sinfiotli, who, when he looked into the horn and saw that there was poison in it, said to Sigmund, The drink ferments. Sigmund took the horn and drank up the contents. It is said that Sigmund was so strong that no poison could hurt him, either outwardly or inwardly, but that all his sons could endure poison outwardly. Borghild bore another horn to Sinfiotli and prayed him to drink, when all took place as before. Yet a third time she offered him the horn, using reproachful words on his refusing to drink. He said as before to Sigmund, but the latter answered, Let it pass through thy lips, my son. Sinfiotli drank and instantly died. Sigmund bore him a long way in his arms, and came to a long and narrow firth, where there was a little vessel and one man in it. He offered Sigmund to convey him over the firth, but when Sigmund had borne that corpse into the vessel, the boat was full laden. The man then said that Sigmund should go before through the firth. He then pushed off his boat and instantly departed. King Sigmund sojourned long in Denmark, in Borghild's kingdom, after having espoused her. He then went south to Frankland, to the kingdom he there possessed. There he married Hiordis, the daughter of Eileni. Sigurd was their son. King Sigmund fell in battle with the sons of Hunding. Hiordis was afterwards married to Alf, son of King Hjelthrek with whom Sigurd grew up in childhood. Sigmund and his sons exceeded all other men in strength and stature, and courage and all accomplishments, though Sigurd was foremost of all. And in old traditions he is mentioned as excelling all men, and as the most renowned of warlike kings. The story of Siegfried and Bernhild constitutes the greatest epic in Teutonic Gothic literature. Its origin is hard to trace, but parts of the legends carry the investigator back to Iranian sources. Its greatest development, however, may be justly credited to Icelandic sagas, in which the mythology of the Norse people has a prominent place. In both the Gothic and Teutonic versions, while considerable variation of incident is noticeable, the awakening of Brynhild, a Valkyrie maiden and daughter of Wotan, is represented as having been accomplished by Siegfried who rides through a wall of flames which surrounds her, and thus breaks the spell which binds her to sleep until a warrior, fearless enough to brave fire, shall come to claim her for a bride. End of section 23section 24, The First Lay of Sigurd Fafnicide, or Gripir's Prophecy, of the elder Edda's Asam and Sigfusen, and the younger Edda's Asnori Sturlsen, Edited by Rasmus B. Anderson. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Becky Cook. The First Lay of Sigurd Fathnicide, or Gripir's Prophecy. Gripir was the name of the son of Eileni, the brother of Hiordis. He ruled over lands and was of all men wisest and prescient of the future. Sigurd rode alone and came to Gripir's dwelling. Sigurd was of a distinguished figure. He found a man to address outside the hall, whose name was Geitir. Sigurd applied to him and asked, Who here inhabits in these towers? What nation's king do people name him? Geitir. Gripir is named the chief of men, he who rules a firm realm and people. Sigurd. Is the wise king of the land at home? Will the chief with me come and converse? With him needs speech an unknown man. I desire speedily Gripir to see. Geitir. The glad king of Gaetir asked, Who the man is that demands speech of Gripir? Sigurd. Sigurd I am named, born of Sigmund, and Hiordis is the chieftain's mother. Then went Gaetir, Gripir to inform. Here is a man without, a stranger come, of aspect he is most distinguished. He desires king with thee to speak. Goes from the hall the lord of men, and the stranger prince kindly greets. Welcome, Sigurd. Better had it been earlier, but do thou, Gaetir, take charge of Grani. They began to talk, and much to tell, when the sagacious men together met. Tell me, if thou knowest, my mother's brother, how will Sigurd's life fall out? Gripir, Thou wilt foremost be of men beneath the sun, exalted high above every king, liberal of gold, 
but of flights bearing, of aspect comely, and wise of words. Sigurd, say thou, sage king, more than I ask, thou wise one, to Sigurd, if thou thinkst to see it, what will first happen for my advancement, when from thy dwelling I shall have departed? Gripir, first wilt thou, prince, avenge thy father, and for the wrongs of Eilimi wilt retaliate. Thou wilt the cruel sons of Hudding boldly lay low, thou wilt have victory. Sigurd, say, noble king, kinsman mine, with all forethought as we hold friendly converse, seest thou of Sigurd those bold achievements that will highest soar under heaven's regions? Gripir, thou alone wilt slay that glistening serpent which greedy lies in need to hide. Thou shalt of both the slayer be Regan and Fafnir. Gripir tells truly. Sigurd, riches will abound if I so bring conflict to my men, as thou for certain sayest. Apply thy mind, and at length say what will yet my life befall. Gripir, thou wilt find Fafnir's lair, and thence wilt take splendid riches, with gold wilt load Grani's back. Thou wilt to Giuki ride, the war-famed prince. Sigurd, yet must thou, prince, in friendly speech foresighted king, more relate. I shall be in Giuki's guest, and I shall thence depart. What next will my life befall? Gripir, a king's daughter will on a mountain sleep fair and corslet case after helgi's death thou wilt strike with a keen sword wilt the corslet sever with fafnir's bane sigurd the corslet is ripped open the maid begins to speak when awakened from her sleep on what will she chiefly with sigurd converse hold which to the prince's benefit may tend Gripir, she to thee powerful one runes will teach all those which men ought to know and in every man's tongue to speak and medicines for healing May good await thee, king. Sigurd. Now that is past, the knowledge is acquired, and I am ready thence away to ride. Apply thy mind, and at length say what more will my life befall. Gripir. Thou wilt find Hymir's dwellings, and the glad guest wilt be of that great king. Vanished is Sigurd, that which I foresaw. No further mayest thou, Gripir, question. Sigurd. Now bring me grief the words thou speakest. For thou foreseest, king, much further, thou knowest of too great calamity to Sigurd. Therefore, thou, Gripir, wilt not utter it. Gripir, of thy life the early portion lay before me clearest to contemplate. I am not truly accounted sage, nor of the future prescient. That which I knew is gone. Sigurd, no man I know on the earth's surface, who greater prescience has than thou, Gripir. Thou mayest not conceal it, unhappy though it be, or if ill betide my life. Gripir, not with vices will thy life be sullied, let that noble prince in thy mind be born, for while mankind exists, thy name director of the spear storm will be supreme. Sigurd, the worst seems to me that Sigurd is compelled from the king to part in such uncertainty. Show me the way, all is decreed before, great chieftain, if thou wilt my mother's brother. Gripir, to Sigurd I will now openly tell, since the chieftain me thereto compels. Thou wilt surely find that I not lie. A certain day is for thy death decreed. Sigurd, I would not importune the mighty prince, but rather Gripir's good counsel have. Now I fain would know, though grateful it may not be, what prospect. Sigurd has lying before him. Gripir, there is with Hymir a maiden fair of form. She is by men Brynhild named, daughter of Budli, but the dear king Hymir nurtures the hard-souled damsel. Sigurd, what is it to me, although the maiden be of aspect fair, nurtured with Hymir, that thou, Gripir, must fully declare, for thou foreseest my whole destiny? Gripir, she will thee bereave of almost every joy, the fair-faced foster-child of Hymir. Thou wilt not sleep, nor affairs to course, nor men regard, only this maiden thou wilt see. Sigurd, what remedy for Sigurd will be applied? Tell me that, Gripir, if it seem good to thee. Shall I obtain the damsel? With dowry purchase the lovely royal daughter? Gripir, ye will each swear unnumbered oaths, solemnly binding, but few will keep. Hast thou been Giuki's guest one night, thou wilt have forgotten the fair ward of Hymir. Sigurd, how was that, Gripir? Explain it to me. Seest thou such fickleness in the king's mind, that with that maiden I shall be in engagement broken? Whom with my whole heart I thought to love? Gripir, prince, Thou wilt be snared in another's wiles, thou wilt pay the penalty of Grimhild's craft. The bright-haired maiden, her daughter, she to thee will offer, this snare for the king she lays. Sigurd, 
Shall I then with Gunnar form relationship, and with Gudrun join in wedlock? Well, why then the king would be, if the pangs of perjury cause me no pain? Gripir, Thee will Grimhild wholly beguile, she will employ thee, Brynhild, to demand for the hand of Gunnar, king of Goths, the journey thou wilt forthwith promise to the king's mother. Sigurd, Evils are at hand, I can that perceive. Sigurd's wits will have wholly perished if I shall demand for another's hand a noble maiden whom I will love. Krapir, all of you will swear mutual oaths, Gunnar and Hogni, and thou the third, and ye who forms exchange, when on the way ye are, Gunnar and thou, Krapir lies not. Sigurd, to what end is that? Why shall we exchange forms and manners when on the way we are? Another fraud will surely follow this altogether horrible. But say on, Krapir. Grupir, that will have Gunnar's semblance and his manners, thy own eloquence, and great sagacity. There thou wilt betroth the high-minded ward of Hymir, no one can that prevent. Sigurd, to me that seems worse that among men I shall be all false traitor called, if such take place. I would not deception practice on a royal maid, most excellent I know. Grupir, thou wilt repose, leader of hosts, pure with the maiden, as she thy mother were, therefore exalted lord of men while the world endures thy name will be the nuptials will of both be solemnized of sigurd and of gunnar in giuki's halls then will ye forms exchange when ye home return yet to himself will have each his own senses sigurd will then gunnar chief among men the noble woman wed tell me that Grapir, although three nights by me the chieftain's bride glad of heart has slept the like has no example how for happiness shall hereafter be this affinity tell me that Grapir. Will the alliance for Gunnar's solace henceforth prove, or even for mine? Grippir, thou wilt the oaths remember, and must silence keep, and let Gudrun enjoy a happy union. Brynhild Nathless will herself think an ill-married woman. She will whiles devise to avenge herself. Sigurd, what atonement will that woman take for the frauds we have practiced on her? For me the maiden has sworn oaths, but never kept, and but little joy. Grippir, she to Gunnar will plainly declare that thou didst not well the oaths observe, when the noble king, Giuki's hair, with his whole soul, in thee confided. Sigurd, what will then follow? Let me know that. Will that tale appear as true, or that the noble woman falsely accuses me, and herself also? Tell me that, Grippir. Grippir, from spite towards thee and from overwhelming grief the powerful dame will not most wisely act. To the noble woman do thou no further harm though thou the royal bride with guiles hast circumvented. Sigurd, will the prudent Gunnar, Guthorm, and Hogni at her instigation then proceed? Will Giuki's sons on the relative rend their swords? Tell me further, Grippir. Grippir, then will Gudrun be furious at heart, when her brother shall on thy death resolve, and nothing then will that wise woman take delight, such is Grimhild's work. In this thou shalt find comfort, leader of hosts, this fortune is allotted to the hero's life, a more renowned man on earth shall never be under the sun's abode than thou wilt be accounted sigurd now part we now farewell fate may not be withstood now hast thou Grippir, done as i prayed thee thou wouldst have the fain a happier end foretold me of my life's days hadst thou been able end of section twenty four Section 25 of the Elder Eddas of Simon Zygfussen and the Younger Eddas of Snor Sturlson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Simon Zygfussen and the Younger Eddas of Snor Sturlson by Simon Zygfussen. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. The Second Lay of Sigurd Fafnicide. Sigurd went to Hjalprek's stud, and chose himself a horse, which was afterwards named Grani. Regin, Reidmar's son, was then come to Hjalprek. He was the most skilful of men, and a dwarf in stature. He was wise, cruel, and versed in magic. Regin undertook the rearing and instruction of Sigurd, and bore him great affection. He informed Sigurd of his parentage, and how it befell that Odin and Honir and Loki came to Enverforce, the waterfall of Envari. In the fall there was an abundance of fish. There was a dwarf named Envari, who had long lived in the fall, 
in the likeness of a pike, and in which he supplied himself with food. Our brother, continued Regin, was named Oter, who often went into the fall in the likeness of an otter. He had caught a salmon, and was sitting on the bank of the river with his eyes shut, eating it, when Loki killed him with a stone. The Aesir thought themselves very lucky, and stripped off the otter's skin. The same evening they sought entertainment with Reidmar, and showed their prize. Thereupon we laid hands on them, and imposed on them, as the redemption of their lives, that they should fill the otter's skin with gold, and cover it over with red gold. They thereupon sent Loki to procure gold. He went to run, and obtain her net, and thence proceeded to Enverforce, and cast the net before a pike, which leapt into the net. Whereupon Loki said, What fish is this, that in the river swims, and cannot from harm itself protect? Redeem thy life from hell, and find me the water's flame. The pike. Envari I am named, Oin was my father named, many a cataract have I passed. A luckless Norn in times of old decreed that in the water I should wade. Loki. Tell me, Andvaril, if thou wilt enjoy life in the halls of men, what retribution gets the sons of mortals, if with foul words they assail each other? Envari. Cruel retribution get the sons of mortals, who in Vadgalmir wade. For the false words they have against others uttered, the punishments too long endure. Loki viewed all the gold that Envari owned, but when he had produced the gold, he retained a single ring, which Loki also took from him. The dwarf went into his stone and said, That gold which the dwarf possessed shall to two brothers be cause of death, and to eight princes of dissension. From my wealth no one shall good derive. The Aesir produced the gold to Reidmar, and with it crammed the other skin full and set it up on the feet. They then had to heap up the gold and cover it, but when that was done, Hreidmar, stepping forward, observed a whisker, and required it to be covered. Whereupon Odin drew forth the ring, and Vernot, and covered the hair. Loki said, There is gold for thee, and thou hast a great redemption for my life. For thy son no blessing is decreed, of both it shall prove the bane. Reidmar. Gifts thou hast given, friendly gifts thou hast given not. With a kind heart thou hast not given. Of our lives ye should have been deprived, had I foreknown that peril. But that is worse, what I seem to know. A strife of kinsmen for a woman. Princes yet unborn, I think them to be, for whose hate that gold is destined. The red gold, I trust, I shall possess, while I am living. Of thy threats I entertain no fear, so take yourselves hence home. Fafnir and Regin demanded of Reidmar their share of the blood fine for their slain brother, Oter, which he refused, and Fafnir stabbed his father with a sword while sleeping. Reidmar called out to his daughters, Lynghide and Lofenhide, know my life is departing. To many things need compels. Lynghide. Few sisters will although they lose a father, avenge a brother's crime. Reidmar. Then bring forth a daughter, wolf-hearted fury. If by a chief thou have not a son, get for the maid a spouse in thy great need, then will her son thy wrong avenge. Reidmar then died, and Fafnir took all the gold. Regin then requested to have his share of the patrimony, but met with a refusal from Fafnir. Regin thereupon sought counsel of his sister, Lynghide, how he might obtain his patrimony. She said, Thou of thy brother shalt mildly demand thy patrimony, and a better spirit. It is not seemly that with the sword thou shouldst demand thy property of Fafnir. The foregoing is what Regin related to Sigurd. One day, when he came to Regin's dwelling, he was kindly received, and Regin said, Hither is come the son of Sigmund to our hall, that man of energy. Courage he has greater than I aged men. Now of a conflict have I hope from the fierce wolf. I will nurture the bold-hearted prince. Now envy's kinsman is to us come. 
he will be a king under the sun most powerful. Over all lands will his destinies resound. Sigurd was thenceforward constantly with Regin, who related to him how Fafnir lay on Nittahide in the likeness of a serpent. He had an aegis helm, at which all living beings were terror-stricken. Regin forged a sword for Sigurd, that was named Grem, and was so sharp that immersing it in the Rhine, he let a piece of wool down the stream, when it clove the fleece asunder as water. With that sword, Sigurd clove in two Regin's anvil. After that, Regin instigated Sigurd to slay Fafnir. He said, Loud will laugh hunting sons, they who ailing me of life deprived, if the prince is more desirous to seek red rings than to avenge his father. King Helprek collected a fleet to enable Sigurd to avenge his father. They encountered a great storm, and were driven past a certain promontory. A man was standing on the cliff, who said, Who ride yonder on Revel's horses, the towering billows, the roaring main? The sail-steeds are with sweat bedewed. The wave-coursers will not the wind withstand. Regin, Here am I and Sigurd in sea-trees. A fair wind is given us for death itself. Higher than our prows the steep waves dash. The rolling horses plunge. Who is it that inquires? Hnikar. They called me Hnikar when I, Hugin gladdened, young Volsung, and battles fought. Now they mayst call me the Ancient of the Rock, Feng, or Fjolnir. I desire a passage. They turn to the land. The old man goes on board, and the storm abates. Sigurd said, Tell me, Nikar, since thou knowest the omens, both of gods and men, which omens are the best, if to fight is needful, at the swing of glaives? Nikar, Good omens there are many, if men but knew them. At the swing of glaives, a faithful fellowship, I think, is the dark ravens with the sworded warrior. The second is, if, when thou art gone out and about to depart, thou seest two renowned seeking men standing in the forecourt. The third omen is, if wolves thou hearest howl under the ash boughs, it will victory to thee announce over helmed warriors. If thou seest them, go before thee. No man should fight against the moon's late shining sister. They have victory, who can see keenly at the play of swords, or to form the wedge array. Most perilous it is, if with thy foot thou strikest, when thou to battle goest. Wily dizzers stand on either side of thee, and wish to see thee wounded. Calmed and washed let every brave man be, and at morning fed, for tis uncertain whither he at eve may come. Tis bad to succumb to fate. Sigurd fought a great battle with Lingvi, Hunding's son, and his brothers, in which Lingvi and his three brothers fell. After the battle, Regin said, Now is the bloody eagle, with the trenchant blade, graven on the back of Sigmund's lair. No son of king who the earth reddens and the raven gladdens is more excellent. Sigurd returned home to Hjalprek, when Regin instigated him to slay Fafnir. End of section 25section twenty six of the elder eddas of Siemens Sigfusson and the younger eddas of Snorre Sturlson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The elder eddas of Siemens Sigfusson and the younger eddas of Snorre Sturlson by Siemens Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. The Lay of Fafnir. Sigurd and Regin went up to Nittahide, and there found Fafnir's slot, or track, along which he crawled to the water. There, on the way, Sigurd made a large pit, and went down into it. When Fafnir crawled from the gold, he blew forth venom, but it flew over Sigurd's head. When Fafnir crept over the pit, Sigurd, with his sword, pierced him to the heart. Fafnir shook himself, and beat with his head and tail. Sigurd leapt from the pit, and each looked at the other. Fafnir said, Young fellow, young fellow, by what fellow art thou begot? Of what people art thou the son? 
that thou in Fafnir reddenst thy glittering falcon. Thy sword has pierced my heart. Sigurd concealed his name, because it was the belief in those times that the words of dying persons were of great power, if they cursed an enemy by his name. Sigurd. Gothwick, dear, I am called, but I have wandered a motherless child, nor have I a father like the sons of men. Alone I wander. Fafnir. If thou hast no father like the sons of men, by what wonder art thou begotten? Sigurd. My race, I tell thee, is to thee unknown, and myself also. Zygmunt was my father named, my name is Sigurd, who with weapon have assailed thee. Fafnir. Who has incited thee? Why hast thou suffered thyself to be incited to take my life? Youth of the sparkling eyes, thou hadst the cruel father. Sigurd. My heart incited me, my hands gave me aid, and my keen sword. Rarely a man is bold, when of mature age, if in childhood he was faint-hearted. Fafnir. I know if thou hadst chanced to grow in the lap of friends, they would have seen thee fierce in fight. Now thou art a captive, taken in war, and, tis said, slaves ever tremble. Sigurd. Why, Fafnir, dost thou upbraid me that I am far from my paternal home? I am not a captive, although in war I was taken. Thou hast found that I am free. Fafnir. Thou wilt account only as angry words, all I to thee shall say, but I will say the truth. The jingling gold and the gleed red treasure, those rings shall be thy bane. Sigurd. Treasure at command every one desires, ever till that one day, for at some time each mortal shall hence to hell depart. Fafnir. The Norns decree thou wilt hold in contempt, as from a witless wight. In water thou shalt be drowned, if in wind thou rowest. All things bring peril to the fated. Sigurd, tell me, Fafnir, as thou art wise declared, and many things to know, who those Norns are, who help in need, and from babes lose the mothers. Fafnir, very diversely born I take those Norns to be. They have no common race. Some are of Ezi race, some of Alpha race, some are Dvalin's daughters. Sigurd, tell me, Fafnir, as thou art wise declared, and many things to know, how that home is called, where Surt and the Azir will sword liquor together mingle. Fafnir, Oskopnir it is called, there shall the gods with lances play. Bifrost shall be broken, when they go forth, and their steeds in the river swim. And Aegis' helm I bore among the sons of men, while I o'er the treasures lay. Stronger than all I thought myself to be, Stronger I found not many. Sigurd, And Aegis' helm is no protection, Where men impelled by anger fight. Soon he finds, who among many comes, That no one is alone the boldest. Fafnir, Venom I blew forth, When on my father's great heritage I lay. Sigurd, Thou, glistening serpent, Didst a great belching make, And wast so hard of heart, Fierceness so much the greater have the sons of men when they possess that helm. Fafnir. Sigurd, I now counsel thee, do thou take my counsel, and hence ride home. The jingling gold and the gleed red treasure, those rings, shall be thy bane. Sigurd. Counsel regarding thee is taken, and I to the gold will ride on the heath that lies. But lie thou, Fafnir, in the pangs of death, until hell have thee. Fafnir. Regin betrayed me, he will thee betray. He of us both will be the bane. Fafnir must, I trow, let forth his life. Thine was the greater might. Regin had gone away while Sigurd slew Fafnir, but came back as Sigurd was wiping the blood from his sword. He said, Hail to thee now, Sigurd. Now hast thou victory won and Fafnir slain. Of all the men who tread the earth, thou art, I say, the bravest born. Sigurd. Uncertain tis to know when we all come together, sons of victorious heroes, which is the bravest born. Many a one is bold, whose swords has never broken in another's breast. Regin. Glad art thou now, Sigurd, and in thy gain rejoicing, 
or gram in the grass thou driest. My brother, thou to death hast wounded, yet in some degree was I the cause. Sigurd, thou didst me counsel that I should ride o'er high fells hither. Treasure and life had still possessed that glistening serpent, hadst thou my anger not excited. Regin then approached Fafnir, and cut out his heart with a sword named Riddle, and afterwards drank blood from his wound. He said, Sit now, Sigurd, but I must go to sleep, and Fafnir's heart hold to the fire. Of this reflection I would fain partake after that drink of blood. Sigurd, thou wentst far off, while I in Fafnir my keen sword reddened. With my strength I strove against the serpent's might, while in the ling thou layest. Regin, long hadst thou allowed in the ling to lie that Jotun owed, hadst thou the sword not used that I forge for thee, thy keen-edged glaive. Sigurd, valor is better than might of sword, when foes embittered fight, for a brave man I have ever seen gain victory with a dull sword. For the brave tis better than for the timid to join in the game of war, for the joyous it is better than for the sad, let come whatever may. Sigurd took Fafnir's heart and roasted it on a stick. When he thought it roasted enough, and the blood frothed from it, he touched it with his finger, to try whether it were quite done. He burned his finger, and put it in his mouth, and when Fafnir's heart's blood touched his tongue, he understood the language of birds. He heard the eagles chattering among the branches. One eagle said, There sits Sigurd, sprinkled with blood. Fafnir's heart at the fire he roasts. Wise methinks were the ring dispenser if he the glistening life pulp ate. Second Eagle There lies Regin, communing with himself. He will beguile the youth who in him trusts. In rage he brings malicious words together. The framer of evil will avenge his brother. Third Eagle By the head shorter, let him the hoary babbler send hence to hell. Then can he all the gold possess alone, the mass that under Fafnir lay. Fourth Eagle He would, methinks, be prudent, if he could have your friendly counsel, my sisters, if he would bethink himself and Hugin gladden. There I expect the wolf, where his ears I see. Fifth Eagle Not so prudent is that tree of battle, as I, that martial leader, had supposed, if he one brother lets depart, now he the other has of life bereft. Sixth Eagle. He is most simple, if he longer spares that people's past. There lies Regin, who has betrayed him. He cannot guard against it. Seventh Eagle. By the head shorter let him make the ice-cold Jutten, and of his rings deprive him. Then, of that treasure thou, which Fafnir owned, so lord will be. Sigurd. Fate shall not so resistless be, that Regin shall my death word bear, for the brothers both shall speedily go hence to hell. Sigurd cut off the head of Regin, and then ate Fafnir's heart, and drank the blood of both Regin and Fafnir. He then heard the eagle saying, Bind thou, Sigurd, the red gold rings. It is not kingly many things to fear. I a may know by far the fairest, with gold adorned. Couldst thou but her obtain? Second Eagle to Gyuki lead all verdant ways, the fates point out to wayfarers where the good king a born daughter has. Her wilt thou, Sigurd, purchase with bridal gifts. Third Eagle There stands a hall on the high Hinderfjall. Without tis all with fire surrounded. Sagacious men have it constructed on the resplendent radiance of the flood. Fourth Eagle On the fell I know a warrior maid to sleep. Over her waves the linden's bane. Ig, Willem stuck a sleep-thorn in the robe of the maid who would heroes choose. Thou, youth, mayest see the helmed maiden, her whom Ving's corner from battle bore. May not Sigurd Drifa's slumber break the son of warriors against the Norns' decrees. Sigurd rode along Fafnir's track to his lair, which he found open. The doors and doorposts were of iron, of iron also were all the beams in the house, but the treasure was buried in the earth. Sigurd found there a great quantity of gold, and filled two chests with it. 
he took thence the aegis helm a golden corslet the sword named roti and many precious things all which he laid on granny but the horse would not proceed until sigurd had mounted on his back End of section 26《Section 27 of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturluson by Simon Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. The Lay of Sigurdrifa. Sigurd rode up the Hinderfjall, and directed his course southwards towards Frankland. In the fell he saw a great light, as if a fire were burning, which blazed up to the sky. On approaching it there stood a Skjaldborg, and over it a banner. Sigurd went into the Skjaldborg, and saw a warrior laying within it, asleep, completely armed. He first took the helmet off the warrior's head, and saw that it was a woman. Her corslet was as fast as if it had grown to her body. With his sword, Graham, he ripped the corslet from the upper opening downwards, and then through both sleeves. He then took the corslet off from her when she awoke, sat up, and, on seeing Sigurd, said, What has my corslet cut? Why from sleep have I started? Who has cast from me the fellow bands? Sigurd. Sigmund's son has just now ripped the raven's perch with Sigurd's sword. She. Long have I slept, long been with sleep oppressed, long are mortal sufferings. Odin is the cause that I have been unable to cast off torpor. Sigurd sat down and asked her name. She then took a horn filled with mead and gave him the minis cup. She. Hail to day, hail to the sons of day, to night and her daughter, hail. With placid eyes behold us here, and here sitting give us victory. Hail to the Aesir, hail to the Sinir, hail to the bounteous earth. Words and wisdom give to us noble twain and healing hands while we live. She was named Sigurdrifa, and was a Valkyria. She said that two kings had made war on each other, one of whom was named Hjalmgunnar. He was old and a great warrior, and Odin had promised him victory. The other was Agnar, a brother of Hoda, whom no divinity would patronize. Sigurdrifa overcame Helmgunnar in battle, in revenge for which Odin pricked her with a sleepthorn, and declared that henceforth she should never have victory in battle, and should be given in marriage. But I said to him that I had bound myself by a vow not to espouse any man who could be made to fear. Sigurd answers and implores her to teach him wisdom as she had intelligence from all regions. Sigurdrifa Beer I bear to thee, column of battle, with might mingled and with bright glory, tis full of song and salutary saws, of potent incantations and joyous discourses. Sigrunds thou must know, if victory, Sigur, thou wilt have, and on thy sword's hilt grave them, some on the chapes, some on the guard, and twice name the name of Ty. O runes thou must know, if thou wilt not that another's wife thy trust betray, if thou in her confide. On the horn must they be graven, and on the hand's back, and gnawed on the nail be scored. A cup must be blessed, and against peril guarded, and garlic in the liquor cast. Then I know thou wilt never have mead with treachery mingled. Bjarg runes thou must know, if thou wilt help, and lose the child from women. In the palm they must be graven, and round the joints be clasped, and the desert prayed for aid. Brim runes thou must know, if thou wilt have secure afloat thy sailing steeds. On the prow they must be graven, and on the helm blade, and with fire to the oar applied. No surge shall be so towering, nor wave so dark, but from the ocean thou safe shalt come. Limb runes thou must know, if thou a leech wouldst be, and wounds know how to heal. On the bark they must be graven, and on the leaves of trees, of those whose boughs bent eastward. Mal runes thou must know, 
if thou wilt that no one for injury with hate requite thee. Those thou must win, those thou must wrap round, those thou must altogether place in the assembly, where people have into full court to go. Hug runes thou must know, if thou a wiser man will be than every other. Those interpreted, those graved, those devised wrapped, from the fluid which had leaked from high drop near his head, and from hot drop near his horn. On a rock he stood with edged sword, a helm on his head he bore. Then spake Mim's head, its first wise word and true sayings uttered. They are, it said, on the shield graven, which stands before the shining god, on Arvark's ear, and on Oswid's hoof, on the wheel which rolls on the Rognir's car, on Sleipnir's teeth, and on the sledge's bands, on the bear's paw and on Bragi's tongue, on the wolf's claws and the eagle's beak, on bloody wings and on the bridge's end, on the releasing hand and on healing's track, on glass and on gold, on amulets of men, in wine and in wort, and in the welcome seat, on Gungnir's point, and on Grani's breast, on the Norn's nail, and on the owl's neb. All were erased that were inscribed, and mingled with the sacred mead, and sent on distant ways. They are with the Azir, they are with the Alfer, some with the wise Vanir, some human beings have. Those are Bok runes, those are Bjarg runes, and all old runes, and precious Megan runes, for those who can, without confusion or corruption, turn them to his welfare. Use, if thou hast understood them, until the powers perish. Now thou shalt choose, since a choice is offered thee, keen armed warrior, my speech or silence. Think over it in thy mind. All evils have their measure. Sigurd, I will not flee, though thou shouldst know me doomed. I am not born a craven. Thy friendly counsels all I will receive, as long as life is in me. Sigurd Riffa. This I thee counsel first, that towards thy kin thou bear thee blameless. Take not hasty vengeance, although they raise up strife. That, it is said, benefits the dead. This I thee counsel secondly, that no oath thou swear if it be not true. Cruel bonds follow broken faith. Accursed is the faith-breaker. This I thee counsel thirdly, that in the assembly thou contend not with a fool, for an unwise man oft utters words worse than he knows of. All is vain if thou holdest silence. Then wilt thou seem a craven-born, or else truly accused. Doubtful is a servant's testimony, unless a good one thou gettest. On the next day let his life go forth, and so men's lies reward. This I counsel thee fourthly. If a wicked sorceress dwells by the way, to go on is better than there to lodge, though night may overtake thee. Of searching eyes the sons of men have need, when fiercely they have to fight. Oft pernicious women by the wayside sit, whose swords and valor deaden. This I thee counsel fifthly. Although thou see fair women on the benches sitting, let not their kindred silver over thy sleep have power, to kiss thee entice no woman. This I thee counsel sixthly. Although among men pass offensive tipsy talk, never while drunken quarrel with men of war, wine steals the wits of many. Brawls and drink to many men have been a heartfelt sorrow, to some their death, to some calamity. Many are the griefs of men. This I thee counsel seventhly. If thou hast disputes with a daring man, better it is for men to fight than to be burned within their dwelling. This I thee counsel eighthly, that thou guard thee against evil, and eschew deceit. Entice no maiden, nor wife of men, nor to wantonness in sight. This I thee counsel ninthly, that thou corpses bury, wherever on the earth thou findest them, whether from sickness they have died, or from the sea, or are from weapons dead. Let a mound be raised for those departed, that their hands and head be washed, comped, and wiped dry, ere in the coffin they are laid, and pray for their happy sleep. This I thee counsel tenthly, that thou never trust a foe's kinsman's promises, 
whose brother thou hast slain, or sire laid low, there is a wolf in a young son, though he with gold be gladdened. Strifes and fierce enmities think not to be lulled, no more than deadly injury. Wisdom and fame in arms a prince not easily acquires, which shall of men be foremost. This I counsel thee eleventhly, that thou at evil look what course it may take. A long life, it seems to me, the prince may not enjoy. Fierce disputes will arise. Sigurd said, A wiser mortal exists not, and I swear that I will possess thee, for thou art after my heart. She answered, Thee I will have before all others, though I have to choose among all men. And this they confirmed with oaths to each other. End of section 27《Section 28 of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snor Sturdelson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snor Sturdelson by Simon Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Fragments of the Lay of Sigurd and Brynild. Sigurd then rides away from Hindarfjall, and journeys on till he comes to the habitation of Hamir, who was married to Beckhild, Brynhild's sister. Alsvid, Hamir's son, who was at play when Sigurd arrived at the mansion, received him kindly, and requested him to stay with him. Sigurd consented, and remained there a short time. Brynhild was, at that time, with Hamir, and was weaving within a gold border the great exploits of Sigurd. One day, when Sigurd was come from the forest, his hawk flew to the window, at which Brynhild sat, employed on weaving. Sigurd ran after it, saw the lady, and appeared struck with her handiwork and beauty. On the following day, Sigurd went to her apartment, and Alsvid stood outside the door, shafting arrows. Sigurd said, Hail to thee, lady, or how fares it with thee? She answered, We are well, my kindred and friends are living, but it is uncertain what any one's lot may be till their last day. He sat down by her. Brynhild said, The seat will be allowed to few, unless my father comes. Sigurd answered, Now is that come to pass which thou didst promise me. She said, here shalt thou be welcome. She then arose, and her four maidens with her, and, approaching him with a golden cup, bade him drink. He reached towards her, and took hold of her hand together with the cup, and placed her by him, clasped her round the neck, kissed her, and said, A fairer than thou was never born. She said, It is not wise to place faith in women for they so often break their promise. He said, Better days will come upon us, so that we may enjoy happiness. Brynhild said, It is not ordained that we shall live together, for I am a shield maiden. Sigurd said, Then will our happiness be best promoted, if we live together, for harder to endure is the pain which herein lies than from a keen weapon. Brynhild said, I shall be called to the aid of warriors, but thou wilt espouse Gudrun, Yuki's daughter. Sigurd said, No king's daughter shall ensnare me, therefore have not two thoughts on that subject, and I swear by the gods that I will possess thee and no other woman. She answered to the same effect. Sigurd thanked her for what she had said to him, and gave her a gold ring. He remained there a short time in great favor. Sigurd now rode from Hamir's dwelling with much gold until he came to the palace of King Gyuki, whose wife was named Grimhild. They had three sons, Gunnar, Hogni, and Guthorm. Gudrun was the name of their daughter. King Gyuki entreated Sigurd to stay there, and there he remained a while. All appeared low by the side of Sigurd. One evening, 
the sorceress Brimhild rose and presented a horn to Sigurd, saying, Joyful for us is thy presence, and we desire that all good may befall thee. Take this horn and drink. He took it and drank, and with that drink forgot both his love and his vows to Brynhild. After that, Grimhild so fascinated him that he was induced to espouse Gudrun, and all pledged their faith to Sigurd, and confirmed it by oaths. Sigurd gave Gudrun to eat of Fafnir's heart, and she became afterwards far more austere than before. Their son was named Sigmund. Grimhild now counselled her son Gunnar to woo Brynhild, and consulted with Sigurd in consequence of this design. Brynhild had vowed to wed that man only who should ride over the blazing fire that was laid around her hall. They found the hall and the fire burning around it. Gunnar rode Goti and Hogni Holknir. Gunnar turns his horse towards the fire, but it shrinks back. Sigurd said, Why dost thou shrink back, Gunnar? Gunnar answers, My horse will not leap this fire and praised Sigurd to lend him Grani. He is at thy service, said Sigurd. Gunnar now rides again towards the fire, but Grani will not go over. They then changed forms. Sigurd rides, having in his hand the sword Gram, and golden spurs on his heels. Grani runs forward to the fire when he feels the spur. There was now a great noise, and it is said, the fire began to rage and the earth to tremble. High rose the flame to heaven itself. There ventured few chiefs of people through that fire to ride or to leap over. Sigurd, Grani with his word urged. The fire was quenched before the prince. The flame allayed before the glory seeker with the bright saddle that Rock had owned. Brynhild was sitting in a chair as Sigurd entered. She asks who he is and he calls himself Gunnar, Yuki's son. And thou art destined to be my wife with thy father's consent. I have ridden through the flickering flame at thy requisition. She said, I know not well how I shall answer this. Sigurd stood erect on the floor, resting on the hilt of his sword. She rose and embarrassed from her seat, like a swan on the waves, having a sword in her hand, a helmet on her head, and wearing a corslet. Gunner, said she, speak not so to me, unless thou art the foremost of men, and then thou must slay him who has sought me, if thou hast so much thrust in thyself. Sigurd said, Remember now thy promise, that thou wouldst go with that man who should ride through the flickering flame. She acknowledged the truth of his words, stood up, and gave him a glad welcome. He tarried there three nights, and they prepared one bed. He took the sword Graham and laid it between them. She inquired why he did so. He said that it was enjoined him so to act towards his bride on their marriage, or he would receive his death. He then took from her the ring called Enverenot, and gave her another that had belonged to Fafnir. After this he rode away through the same fire, to his companions, when Gunnar and he again changed forms, and they then rode home. Brynhild related this in confidence to her foster father, Hamir, and said, A king named Gunnar has ridden through the flickering flame, and is come to speak with me. But I told him that Sigurd alone might so do, to whom I gave my vow at Hinderfjall, and that he only was the man. Hamir said that what had happened must remain as it was. Brynhild said, Our daughter, Aslaw, thou shalt rear up here with thee. Brynhild then went to her father, King Budli, and he with his daughter Brynhild went to King Yuki's palace. A great feasting was afterwards held, when Sigurd remembered all his oaths to Brynhild, and yet kept silence. Brynhild and Gunnar sat at the drinking and drank wine. One day, Brynhild and Gudrun went to the river Rhine, and Brynhild went farther out into the water. Gudrun asked why she did so. Brynhild answered, 
Why shall I go on along with thee in this more than in anything else? I presume that my father was more potent than thine, and my husband has performed more valorous deeds and ridden through the blazing fire. Thy husband was King Halprex's thrall. Gudrun answered angrily, Thou shouldst be wiser than to venture to vilify my husband, as it is the talk of all that no one like to him in every respect has ever come into the world, nor does it become thee to vilify him, as he was thy former husband, and slew Fafnir, and rode through the fire, whom thou thoughtest was King Gunnar, and he lay with thee, and took from thee the ring and Vernot, and here mayest thou recognize it. Brynhild then, looking at the ring, recognized it, and turned pale as though she were dead. Brynhild was very taciturn that evening, and Gudrun asked Sigurd why Brynhild was so taciturn. He dissuaded her much from making this inquiry, and said that at all events it would soon be known. On the morrow, when sitting in their apartment, Gudrun said, Be cheerful, Brynhild. What is it that prevents thy mirth? Brynhild answered, Malice drives thee to this, for thou hast a cruel heart. Judge not so, said Gudrun. Brynhild continued, Ask about that only which is better for thee to know, that is more befitting women of high degree. It is good, too, for thee to be content, as all goes according to thy wishes. Gudrun said, It is premature to glory in that. This forebodes something. But what instigates thee against us? Brynhild answered, Thou shalt be requited for having espoused Sigurd, for I grudge thee the possession of him. Gudrun said, We knew not of your secret. Brynhild answered, We have had no secret, though we have sworn oaths of fidelity, and thou knowest that I have been deceived, and I will avenge it. Gudrun said, Thou art better married than thou deservest to be, and thy violence must be cold. Content should I be, said Brynhild. Didst thou not possess a more renowned husband than I? Gudrun answered, Thou hast as renowned a husband, for it is doubtful which is the greater king. Brynhild said, Sigurd overcame Fafnir, and that is worth more than all Gunnar's kingdom, as it is said. Sigurd the serpent slew, and that henceforth shall be by none forgotten, while mankind lives, but thy brother neither dared through the fire to ride, nor over it to leap. Gudrun said, Grani would not run through the fire under King Gunnar, but Gunnar dared to ride. Brynhild said, Let us not contend. I bear no good will to Brynhild. Gudrun said, Blame her not, for she is towards thee as to her own daughter. Brynhild said, She is the cause of all the evil which gnaws me. She presented to Sigurd the pernicious drink, so that he no more remembered me. Gudrun said, Many an unjust word thou utterest, and this is a great falsehood. Brynhild said, So enjoy Sigurd as thou hast not deceived me, and may it go with thee as I imagine. Gudrun said, Better shall I enjoy him than thou wilt wish, and no one has said he has had too much good with me at any time. Brynhild said, Thou sayest ill, and wilt repent of it. Let us cease from angry words, and not indulge in useless prattle. Long have I borne in silence the grief that dwells in my breast. I have also felt regard for thy brother, but let us talk of other things. Gudrun said, Your imagination looks far forward. Brynhild then lay in bed, and King Gunnar came to talk with her, and begged her to rise and give vent to her sorrow but she would not listen to him. They then brought Sigurd to visit her, and learn whether her grief might not be alleviated. They called to memory their oaths, and how they had been deceived, and at length Sigurd offered to marry her and put away Gudrun, but she would not hear of it. Sigurd left the apartment, but was so greatly affected by her sorrow that the rings of his corslet burst asunder from his sides, as is said in the Sigurd Arkvida. Out went Sigurd from that interview into the Hall of Kings, writhing with anguish, so that began to start the ardent warrior's iron-woven sark off from his sides. 
Brynhild afterwards instigated Gunnar to murder Sigurd, saying that he had deceived them both and broken his oath. Gunnar consulted with Hogni and revealed to him this conversation. Hogni earnestly strove to dissuade him from such a deed on account of their oaths. Gunnar removed the difficulty, saying, Let us instigate our brother Guthorm. He is young and of little judgment, and is, moreover, free of all oaths, and so avenge the mortal injury of his having seduced Brynhild. They then took a serpent and the flesh of a wolf, and had them cooked, and gave them to him to eat, and offered him gold in a large realm to do the deed, as is said. The forest fish they roasted, and the wolf's carcass took, while some to Guthorm dealt out gold, gave him Gary's flesh with his drink, and many other things steeped therein. With this food he became so furious that he would instantly perpetrate the deed. On this it is related, as in the Sigurd Darkvida, when Gunnar and Brynhild conversed together. End of section 28「Of the Elder Eddas of Siemens Zigfussen and the Younger Eddas of Snor Sturlson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Siemens Zigfussen and the Younger Eddas of Snor Sturlson by Siemens Zigfussen. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. The third lay of Sigurd Fafnaside. It was of old that Sigurd, the young Volsum, Giuki sought, after his conflict, received the pledge of friendship from the two brothers, oaths exchanged the bold of deed. A maid then offered him, and treasures many, Gudrun, Giuki's youthful daughter, drank and conversed many days together, Sigurd the young and Giuki's sons until they went to Wu Brynhild, and with them Sigurd, the youthful Volsung, rode in company, who knew the way. He would have possessed her, if her possess he might. Sigurd the southern laid a naked sword, a glittering falcon, between them. Nor the damsel did he kiss, nor did the Hunnish king to his arm lift her. He, the blooming maid, to Giuki's son delivered. She, to herself, of body was of no sin conscious, nor at her death day of any crime that could be a stain or thought to be intervened therein the grisly fates alone she sat without at eve of day began aloud with herself to speak sigurd must be mine i must die or that blooming youth clasp in my arms of the words i have uttered i now repent he is gudrun's consort and i am gunners the hateful norns long-suffering have decreed us Oftentimes she wondered, filled with evil thoughts, or ice and icebergs, every eve, when he and Gudrun had to their couch withdrawn, and Sigurd her in the coverings wrapped, the Hunnish king his wife caressed. The void I go of spouse and pleasure, I will beguile myself with vengeful thoughts. By those fits of fury she was impelled to murder. Thou, Gunner, shalt wholly lose my land and myself also. Never shall I be happy, king, with thee. I will return thither from whence I came to my near kindred, my relations. There will I remain, and slumber life away, unless thou, Sigurd, cause to be slain, and a king become than the other greater. Let the son go together with the father. The young wolf may not longer be fostered. For whom will vengeance be the easier to appease if the son lives? Wrath was gunner and with grief borne down, and his mind revolved, sat the whole day. He knew not well, nor could devise, what were most desirable for him to do, or were most fitting to be done, when he should find himself of the volsung bereft, and in Sigurd a great loss sustained. Much he thought, and also long, that it did not often happen, that from their royal state women withdrew. Hogni he then to counsel summoned, in whom he placed the fullest trust. Of all to me, Brynhild, Budli's daughter, is the dearest. She is the chief of women. Rather will I my life lay down than that fair one's treasures lose. Wilt thou the prince for his wealth circumvent? 
good tis to command the oar of Ryan, and at ease over riches rule, and in tranquillity happiness and joy. This alone Hogney for answer gave. It beseems us not so to do, by the sword to break sworn oaths, O sworn and plighted faith. We know not on earth men more fortunate, while we four over the people rule, and the Hun lives, that warlike chief, nor on earth a race more excellent, if we five sons long shall foster, and the good progeny can increase. I know full well whence the causes spring. Brynhild's importunity is over great. We will Guthorm, our younger brother, and not overwise for the deed prepare. He is free from sworn oaths, sworn oaths and plighted faith. Easy it was to instigate the ferocious spirit. In the heart of Sigurd stood his sword. On vengeance bent, the warrior in his chamber hurled his brand after the fierce assassin. To Guthorm flew dart-like Graham's gleaming steel from the king's hand. Fell the murderer in two parts. Arms and head flew far away, but his feet sparred fell backwards on the place. Sunk in sleep was Gudrun in her bed, void of cares, by Sigurd's side. But she awoke of joys bereft, when in the blood of Frey's friend she swum. So violently struck she her hands together, that the stout of heart rose in his bed. Weep not, Gudrun, so cruelly, my blooming bride, thy brothers live, and ere I have, alas, too young. He cannot flee from the hostile house. Among themselves they recently have dark and evil counsels devised. Never henceforth, although seven thou bear, will such a son to the trysting with them ride. Full well I know how this has befallen. Brynhild, the sole cause, is of all the evil. Me, the maiden, loved more than any man, but towards Gunnar I sin not. Affinity I held sacred, and sworn oaths. Thenceforward I was called his consort's friend. The woman gave forth sighs, and the king his life. So violently she struck her hands together, that the beakers on the wall responsive rang, and in the court the geese loudly screamed. Laugh then, Brynhild, Budli's daughter, once only from her whole soul, when in her bed she listened to the loud lament of Duki's daughter. Then said Gunnar, the hawk-bearing prince. Laugh not thereat, thou barbarous woman, glad on thy couch as if good awaited thee. Why hast thou lost that beauteous color, authoress of crime, methinks to death thou art doomed? Well dost thou deserve, above all women, that before thy eyes we should lay that before thy eyes we should lay atly low, that thou shouldst see thy brother's blood streaming sore his gory wounds shouldst have to bind. Then said Brynhild, Budli's daughter, No one provokes thee, Gunnar. Complete is thy work of death. Little does Atli thy hatred fear, his life will outlast thine, and his might be ever greater. Gunnar, I will tell thee, though thou well knowest it, how early we resolved on crimes. I was o'er young and unrestrained, with wealth endowed in my brother's house, nor did I desire to marry any man before ye Gukings rode to our dwelling, three on horseback, powerful kings, would that journey had never been. Then myself I promised to the great king, who with gold sat on Grani's back. In eyes he did not you resemble, nor was at all in aspect like. Yet you thought yourselves mighty kings. And to me apart Atli said that he would not have our heritage divided, nor gold, nor lands, unless I let myself be married, nor grant me any part of the acquired gold, which he to me a girl had given to possess, and to me a child in monies counted. Then distracted was my mind thereon, whether I should engage in conflict and death dispense, valiant in arms, for my brother's quarrel, that would then be world-widely known, and to many a one bring heartful anguish. Our reconciliation we let follow. To me it had been more pleasing the treasures to accept the red gold rings of Sigmund's son. Nor did I another's gold desire. Him alone I loved. None other. Menskogol had not a changing mind. 
all this will oddly hereafter find when he shall hear of my funeral rites completed for never shall the heavy-hearted woman with another's husband pass her life then will my wrongs be all avenged up rose gunner prince of warriors and round his concert's neck laid his hands all drew nigh yet each one singly through honest feeling to dissuade her she from her neck those about her cast she let no one stay her from her long journey he then called hogney to consultation i will that all our folk to the hall be summoned thine with mine now tis most needful to see if we can hinder my consort's fatal course till from our speech a hindrance may come then let us leave necessity to rule to him hogney answer gave let no one hinder her from the long journey whence may she never born again return unblessed she came on her mother's lap born in the world for ceaseless misery for many a man's heartfelt sorrow down cast he from the meeting turned to where the lady treasures distributed she was viewing all she owned hungry female thralls and chamber women she put on her golden corslet no good meditated ere herself she pierced with the sword's point on the pillow she turned to the other side and wounded with the glaive on her last counsel's thought now let come those who desire gold and aught less precious to receive from me to every one i give a gilded necklace needlework and coverlets splendid weeds all were silent thought on what to do and all together answer gave too many are there dead we will yet live still be hungry hall servants to do what fitting is at length after reflection the lady linen-clad young in years words in answer uttered i desire that none dead to entreaty should by force for our sake lose their life yet or your bones will burn fewer ornaments many as good meal when you go hence me to seek gunner sit down i will tell to thee that of life now hopeless is thy bright consort thy vessel will not be always afloat though i shall have my life resigned with gudrun thou wilt be reconciled sooner than thou thinkest that wise woman has by the king sad memorials after her consort's death there is born a maid which her mother rears brighter far than the clear day than the sun's beam will svanhill be gudrun thou wilt give to an illustrious one a warrior the bane of many men not to her wish will she be married atli will come her to espouse goodly son my brother much have i in memory how i was treated when you me so cruelly had deceived robbed i was of happiness while my life lasted thou wilt desire odrun to possess but atli will permit it not in secret you will each other meet she will love thee as i had done if us a better fate had been allotted thee will atli barbarously treat in the narrow serpent den will thou be cast it will too come to pass not long after that atli will his soul resign his prosperity and cease to live for gudrun in her vengeance him in his bed will slay through bitterness of spirit with the sword's sharp edge more seemly would appear our sister gudrun had she in death her first consort followed had but good counsel been to her given or she a soul possessed resembling mine faintly i now speak but for our sake she will not lose her life she will be borne on towering billows to king jonaker's paternal soil doubts will be in the resolves of jonaker's sons she will svanhild send from the land her daughter and sigurds her will destroy bicky's council for jormunrek for evil lives then will have passed away all sigurd's race and gudrun's tears will be the more one prayer i have to thee yet to make in this world twill be my last request let in the plain be raised a pile so spacious that for us all like room may be for those who shall have died with sigurd bedeck the pile about with shields and hangings 
a variegated corpse cloth and multitude of slain let them burn the hun on the one side of me let them with the hun burn on the other side my household slaves with collars splendid two at our heads and two hawks then will all be equally distributed let also lie between us both the sword with rings adorned the keen-edged iron so again be placed as when we both one couch ascended and were then called by the name of consorts then will not clang against his heel the hall's bright gates with splendid ring if my train him hence shall follow then will our procession appear not mean for him will follow five female thralls eight male slaves of gentle birth fostered with me and with my patrimony which to his daughter budley gave much i have said and more would i say if the sword would grant me power of speech my voice fails my wounds swell truth only i have uttered so i will cease End of section 29section thirty of the elder eddas of simon sigfusson and the younger eddas of snor sturdison this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the elder eddas of simon sigfusson and the younger eddas of snor sturdison by simon sigfusson translated by rasmus b anderson the fragments of the lay of brunhild gunner why art thou, Brynhild, Budley's daughter, absorbed in evil and murderous thoughts? What injury has Sigurd done thee, that thou, the hero, wilt of life bereave? Brynhild. Sigurd to me oaths has sworn, oaths sworn, all falsehoods. He at a time deceived me, when he should have been of all oaths most observant. Hogni. Thee, Brynhild, has in anger instigated evil to perpetrate, harm to execute. She grudges Gudrun, her happy marriage, and thee, possession of herself. Some a wolf roasted, some a snake cut up, some to Guthorm serve the wolf, before they might, eager for crime, on the mighty men lay their hands. Without stood Gudrun, Yuki's daughter, and these words first of all uttered where is now sigurd lord of warriors seeing that my kinsmen foremost ride hogni alone to her answer gave asunder have we sigurd hewed with our swords his grey steed bends o'er the dead chief then said brynhild budli's daughter well shall ye now enjoy arms and lands sigurd would alone over all have ruled had he a little longer life retained. Unseemly it had been that he should so have ruled over Gyuki's heritage and the Goth's people, when he five sons, for the fall of hosts, eager for warfare, had begotten. Then laughed Brynhild. The whole burg resounded, once only from her whole heart. Well shall ye enjoy lands and subjects, now the daring king ye have caused to fall then said gudrun yuki's daughter much thou speakest things most atrocious may fiends have gunner sigurd's murderer souls malevolent vengeance awaits sigurd had fallen south of rhine loud from a tree a raven screamed with your blood will atli his sword's edges redden the oaths ye have sworn your slaughter shall dissolve evening was advanced much was drunken then did pleasant talk of all kinds pass all sank in sleep when to rest they went gunner alone was wakeful longer than all he began his foot to move and much with himself to speak the warlike chief in his mind pondered what during the conflict the raven and the eagle were ever saying as they rode home Brynhild awoke, Budli's daughter, daughter of Skjoldungs, a little ere day. Urge me or stay me, the mischief is perpetrated. 
my sorrow to pour forth or to suppress it. All were silent at these words. Few understood the lady's conduct, that weeping she should begin to speak of what she laughing had desired. In my dream, Gunner, all seemed so horrid. In the chamber all was dead. My bed was cold, and thou, king, wast riding of joy bereft, with fetters loaded to a hostile host. So we all, race of Niflungs, be of power deprived, perjurers as ye are. Ill, Gunner, didst thou remember, when blood ye in your footsteps both let flow, now hast thou him ill for all that requited, because he would prove himself foremost. Then was it proved, when the hero had ridden to see me, to woo me, how the warlike chief Willem held sacred his oath towards the youthful prince, laid his sword with gold adorned, the illustrious king between us both. Outward its edges were with fire wrought, but with venom drops tempered within. From this lay, in which the death of Sigurd is related, it appears that he was slain without doors, while some relate that he was slain sleeping in his bed. But the Germans say he was slain out in the forest, and it is told in the Gudrun Arkvida Hinforna that Sigurd and the sons of Duki had written to the public assembly, thing, when he was slain. But it is said by all, without exception, that they broke faith with him and attacked him while lying down and unprepared. End of section 30section thirty one of the elder eddas of simon zigfussen and the younger eddas of snor sturdison this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the elder eddas of simon zigfussen and the younger eddas of snor sturdison by simon zigfussen translated by rasmus b anderson the first lay of gudrun Gudrun sat over Sigurd dead. She wept, not as other women, although ready to burst with sorrow. Both men and women came to console her, but that was not easy. It is said by some that Gudrun had eaten of Fafni's heart, and therefore understood the talk of birds. This is also sung of Gudrun. Of old it was that Gudrun prepared to die, when she, sorrowing over Sigurd, sat. No sigh she uttered, nor with her hands beat, nor wailed, as other women. Jarls came forward of great sagacity from her sad state of mind to divert her. Gudrun could not shed a tear, such was her affliction. Ready she was to burst. Sat there noble wives of Jarls, adorned with gold, before Gudrun. Each of them told her sorrows, the bitterest she had known. Then said Gjaflog, Yuki's sister, I know myself to be on earth most joyless. Of five consorts I the loss have suffered, of two daughters, sisters three, and brothers eight. I alone live. Gudrun could not shed a tear. Such was her affliction for her dead consort, and her soul's anguish for the king's fall. Then said Herborg, Hunelund's queen, I a more cruel grief have to recount, my seven sons in the south land, my spouse the eighth, in conflict fell. My father and my mother, my brothers four, on the sea the wind deluded, the waves struck on the ship's timbers. Their last honours twas mine to pay, twas mine to see them tombed, their funeral rites to prepare was mine. All this I underwent in one half year, and to me no one consolation offered. Then I became a captive, taken in war, at the close of the same half year. Then had I to adorn and tie the shoes of the herser's wife, 
each morn. From jealousy she threatened me, and with hard blows drove me. Nowhere master found I a better, but mistress nowhere a worse. Gudrun could not shed a tear. Such was her affliction for her dead consort, and her soul's anguish for the king's fall. Then said Golrond, Yuki's daughter, Little canst thou, my fosterer, wise as thou art, with a young wife fittingly talk. The king's body she forbade to be longer hidden. She snatched the sheet from Sigurd's corpse, and turned his cheek towards his wife's niece. Behold thy loved one, lay thy mouth to his lip, as if thou wouldst embrace the living prince. Gudrun upon him cast one look. She saw the prince's locks dripping with blood, the chief's sparkling eyes closed in death, his kingly breast cleft by the sword. Then sank down Gudrun back on her pillow. Her headgear was loosed, her cheeks grew red, and a flood of tears fell to her knees. Then wept Gudrun, Yuki's daughter, so that the tears spontaneously flowed, and at the same time screamed the geese in the court, the noble birds which the lady owned. Then spake Golrond, Yuki's daughter. Your loves, I know, were the most ardent among living beings upon earth. Thou hadst delight nowhere, sister mine, save with Sigurd. Then said Gudrun, Yuki's daughter, such was my Sigurd among Yuki's sons, as is the garlic out from the grass which grows, or a bright stone on a thread drawn, a precious gem on kings. I also seem to the prince's warriors higher than any of Harion's dizzer. Now I am as little as the leaf oft is in the storm winds, after the chieftain's death. Sitting I miss, and in my bed my dearest friend, Yuki's sons have caused, Yuki's sons have caused my affliction, and their sisters' tears of anguish. So ye desolate the people's land, as ye have kept your sworn oaths. Gunner, thou wilt not the gold enjoy, those rings will be thy bane, for the oaths thou to Sigurd gavest. Oft in the mansion was the greater mirth, when my Sigurd granny saddled, and Brynhild they went to woo, that which accursed in an evil hour. Then said Brynhild, Woodley's daughter, May the hag lack like spouse and children, who thee, Gudrun, has cause to weep, and this morning given thee runes of speech. Then said Gulrund, Yuki's daughter, Cease, thou loathed of all, from those words, the evil destiny of princes thou hast ever been. Thee every billow drives of an evil nature, thou sore affliction of seven kings, the greatest bane of friendship among women. Then said Brynhild, Budli's daughter, Atli, my brother, Budli's offspring, is the sole cause of all the evil, when in the hall of the Hunnish folk with the king we beheld the fire of the serpent's bed. Of that journey I have paid the penalty that sight I have ever rued. She by a column stood, the wood violently clasped. From the eyes of Brynhild, Budli's daughter, fire gleamed forth, venom she snorted when she beheld the wounds of Sigurd. Gudrun then went away to the forest and deserts, and travelled to Denmark, where she stayed seven half-years with Thora, Hakon's daughter. Brynhild would not outlive Sigurd. She caused her eight thralls and five female slaves to be killed, and then slew herself with a sword, as it is related in the Sigurd Arkvida in Schema, the short lay of Sigurd. End of section 31、Section、32 Section This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. 
The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sikvesen and the Younger Eddas of Snorro Sturluson by Shaman Sikvesen. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Brynhild's Hellride. After Brynhild's death, two piles were made, one for Sigurd, who was the first burned. But Brynhild was burned afterwards, and she was in a chariot, which was hung with precious tapestry, so that it was said that Brynhild drove in a chariot on the way to Hell, and passed through a place in which the giantess dwelt. The giantess said, Thou shalt not pass through my stone-supported dwelling-place. Better had it beseemed thee to work broidery than to seek after another's husband. Why dost thou, vagrant woman, from Valand, my dwelling visit? Thou hast, golden dame, if thou desirest to know, gentle one, from thy hands washed human blood. Brynhild, upbraid me not, woman of the rock, although I have in warfare been. Of us, I trow, I shall the better seem, wherever men our conditions know. Giantess, thou, Brynhild, Budli's daughter, wast an evil hour born in the world. Thou hast been the bane of Giuki's children, and their happy house subverted. Brynhild, for my chariot I will truly tell thee, thou witless crone, if thou desirest to know how Giuki's hairs may be both lovelorn and perjured. The bold-hearted king caused the garbs of us eight sisters under an oak to be born. Twelve years old was I, if thou desirest to know, when to the youthful king's oaths I gave. By all in Hlimnadir was I called healed with the helm, by all who knew me. Then caused I next, in the Gothic realm, the old Hjalmgunnar to hell to journey. I gave victory to the youthful brother of Oda, whereat Odin became hostile to me. He with shields encompassed me, red and white, in Skatalund. Their surfaces enclosed me. Him he ordained to sleep my break, who in no place could be made to fear. He made around my hall, towards the south, towering burned the destroyer of all wood. Then bade that man only over it to ride, who me the gold should bring, that under Fafnir lay. On Grani rode the chief, the gold disperser, to where my foster father ruled o'er the dwellings. He alone seemed there to all superior, the Danish warrior of the court. We slept and were content in the same bed, as if he had my born brother been. Neither of us might on the other, for eight nights, lay a hand. Reproached me Gudrun, Giuki's daughter, that I had slept in secret arms. Then I was made aware of what I fain would not, that they had deceived me when a mate I took. To calamities all too lasting, men and women, ever will be while living born. We two shall now, Sigurd and I, pass our life together, Sink thou of a giant kind. End of section thirty two. Section thirty three of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Burke. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Simon Sigfusen. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. The Slaughter of the Niflungs. Gunnar and Hogni then took all the gold, Fafnir's heritage. Dissension prevailed afterwards between the Gukungs and Atli. He charged them with being the cause of Brynhild's death. By way of reconciliation, it was agreed that they should give him Gudrun in marriage, to whom they administered an oblivious potion before she would consent to espouse Atli. Atli had two sons, Erp and Eitil, but Swanhild was the daughter of Sigurd and Gudrun. King Atli invited Gunnar and Hogni to his residence, and sent to them Vingi or Knefrod. Gudrun was aware of treachery, and sent them word in runes not to come, and to Hogni, as a token, she sent the ring Andwaranoit, in which she had tied some wolf's hair. Gunnar had sought the hand of Odrun, Atli's sister, but did not obtain it. He then married Gloimvor, and Hogni took Kostbera to wife. Their sons were Solar, Snaivar, and Gyuki. When the Gyukungs came to Atli, 
Gudrun besought his sons to intercede for their lives, but they would not. The heart of Hogni was cut out, and Gunnar was cast into a pen of serpents. He struck his harp and lulled the serpents, but an adder stung him to the liver. End of section 33《ヘッドシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシャーティングスクリプトシ King Theodric was with Atli, and had there lost the greater number of his men. Theodric and Gudrun mutually bewailed their afflictions. She related to him, and said, A maid above all maids I was, my mother reared me bright in her bower, my brothers I much loved, until me, Gyuki, with gold adorned, with gold adorned, to Sigurd gave. Such was Sigurd above Gyuki's sons, as the green leekes springing from the grass, or the high-limbed heart above the savage beasts, or gleed-red gold above grey silver. Until my brothers the possession grudged me of a consort to all superior. They could not sleep, nor on affairs deliberate, before they Sigurd had caused to die. Granny to the assembly ran, his tramp was to be heard, but Sigurd then himself came not. All the saddle beasts were splashed with blood, and with sweating faint from the murderers. Weeping I went to talk to Granny, with humid cheeks, I prayed the steed to tell. Then Granny shuddered, in the grass bowed down his head. The steed knew that his master was no more. Long I wondered, long was my mind distracted, ere of the people's guardian I inquired for my king. Gunnar hung his head, but Honyi told me of Sigurd's cruel death. Beyond the river slaughtered lies Guttorm's murderer, and to the wolves given. Yonder behold Sigurd, towards the south, where thou wilt hear the ravens croak, the eagles scream, in their feast exulting, the wolves howling round thy consort. Why wilt thou, Honni, to a joyless being such miseries recount? May thy heart by ravens be torn and scattered over the wide world, rather than thou shouldst walk with men. Honni answered, for once cast down, from his cheerful mood by intense trouble, Gudrun, thou wouldst have greater cause to weep if the raven should tear my heart. Alone I turned from that interview to the wolf's scattered leavings. No sigh I uttered, nor with my hands beat, nor wailed as other women, when I heartbroken sat by Sigurd. Night seemed to me of blackest darkness, when I sorrowing sat by Sigurd. Better by far seemed it to me had the wolves taken my life, or I had been burnt as a birchen tree from the fell i journeyed five long days and nights until the lofty hall of hoth i recognized seven half years i with tora stayed hakon's daughter in denmark she for my solace wrought in gold southern halls and danish wands we had in pictures the game of warriors and in handiworks a prince's nobles red shields hunnish heroes a sworded host a helmed host a prince's following Sigmund's ships from the land sailing, with gilded heads and carved prows. We on our canvas wrought how Sigar and Sigir both contended southward in Fian. When Grimhild, the Gothic woman, heard how greatly I was afflicted, she cast aside her needlework, and her sons called often earnestly that she might know who for her son would their sister compensate, or for her consort slain the blood fine pay. Gunnar was ready gold to offer for the injuries to atone, and Honyi also. She then inquired who would go the steeds to saddle, the chariot to drive, on horseback ride, the hawk let fly, arrows shoot from the yew bow. Falder and the Danes with Jaris life, Amod the third with Jariskar, then entered, to princes like. Red mantles had the Langbard's men, corslets ornamented, towering helms, girded they were with falchions brown were their locks for me each one would choose precious gifts precious gifts and to my heart would speak if for my many woes they might gain my confidence and i would in them trust 
Grimhild to me brought a potion to drink, cold and bitter, that I my injuries might forget. It was mingled with earth's power, with cold sea water, and with sun's blood. In that horn were characters of every kind graven and red hued, nor could I comprehend them. The long lingfish of the Hadding's land, an uncut ear of corn, the wild beast's entrance. In that potion were many ills together, a herb from every wood, and the acorn, the firestead's dew, and trails of offerings, swine's liver seethed, for that deadened strife. And then I forgot, when I had taken it, all the king's words in the hall spoken. There to my feet three kings came, before she herself sought to speak with me. Gudrun, I will give thee gold to possess, of all the riches much of thy dead father, rings of red gold, Clotfur's halls, all the hangings left by the fallen king. Hunnish maids, those who weave tapestry, and in bright gold work, so that it may delight thee. Over Budli's wealth thou alone shalt rule, adorned with gold, and given to Atli. I will not have any man, nor Brynhild's brother marry. It beseems me not with Budli's son to increase a race, or life and joy. Take care not to pay the chiefs with hate, for tis we who have been the aggressors, so shouldst thou act as if yet lived Sigurd and Sigmund, if sons thou bearest. Grimhild, I cannot in mirth indulge, nor, for my hero's sake, cherish a hope, since the bloodthirsty wolf and raven have together cruelly drunk my Sigurd's heart's blood. Him, of all, I have found to be a king of noblest race, and in much most excellent. Him shalt thou have until age lays thee low, or mateless be, if him thou wilt not take. Cease to offer that cup of ale so pertinaciously, that race to me. He will Gunnar's destruction perpetrate, and I will cut out Honye's heart. I will not cease until the exulting strife exciter's life I shall have taken. Weeping Grimhild caught the words by which to her sons Gudrun foreboded evil, and to her kindred dire misfortunes. Lands I will also give thee, people and followers, Binbjörg and Valbjörg, if thou wilt accept them, for life possess them, and be happy, daughter. Him, then, I will choose among the kings, and from my relatives reluctantly receive him. Never will he be to me a welcome consort, nor my brother's bail a protection to our sons. Forthwith on horseback was each warrior to be seen, but the Wailish women were in chariots placed. For seven days o'er a cold land we rode, but the second seven we beat the waves, and the third seven we reached dry land. There the gate wards of the lofty burg the latticed entrance opened, ere the court we entered. Atli waked me, but I seemed to be full of evil thoughts for my kinsman's death. So me just now have the Norns waked, a grateful interpretation I fain would have. Methought that thou, Gudrun, Giuki's daughter, with a treacherous sword didst pierce me through. Fire it forebodes when one of iron dreams, arrogance and pleasure, a woman's anger. Against evil I will go burn thee, cure and medicate thee, although to me thou art hateful. Seemed to me here in the garden that young shoots had fallen, which I wished to let grow. Torn up with their roots, reddened with blood, to table they were brought, and offered me to eat. Seemed to me that hawks flew from my hand, lacking their quarry, to the house of woes. Seemed to me I ate their hearts with honey swollen with blood, with sorrowing mind. Seemed to me from my hand whelps I let slip, lacking cause of joy, both of them howled. Seemed to me their bodies became dead carcasses, of the carrion I was compelled to eat. There will be warriors round thy couch converse, and of thy white-locked ones take off the head. Death-doomed they are within a few nights, a little ere day. Thy court will eat of them. Lie down I would not, nor sleep after, obstinate in my fate. That I will execute. End of section 34section thirty five of the elder eddas of shaman sigvison and the younger eddas of snorra stolason this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by phone the elder eddas of shaman sigvison and the younger eddas of snorra stolason by shaman sigvison translated by rasmus b anderson 
the third lay of gudrun atli had a serving woman named herkia who had been his concubine she informed atli that she had seen theodric and gudrun together whereat atli was much afflicted then gudrun said what ails thee ever atli budli's son hast thou sorrow in thy heart why never laughest thou to thy jarls it would seem more desirable that thou with men wouldst talk and on me wouldst look atli it grieves me gudrun giuki's daughter that in my place here herki has said that thou and theodrek have under one covering slept and wantonly been in the linen wrapped gudrun for all this charge i will give my oaths by the white sacred stone that with me and theodrek nothing has passed which to man and wife only belongs save that i embrace the prince of armies the honoured king a single time other were our cogitations when sorrowful we two sat to converse hither came theodrek with thirty warriors now there lives not one of those thirty men surround me with thy brothers and with mailed warriors surround me with all thy noblest kinsmen send to saxi the southman's prince he can hallow the boiling cauldron seven hundred men entered the hall ere in the cauldron the queen dipped her hand now gunnar comes not nor i call hogni i shall not see again my loved brothers with his sword would hogni such wrong avenge now i must myself purify from crime she to the bottom plunged her snow-white hand and up she drew the precious stones see now ye men i am proved guiltless in holy wise boil the vessel as it may laughed then atli's heart within his breast when he unscathed beheld the hand of gudrun now must herkia to the cauldron go she who gudrun had hoped to injure no one has misery seen who saw not that how the hand there of herkia was burnt they then the woman led to a foul slow so were gudrun's wrongs avenged end of section thirty five Section thirty six of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorl Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorl Sturluson by Shaman Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Odrun's Lament. There was a king named Heidrek who had a daughter named Bonnyi. Her lover was named Vilmund. She could not give birth to a child until Odrun, Adli's sister, came. She had been the beloved of Gunnar, Giuki's son. Of this story it is here sung. I have heard tell in ancient stories how a damsel came to the eastern land. No one was able on the face of earth help to afford to Heidrek's daughter. When Odrun, Adli's sister, heard that the damsel had great pains, from the stall she led her well-bridled steed, and on the swart one the saddle laid. She the horse made run on the smooth, dusty way, until she came to where a high hall stood. She the saddle snatched from the hungry steed, and in she went along the court, and these words first of all uttered, What is most noteworthy in this country, or what most desirable in the Hunnish land? Bonny here lies bonny with pains overwhelmed thy friend odrun see if thou canst help her odrun what chieftain has on thee brought this dishonour why so acute are bonny's pains bonny vilmund is named the falcon-bearer's friend he the damsel wrapped in a warm coverlet five whole winters so that from her father she was hidden they i ween spoke not more than this kindly she went to sit at the damsel's knee vehemently sang odrun fervently sang odrun's songs of power over bonny a girl and boy might then tread the mould way gentle babes born of hogni's bane then began to speak the death-sick damsel who before had no word uttered so may thee help the benignant genii freik and freya and other gods besides as thou hast for me peril removed I was not inclined to give thee help, because thou never wast of succour worthy. I vowed, and have performed what I then said, when the princes the heritage divided, that I would ever help afford. Bonny, Mad art thou, Odrun, 
and hast lost thy wits when in hostile spirit most of thy words thou utterest for i have been thy companion upon the earth as if from brothers we both were born Audrin, i remember yet what thou one evening saidst when i for gunnar a competition made such a case saidst thou would not thenceforth happen to any maiden save to me alone then sat down the sorrowing lady to tell her woes from her great grief i was nurtured in the kingly hall i was the joy of many in the council of men life i enjoyed and my father's wealth five winters only while my father lived these last words the noble-hearted king strove to utter ere he departed hence he bade me be endowed with ruddy gold and in the south be given to grimhild's son he said no maiden could more excellent in the world be born if fate willed it not otherwise brynhild in her bower was occupied in broidery she had people and lands around her earth slumbered and the heavens above when fafnir's bane her burg first saw then was conflict waged with the waelish sword and the burg taken which brynhild owned it was not long which was not surprising ere she discovered all those frauds these she caused cruelly to be avenged so that we all have great afflictions known it will be through every land of men that she caused herself to die with sigurd but i for gunnar rings dispenser love conceived such as brynhild should but he brynhild bade a helmet take said she a valkyria should become they forthwith offered ruddy rings to my brother and indemnity not shall he besides offered for me fifteen vills and the load of granny's sides if he would accept them but Adli said he never would a marriage gift receive from Gyuki's son. Still we could not our loves withstand, but I my head must lay upon the ring-breaker. Many things, said my relations, declared they had surprised us both together, but Adli said that I would not crime commit, nor scandal perpetrate. But such should no one for another ever deny, when love has part. Adli sent his emissaries about to Mirkwood, that he might prove me and they came to where they ought not to have come to where we had one couch prepared to the men we offered red gold rings that they it might not to atli tell but they forthwith hastened home and it quickly to atli told but they from gudrun carefully concealed it yet rather by half she should have known it a sound was heard of gold-shot hoofs when into the court rode giuki's heirs of honni they the heart cut out and into a serpent pen the other cast i had gone yet once again to germund to prepare a banquet the brave king began the harp to sound for the prince of noble race hoped that i to his aid might come i it heard from flesi how of trouble there the harp string sang i my thralls bade all be ready i the prince's life would save the vessel we let float past the forest until i saw all atli's courts then came atli's miserable mother crawling forth may she perish she gunner pierced to the heart so that the hero i could not save oftentimes i wonder woman gold adorned how i after can life retain for i seem the formidable sword dispenser as myself to love thou sitst and listenest while i recount to thee many an evil fate my own and theirs each one lives as he best may now is ended audrun's lament end of section thirty six Section thirty seven of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfisson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfisson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Simon Sigfisson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson the lay of atli gudrun giuki's daughter avenged her brothers as is well known she first killed atli's sons and afterwards atli himself and burnt the palace with all the household on these events was this lay composed atli sent riding a messenger to gunnar a crafty man knefrud was his name to giuki's courts he came and to Gunnar's hall, to the seats of state, and the glad potation. 
there drank the courtiers wine in their Valhall, but the guileful ones silence kept, the Huns' wrath they feared. Then said Knefrud, with chilling voice, the southern warrior on a high bench sat. Atli has sent me hither, on his errand riding on a bit-griping steed, through the unknown Mirkwood, to pray you, Gunnar, that to his bench ye come, with helms of state, Atli's home to visit. Shields ye there can choose, and smooth-shaven spears, gold-red helms, and of Huns a multitude, silver gilt saddle-cloths, sarks gory red, the darts obstruction, and bit-griping steeds. The plain he will also give you, the broad gnita hide, whistling javelins and gilded prows, vast treasures, and dunps towns, with that famed forest which men the Mirkwood call. Gunnar his head then turned, and to Hogni said, what counsellest thou, bold warrior, now such like we hear? Of no gold I knew on Gnita's heath, to which we possess not other equal. Seven halls have we filled with swords, of each of which the hilt is gold. My horse I know the best, and my sword the keenest. My bow adorns my seat, my corselets are of gold, my helm and shield the brightest, brought from the hall of Kiar. Mine alone are better than all the Hunnish ones. What thinkest thou the woman means, by sending us a ring in a wolf's clothing wrapped? I think that she caution enjoins. Wolf's hair, I found, twined in the red-gold ring. Wolfish is the way we on our errand ride. No sons persuaded Gunnar, nor other kinsmen, interpreters, nor counsellors, nor those who potent were. Then spake Gunnar, as beseemed a king, great in his mead-hall, from his large soul. Rise up now, Fjornir, let along the benches pass the golden cups of heroes from the attendants' hands. The wolf shall rule the Niflung's heritage, O bearded sages. If Gunnar perish, black-coated bears earth's fruit tear with their teeth to the dog's delight if Gunnar come not back. Honoured men weeping led the land's ruler from the Huns' court. Then said Hogni's youthful heir, Go now, prudent and prosperous, whither your wishes lead. The warriors made their bit-griping steeds over the mountains fly through the unknown Mirkwood. The whole Hunnish forest trembled wherever the warriors rode. Over the shrubless, all-green plains they sped. Atli's land they saw, and the high watchtowers. Biki's people stood on the lofty fortress. The south people's hall was rounded with benches set, with well-bound bucklers and wide shields, the javelin's obstruction. There Atli drank wine in his Valhall. His guards sat without, Gunnar and his men to watch, lest they there should come with yelling dart to excite their prince to conflict. Their sister forthwith saw, when the hall they had entered, her brothers both, beer had she little drunken. Betrayed art thou now, Gunnar, though strong. How wilt thou contend with the Huns' deadly wiles? Go quickly from this hall. Better hadst thou, Gunnar, in corselet come, than with helm of state, to see the home of Atli. Thou in the saddle wouldst have sat whole sun-bright days, and o'er the pallid dead let the Norns weep, the Hunnish shield-maid's misery suffer. But Atli himself thou shouldst into the serpent-pen have cast. But now the serpent-pen is for you two reserved. Sister! Tis now too late the Niflungs to assemble, long it is to seek the aid of men, of valiant heroes, over the rugged fells of Rhine. Then the Burgundians' friends Gunnar seized, in fetters lay, and in fast bound. Hogni hewed down seven with a keen sword, but the eighth he thrust into the raging fire. So should a valiant man defend himself from foes. Hogni had Gunnar's hands protected. 
the bold chief they asked if the goth's lord would with gold his life redeem hogni's heart in my hand shall lie cut bloody from the breast of the valiant chief the king's son with a dull-edged knife they the heart cut out from hjali's breast on a dish bleeding laid it and it to gunnar bare then said gunnar lord of men here have i the heart of the timid hjali unlike the heart of the bold hogni for much it trembles as in the dish it lies it trembled more by half while in his breast it lay hogni laughed when to his heart they cut the living crest crasher no lament uttered he all bleeding on a dish they laid it and it to gunnar bare calmly said gunnar the warrior niflung here have i the heart of the bold hogni unlike the heart of the timid hjali for it little trembles as in the dish it lies it trembled less while in his breast it lay so far shalt thou atli be from the eyes of men as thou wilt from the treasures be in my power alone is all the hidden niflung's gold now that hogni lives not ever was i wavering while we both lived now am i so no longer as i alone survive rhine shall possess men's baleful metal the mighty stream the as known niflung's heritage in the rolling water the choice rings shall glitter rather than on the hand of the hun's children shine drive your wheel chariots the captive is now in bonds atli the mighty their sister's husband rode with resounding steeds with strife thorns surrounded gudrun perceived the hero's peril she from tears refrained on entering the hall of tumult so be it with thee atli as towards gunnar thou hast held the oft-sworn oaths formerly taken by the southward verging sun and by sigti's hill the secluded bed of rest and by ullr's ring yet thence the more did the bit shaker the treasure's guardian the warrior chief drag to death the living prince then did a host of men into a pen cast down which was within with serpents overcrawled. But Gunnar there alone a harp in wrathful mood with his hands struck, the strings resounded. So should a daring chief, a ring dispenser, gold from men withhold. Atli turned his brass shod steed, his home to revisit back from the murder. Din was in the court with horses thronged, men's weapon song, from the heath they were come out then went gudrun atli to meet with a golden cup to do her duty to the king thou canst o king joyful in thy hall receive from gudrun the arms of the departed the drinking cups of atli groaned with heavy wine when in the hall together the huns were counted long-bearded bold the warriors entered hastened the bright-faced dame to bear their potions to them the wondrous lady to the chiefs and reluctantly to the pallid Atli the festal dainties offered, and uttered words of hate. Thou, sword's dispenser, hast thy two sons' hearts, slaughter gory with honey eaten. I resolved that thou, bold chief, shouldst the human dish eat at thy feasting, and to the place of honour send it. Henceforth thou wilt not to thy knees call Erp and Atil, joyous with beer the two, Thou wilt not henceforth see them from thy middle seat gold dispersing, javelins shafting, manes clipping, or horses urging. Uproar was on the benches, portentous the cry of men, noise beneath the costly hangings. The children of the Huns wept, all wept, save Gudrun, who never wept, or for her bare fierce brothers, or her dear sons, young, simple, whom she had borne to Atli gold scattered the swan fair dame with ruddy rings the household gifted fate she let ripen but the bright gold flow the woman spared not the treasure houses utley incautious had himself drunk weary weapon he had none nor was against gudrun guarded oft had their sport been better when they lovingly embraced each other before the nobles 
With the sword's point she gave the bed of blood to drink, with death-bent hand, and the dogs loosed out at the hall-door drove them, and the lady wakened the household with burning brand. That vengeance she for her brothers took. To fire she then gave all that were therein, and from her brother's murder were from the dark den returned. The old structures fell, the treasure-houses smoked, the budlungs dwelling. Burnt too were the shield-maids within, their lives cut short, in the raging fire they sank. Of this enough is said. No such woman will henceforth arms again bear to avenge her brothers. That bright woman had to three kings of men the death-doom born, before she died. Yet more clearly is this told in Atla Malum, Inum, Gruenlenskum, the Greenland lay of Atli. The Death of Atli Atli has been identified as Attila, called in history the Scourge of God, a king of the Huns who twice defeated the Romans under Theodosius and plundered the Eternal City itself. He was guilty of many excesses, and is reported to have died of a hemorrhage on the day following his marriage with Ildico, 453. In the story of Siegfried and Brynhild, however, he is represented as having married Gudran, daughter of Grimhild and King Giuki, who it will be recalled by readers of the other volumes of this series, beguiled Siegfried, by means of a magic potion, into marriage with her. Her feelings revolted against an alliance with Atli, but she accepted him for a husband, in order thereby to obtain the power to gratify her vengeance against Hogni, Hagen, who had assassinated Siegfried. End of section 37、Section、38 Section This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Saman Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Saman Sigfason. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. The Greenland Lay of Atli. Of those misdeeds men have heard tell, when warriors of old a compact made, which by pledges they confirmed, a secret consultation held. Terrible it was to them after, and to Giuki's sons likewise, who were betrayed. The warriors' fate ripened, they were death-doomed. Ill-advised was Atli, though he possessed sagacity. He felled a mighty column, strove hardly against himself, with speed he messengers dispatched, that his wife's brothers should come quickly. Wise was the house-dame, prudently she thought, the words in order she had heard, that in secret they had said. The sage lady was at a loss, fain would she help them. They over the sea must sail, but she herself could not go. Runes she graved, Vingi them falsified, before he gave them from him. Of ill he was the bearer. Then departed Atli's messengers, through the branched firth, for where the bold warriors dwelt. They with beer were cheered, and fires they kindled, naught thought they of guile when they were come. They the gifts accepted, which the prince sent them, on a column hung them, and of no evil thought. Then came Kostbera, she was Hogni's wife, a woman greatly cautious, and them both greeted. Glad was also Glaumvor, Gunnar's consort, the prudent dame, her duty forgot not, she to the guests' need attended. Hogni they home invited, if he would be pleased to go. Treachery was manifest, had they but reflected. Gunnar then promised, if only Hogni would, but Hogni refused what the other proposed. The noble dames bore mead, of many things there was abundance, many horns passed round, until it seemed they had full drunken. The household prepared their couches, as to them seemed best. Cunning was Kostbera, she could runes interpret, 
she the letters read by the bright fire, her tongue she had to guard between both her gums, so perverted were they, it was difficult to understand them. To their bed they went, she and Hogni. The gentle lady dreamed, and concealed it not, to the prince wisely said it as soon as she awoke. From home thou art going, Hogni, give ear to counsel, few are fully prudent, go another time. I have the runes interpreted which thy sister graved. That fair dame has not this time invited thee. At one thing I wonder most, I cannot even conceive why so wise a woman so confusedly should grave, for it is so set down as if it intimated death to you both if you should straight away come. Either she has left out a letter, or others are the cause. They are, said Hogni, all suspicious. I have no knowledge of them, nor will I into it inquire, unless we have to make requital. The king will gift us with gleed red gold. I never fear, though we may hear of terror. Tottering ye will go, if thitherward ye tend. No kind entertainment there will ye at this time find. Hogni, I have dreamed. I will not conceal it. In an evil hour ye will go, or so at least I fear. Methought thy coverlet was with fire consumed, that the towering flame rushed through my dwelling. Hogni, here lie linen cloths, which thou hadst little noticed. These will quickly burn, where thou the coverlet sawest. Prospera, methought a bear came in and broke down the columns, and so his talons shook that we were terror-stricken. By his mouth held many of us, so that we were helpless. There, too, was a din far from little. Hogni. A tempest there will be furious and sudden. The white bear thou sawest will be a storm from the east. Costbearer. Methought an eagle flew herein, all through the house, that will largely concern us. He sprinkled all with blood. From his threats I thought it to be the ham of Atli. Hogni. We often slaughter largely, and then red we see. Often are oxen meant when we of eagles dream. Sound is the heart of Atli. Dream thou as thou mayest. With this they ended. All speeches have an end. The high-born awoke. There the like befell. Glamvor had perceived that her dreams were ill-boding, adverse to Gunnar's going to and fro. Methought a gallows was for thee erected, Thou wentest to be hanged, that serpents ate thee, that I interred thee living, that the power's dissolution came. Divine thou what that portends. Methought a bloody glaive from thy sark was drawn. Ill it is such a dream to a consort to recount. Methought a lance was thrust through thy middle. Wolves howled on every side. Gunnar. Where dogs run they are wont to bark. Oft bodes the bay of dogs a flight of javelins. Glamvor. Methought a river ran herein, through the whole house, that it roared violently, rushed over the benches, break the feet of you brothers twain, nothing the water spared, something will that portend. Methought dead women in the night came hither, not ill-clad were they, they would choose thee, forthwith invited thee to their seats. I ween thy Deesir have forsaken thee. Gunnar, too late it is to speak. It is now so resolved. From the journey we shall not shrink, as it is decreed to go. Very probable, it seems, that our lives will be short. When colours were discernible, those on journey bent, all rose up. The others fain would stay them. The five journeyed together, the whose carls were there present twice that number. It was ill-devised. Snavar and Solvar, they were Hogni's sons. Orkning he was named, who them accompanied. A gentle shield-bearer was he, the brother of Hogni's wife. They went far appointed, until the firth them parted. Ever would their wives had stayed them. They would not be stayed. Glomvor then spoke, Gunnar's consort. Vingi she addressed, as to her seemed fitting. 
I know not whether ye will requite us as we would. With treachery came the guest, if aught of ill betide. Then Vingi swore, little spared he himself. May him the Jotuns have, if towards you he lies. The gallows hold him, if aught against peace he meditates. Bera took up the word, she of gentle soul. Sail ye prosperous, and may success attend you. May it be as I pray, and if nothing hinder. Hogni answered, he to his kin meant well. Be of good cheer, you prudent, whatever may befall. Many say the same, though with great difference, for many little care how they depart from home. On each other then they looked before they parted. Then, I ween, their fates were severed, and their ways divided. Vigorously they rowed, their bark was well nigh riven, backward bending the waves they beat, ardently plied. Their oar bands were broken, the rowlocks shattered. They made not the vessel fast before they quitted it. A little after, I will the end relate, they saw the mansion stand that Budli had possessed. Loud creaked the latticed gates when Hogni knocked. Then said Vingi what he had better not. Go far from the house, tis perilous to enter. I quickly enticed you to perdition. Ye shall forthwith be slain. With fair words I prayed your coming, though guile was under them. But just bide here, while a gallows I prepare. Hongi answered, little thought he of yielding, or of aught fearful that was to be proved. Think not to frighten us, try that seldom. If one word thou addest, thy wilt thy harm prolong. They rushed on Vinky and struck him dead, laid on their axes, while life within him throbbed. Utley his men assembled, in their byronies they issued forth, went prepared so that a fence was between them. Words they bandied, all with rage, boiling. Already had we resolved to take your lives away. Hogni. It looks but ill, if ye have counselled. Even now ye are unprepared, and we one have fallen, smitten to death. One of your host was he. Furious they became when those words they heard, their fingers stretched forth and their bowstrings ceased, sharply shot and with shields themselves protected. In then came the tale of what without was passing, loud before the hall they a thrall heard speak. Then incensed was Gudrun when the sad news she heard. Adorned with necklaces she tore them all asunder, so hurled the silver that the rings in shivers flew. Then she went out, not gently moved the doors, went forth void of fear, and the comers hailed, turned to the Niflungs. That was her last greeting. Truth attended it. More words, she said. I sought by symbols to prevent your leaving home. Fate may no one resist, and yet you must come hither. Wisely, she asked, might they not be appeased? No one consented. All answered no. Saw then the high-born lady that a hard game they played, a deadly deed she meditated, and her robe dashed aside, a naked falchion ceased, and her kinsmen's lives defended, skilful she was in warfare, where her hand she applied. Giuki's daughter caused two warriors to fall, Atli's brother she struck down, he must henceforth be born, so she the conflict managed that she his foot struck off. Another too she smote, so that he never rose. To hail she sent him, her hand trembled not. A conflict then ensued which was widely famed, but that excelled all else which Giuki's sons performed. So it is said the Niflungs, while yet they lived, with swords maintained the fight, corselets rent, helmets hewed, as their hearts prompted. At morning most they fought, until midday had passed, all early morn and the forenoon, ere the fight was ended. The field flowed with blood until eighteen had fallen. Bera's two sons and her brother had them overcome. Then the fierce Atli spoke, wrought though he was. 
"'Tis ill to look around. This is long of you. We were thirty warlike thanes, eleven survive. The chasm is too great. We were five brothers when Budli died. Now has Hale the half. Two lie slain. A great affinity I obtained, that I cannot deny pernicious woman, of which I have no benefit. Peace we have seldom had, since thou among us camest. Of kinsmen ye have bereft me, of riches often wronged. To Hale my sister ye have sent. That is to me most bitter. Gudrun This thou callest to mind, Atli, but thou so first did act. My mother thou didst take, and for her treasures murder. My gifted niece with hunger thou didst cause to perish. Laughable to me it seems, when thou sorrows dost recount. The gods are to be thanked that it goes ill with thee. Atli Jarls, I exhort you the sorrow to augment of that presumptuous woman. I would fain see it. Strive so to do, that Gudrun may lament. May I but see that in her lot she joys not. Take ye Hogni, and with a knife hack him. Cut out his heart. This ye shall do. Gunnar the fears to a gallows fasten. Do the work thoroughly. Lure up the serpent. Hogni. Do as thou listest. Glad I will await it. Stout I shall prove myself. I have ere now things much harder proved. Ye had a hindrance while unscathed we were. Now are we so wounded that our fate thou mayest command. Beatty spake, he was at least steward. Take we Hjali, but Hongni let us save. Let us do half the work. He is death-worthy. As long as he lives, a slug he will ever be. Terrified was the kettle-watcher. The place no longer held him. He could be a whiner. He clomb into every nook. Their conflict was his bane, as he the penalty must pay. And the day sad when he must from the swine die, from all good things which he had enjoyed. Budley's cook they took, and the knife brought towards him. Howled the wretched thrall, ere the point he felt, declared that he had time the gardens to manure, the vilest offices to do, if from death he might escape. Joyful indeed was Hjali, could he but save his life. Hogni all this observed, few so act as for a slave to intercede that he may escape. Less tis, I say, for me to play this game myself. Why shall we here desire to listen to that screaming? Hands on the good prince they lay. There was no option for the bold warriors, the sentence longer to delay. Then laughed Hogni, heard the sons of day how he could hold out. Torment he well endured. A harp Gunnar took, with his foot-branches touched it. He could so strike it that women wept, and the men sobbed who best could hear it. He the noble queen counselled, the rafters burst asunder. There died the noble as the dawn of day. At the last they caused their deeds to live. Atli thought himself great. Over them both he strode, to the sagacious woman told the evil, and bitterly reproached her. It is now morning, Gudrun, thy loved ones thou hast lost, partly thou art the cause that it has so befallen. Gudrun, joyful art thou, Atli, slaughter to announce. Repentance shall await thee when thou hast all proved. That heritage shall be left thee, that I can tell ye, that ill shall never from thee go, unless I also die. Atli, that I can prevent, another course I see, easier by half, the good we oft reject. With slaves I will console thee, with things most precious, with snow-white silver, as thou thyself mayest desire. Gudrun, of that there is no hope, I will all reject, atonement I have spurned for smaller injuries. Hard I was ever thought, now will that be aggravated, I every grudge concealed while Hongni lived. We were both nurtured in one house, many a play we played, and in the wood grew up. 
scream held us adorned with gold and necklaces for my brother's death never wilt thou indemnify me nor ever do what shall to me seem good men's too great power women's lot oppresses on the knee the hand sinks if the arms wither the tree inclines if its root fibres are severed now otley thou mayest alone over all here command most unwise this was when to this the prince gave credit the guile was manifest had he been on his guard dissembling then was gudrun against her heart she could speak made herself gay appear with two shields she played a banquet she would prepare her brother's funeral feast the same with otley also for his own due with this they ended the banquet was prepared the feasting was too luxurious the woman great of heart was stern she warred on Budley's race on her spouse she would cruel vengeance wreak the young ones she enticed and on a block laid them the fierce babes were terrified and wept not to their mother's bosom crept asked what she was going to do ask no questions both i intend to kill long have i desired to cut short your days slay as thou wilt thy children no one hinders it thy rage will have short peace if thou destroyest us in our blooming years thou desperate woman it fell out accordingly she cut the throats of both otley oft inquired whither his boys were gone to play as he nowhere saw them gudrun over i am resolved to go and to otley tell it grimhild's daughter will not conceal it from thee little glad otley wilt thou be when all thou learnest great woe didst thou raise up when thou my brother slewest very seldom have i slept since they fell bitterly i threatened thee now i have reminded thee it is morning sayest thou i yet it well remember and it is now eve when thou the like shalt learn thou thy sons hast lost as thou least shouldest know that their skulls thou hast had for beer cups thy drink i prepared i their red blood have shed i their hearts took and on a spit staked them then to thee gave them i said they were of calves it was long of thee alone thou didst leave none voraciously didst devour well didst ply thy teeth thy children's fate thou knowest few a worse awaits i have my part performed though in it glory not otley cruel wast thou gudrun who couldst so act with thy children's blood my drink to mingle thou hast destroyed thy offspring as thou least shouldest and to myself thou leavest a short interval from ill gudrun i could still desire thyself to slay rarely too ill it fares with such a prince thou hast already perpetrated crimes unexampled among men of frantic cruelty in this world now thou hast added what we have just witnessed a great misdeed hast thou committed thy death feast thou hast prepared otley on the pile thou shalt be burnt but first be stoned then wilt thou have earned what thou hast ever sought gudrun tell to thyself such griefs early to-morrow by a fairer death i will pass to another light in the same hall they sat exchanged hostile thoughts bandied words of hate each was ill at ease hate waxed in a niflung a great deed he meditated to gudrun he declared that he was otley's deadly foe into her mind came hogney's treatment happy she him accounted if he vengeance wreaked then was otley slain within a little space hogney's son him slew and gudrun herself the bold king spake roused up from sleep quickly he felt the wounds said he no binding needed tell me most truly who has slain budley's son i am hardly treated of life i have no hope 
Gudrun. I, Grimhild's daughter, will not from thee hide that I am the cause that thy life passes away, but partly Hogni's son, that thy wounds make thee faint. Atli, to the slaughter thou hast rushed, although it ill beseemed thee, tis bad to circumvent a friend who well confided in thee. Besought I went from home to woo thee, Gudrun. A widow thou was left, fears thou wast accounted, which was no falsehood as we have proved. Hither home thou earnest, as a host of men attended, all was splendid on our journey. Pomp of all kinds was there, of illustrious men, beeves in abundance. Largely we enjoyed them. Of all things there was plenty partaken of by many. A marriage gift to my bride I gave, treasures for her acceptance, thralls thrice ten, seven fair female slaves. In such things was honour, silver there was yet more. All seemed to thee as it were naught, while the lands untouched lay, which Budley had left me. So didst thou undermine, didst allow me nothing to receive. Thou didst my mother let often sit weeping, with heart content I found not one of my household after. Gudrun. Now, Atli, thou liest, though of that I little reck. Gentle I seldom was, yet didst thou greatly aggravate it. Young brothers ye fought together, among yourselves contended. To hell went the half from thy house. All went to ruin that should be for benefit. Brothers and sisters we were three, we thought ourselves invincible. From the land we departed, we followed Sigurd. We roved about, each steered a ship, seeking luck we went, till to the east we came. The chief king we slew, there a land obtained, the hearsar yielded to us, that manifested fear. We from the forest freed him whom we wished harmless, raised him to prosperity who nothing had possessed. The Hun King died, then suddenly my fortune changed. Great was a young wife's grief, the widow's lot was hers. A torment to me it seemed to come living to the house of Atli. A hero had possessed me, sad was the loss. Thou didst never from a contest come, as we had heard, where thou didst gain thy cause or others overcome. Ever wouldst thou give way, and never stand, let us all pass off quietly, as ill beseemed a king. Atli. Gudrun, now thou liest. Little will be better the lot of either. We have all suffered. Now act thou, Gudrun, of thy goodness, and for our honour when I forth am born. Gudrun. I a ship will buy, and a painted cist. Will the winding sheet well wax to enwrap thy corpse? Will think of every requisite as if we had each other loved? Atli was now a corpse. Lament from his kin arose. The illustrious woman did all she had promised. The wise woman would go to destroy herself. Her days were lengthened. She died another time. Happy is every one hereafter who shall give birth to such a daughter famed for deeds as Kyuki begat. Ever will live, in every land, their oft-told tale, wherever people shall give ear. End of section 38section thirty nine of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Samen Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Gudrun's Incitement. Having slain Atli, Gudrun went to the seashore. She went out into the sea and would destroy herself, but could not sink. She was born across the firth to the land of King Jonaker, who married her. Their sons were Sorli, Erp, and Hamdir. There was reared up Svanhild, the daughter of Sigurd. 
she was given in marriage to Jormanrek the Powerful. With him lived Bicky, who counselled Ranver, the king's son, to take her. Bicky told that to the king, who caused Ranver to be hanged, and Svanhild trodden under horses' feet. When Gudrun heard of this, she said to her sons, then heard I tell of quarrels dire, hard sayings uttered from great affliction, when her sons the fierce-hearted Gudrun in deadly words to slaughter instigated. Why sit ye here? Why sleep life away? Why does it pain you not joyous words to speak, now Jormanrek, your sister, young in years, has with horses trodden, white and black in a public way, with grey and way-worn gothic steeds? Ye are not like to Gunnar and the others, nor of soul so valiant as Hogni was. Her ye should seek to avenge, if ye had the courage of my brothers, or the fierce spirit of the Hunnish kings. Then said Hamdir, the great of heart, Little didst thou care Hogni's deeds to praise when Sigurd he from sleep awaked. Thy blue-white bedclothes were red with thy husband's gore, with death-blood covered. For thy brothers, thou didst over hasty vengeance take, dire and bitter, when thou thy sons didst murder. We young ones could on Jormanrek, acting all together, have avenged our sister. Bring forth the arms of the Hunnish kings, thou hast us stimulated to a sword moat. Laughing, Gudrun to the storehouse turned. The king's crested helms from the coffers drew their ample corslets, and to her sons them bore. The young heroes loaded their horses' shoulders. Then said Hamdir the great of heart, So will no more come his mother to see the warrior felled in the Gothic land, so that thou the funeral beer after us all may drink, after Svanhild and thy sons. Weeping Gudrun, Yuki's daughter, sorrowing went to sit in the forecourt, and to recount with tear-worn cheeks, sad of soul, her calamities in many ways. Three fires I have known, three hearths I have known, of three consorts I have been born to the house. Sigurd alone to me was better than all, of whom my brothers were the murderers. Of my painful wounds I might not complain, yet they even more seemed to afflict me, when those chieftains to Atli gave me. My bright boys I called to speak with me, for my injuries I could not get revenge, ere I had severed the Hniflung's head. To the seashore I went, against the Norns I was embittered. I would cast off their persecution. Bore and submerged me not the towering billows. Up on land I rose, because I was to live. To the nuptial couch I went, as I thought better for me, for the third time, with a mighty king. I bore forth offspring, guardians of the heritage, Jonaker's sons. But around Svanil bondmaiden sat, of all my children, her I loved the best. Svanhild was, in my hall, as was the sunbeam, fair to behold. I with gold adorned her, and with fine raiment, before I gave her to the Gothic people. That is to me the hardest of all my woes, that Svanhild's beauteous locks should in the mire be trodden under horses' feet. But that was yet more painful when my Sigurd they ingloriously slew in his bed, though of all most cruel, when of Gunnar the glistening serpents to the vitals crawled. But the most agonizing, which to my heart flew, when the brave king's heart they quickly cut out, Many griefs I call to memory, many ills I call to memory. Guide, Sigurd, thy black steed, thy swift course, hither let it run. Here sits no son's wife, no daughter, who to Gudrun precious things may give. Remember, Sigurd, what we together said, when on our bed we both were sitting, that thou, brave one, shouldst come to me from hell's abode, but I from the world to thee. Raise ye jarls an oaken pile, let it under heaven the highest be. May it burn a breast full of woes, the fire round my heart its sorrow melt. May all men's lot be bettered, all women's sorrow lessened, 
to whom this tale of woes shall be recounted. End of section 39《Section 40 of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Samen Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. The Lay of Hamdir. In that court arose woeful deeds, at the Alfar's doleful lament. At early morn, men's afflictions, troubles of various kinds, sorrows were quickened. It was not now nor yesterday. A long time since has passed. Few things are more ancient. It was by much earlier, when Gudrun, Gilki's daughter, her young sons instigated Svanhild to avenge. She was your sister, her name Svanhild. She whom Jormundrek with horses trod to death white and black on the public way, with grey and white won gothic steeds. Thenceforth all is sad to you, kings of people. Ye alone survive, branches of my race. Lonely I am become, as the asp tree in the forest, of kindred bereft, as the fir of branches, of joy deprived as is the tree of foliage, when the branch spoiler comes in the warm day. Then spake Hamdir, the great soul, Little, Gudrun, didst thou care Hognid's deeds to praise, when Sigurd they from sleep awaked on the bed thou satst, and the murderers laughed. Thy bedclothes, blue and white, woven with cunning hands, swam in thy husband's gore. When Sigurd perished, over the dead thou satst, caredst not for mirth, so Gunnar willed it. Atli thou wouldst afflict by Erp's murder, and by Atil's life's destruction, that proved for thyself the worst. Therefore should every one sow against others use for life's destruction a sharp biting sword, that he harm not himself. Then said sorely, he had a prudent mind. I with my mother will not speeches exchange, though words to each of you to me seem wanting. What, Gudrun, dost thou desire, which for tears thou canst not utter? For thy brothers weep, and thy dear sons, thy nearest kin, drawn to the strife. For us both shalt thou, Gudrun, also have to weep, who here sit fated on our steeds, far away to die. From the court they went for conflict ready. The young men journeyed over humid fells, on honey steeds murder to avenge. Then said Erp all at once, the noble youth was joking on his horse's back, ill tis to a timid man to point out the ways. They said the bastard was overbold. On their way they had found the wily jester. How will the swarthy dwarf afford us aid? He of another mother answered, So he said aid he would to his kin afford, As one foot to the other, Or, grown to the body, one hand the other. What can a foot to a foot give, Or, grown to the body, one hand the other? From the sheath they drew the iron blade, The falchion's edges, for hell's delight. They their strength diminished by a third part, They their young kinsmen caused to earth to sink. Their mantles then they shook, their weapons grasped, the highborn were clad in sumptuous raiment. Forward lay the ways, a woeful path they found, and their sister's son wounded on a gibbet, wind-cold outlaw trees on the town's west. Ever vibrated the raven's wet, there to tarry was not good. Uproar was in the hall, Men were with drink excited, so that the horse's tramp no one heard until a mindful man winded his horn. To announce they went to Jormundrek that were seen helm-decked warriors. Take ye counsel, potent ones are come, before mighty men ye have on a damsel trampled. Then laughed Jormundrek, with his hand stroked his beard, asked not for his corselet. With wine he struggled, 
shook his dark locks, on his white shield looked, and in his hand swung the golden cup. Happy should I seem if I could see Hamdir and Sorli within my halls. I would them then with bowstrings bind, the good son of Gjuki, on the gallows hang. Then said Rudr Glod, on the high steps standing, Prince, said she to her son, for that was threatened which ought not to happen, shall two men alone bind or slay ten thousand Goths in this lofty burg? Tumult was in the mansion, the beer-cups flew in shivers, men lay in blood from the Goths' breasts flowing. Then said Hamdir, the great of heart, Jormundrek, thou didst desire our coming, brothers of one mother, into thy burg. Now seest thou thy feet, seest thy hand Jormundrek, cast into the glowing fire. Then roared forth a godlike mail-clad warrior, as a bear roars, On the men hurl stones, since spears bite not, nor edge of sword, nor points, the sons of Yonaker. Then said Hamdir, the great of heart, Harm didst thou, brother, when thou that mouth didst ope. Oft from that mouth bad counsel comes. Courage hast thou, Hamdir, if only thou hadst sense, that man lacks much who wisdom lacks. Oft would the head now be, had but Erb lived, our brother bold in fight, whom on the way we slew that warrior brave, me the Deesir instigated, that man sacred to us, whom we resolved to slay. I ween not that ours should be the wolf's example, that with ourselves we should contend like the Norn's dogs, that voracious are in the desert nurtured. Well have we fought, on slaughtered Goths we stand, on those fallen by the sword like eagles on a branch. Great glory have we gained, thou now or to-morrow we shall die. No one lives till eve, against the Norn's decree. There fell sorely at the mansion's front, but Hamdir sank at the house's back. This is called the Old Lay of Hamdir. End of section 40《Section 41 of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Samen Sigfason. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. The Deluding of Gylfi. Gefion's Ploughing Footnote. This chapter is probably the interpolation of an early copyist, for it has evidently no connection with the following one, and is not found in the Uppsala MS of the prose manuscript, which is supposed to be the oldest extant. Gefion's Ploughing is obviously a mythic way of accounting for some convulsions of nature, perhaps a convulsion that produced the sound, and thus effected the junction between the Baltic and the Northern Ocean. End of footnote. King Gylfi ruled over the land which is now called Svithiod, Sweden. It is related of him that he once gave a wayfaring woman, as a recompense for her having diverted him, as much land in his realm as she could plough with four oxen in a day and a night. This woman was, however, of the race of the Asir, and was called Gefion. She took four oxen from the north, out of Jotunheim, but they were the sons she had had with a giant, and set them before a plough. Now the plough made such deep furrows that it tore up the land, which the oxen drew westward out to the sea until they came to a sound. There Gefion fixed the land, and called it Selund. And the place where the land had stood became water, and formed a lake which is now called the water, Laugur, and the inlets of this lake correspond exactly with the headlands of Sealand. As Skald Bragi the old saith, Gefion drew from Gylfi, rich in stored-up treasure, the land she joined to Denmark, four heads and eight eyes bearing, while hot sweat trickled down them, the oxen dragged the reft mass, 
that formed this winsome island. End of section 41《42of the Elder Eddas of Saman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Saman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Saman Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. The Younger Eddas of Sturluson. Gylfi's Journey to Asgard King Gylfi was renowned for his wisdom and skill in magic. He beheld with astonishment that whatever the Asir willed took place, and was at a loss whether to attribute their success to the superiority of their natural abilities, or to a power imparted to them by the mighty gods whom they worshipped. To be satisfied in this particular, he resolved to go to Asgard, and taking upon himself the likeness of an old man, set out on his journey. But the Asir, being too well skilled in divination not to foresee his design, prepared to receive him with various illusions. On entering the city, Gylfi saw a very lofty mansion, the roof of which, as far as his eye could reach, was covered with golden shields. Theodolf of Vina thus alludes to Valhalla being roofed with shields. Warriors all careworn, stones had poured upon them, on their backs let glisten, Valhalla's golden shingles. At the entrance of the mansion, Gylfi saw a man who amused himself by tossing seven small swords in the air, and catching them as they fell one after the other. This person having asked his name, Gylfi said that he was called Gangler, and that he came from a long journey, and begged for a night's lodging. He asked in turn to whom this mansion belonged. The other told him that it belonged to their king, and added, But I will lead thee to him, and thou shalt thyself ask him his name. So saying, he entered the hall, and as Gylfi followed, the door banged to behind him. He there saw many stately rooms crowded with people, some playing, some drinking, and others fighting with various weapons. Gangler, seeing a multitude of things, the meaning of which he could not comprehend, softly pronounced the following verse from the Havamal. Scan every gate, ere thou go on, with greatest caution. For hard to say this, where foes are sitting, in this fair mansion. He afterwards beheld three thrones raised one above the other, with a man sitting on each of them. Upon his asking what the names of these lords might be, his guide answered, He who sitteth on the lowest throne is a king. His name is Har, the high or lofty one. The second is Jan Har, i.e. equal to the high. But he who sitteth on the highest throne is called Thridi, the third. Har, perceiving the stranger, asked him what his errand was, adding that he should be welcome to eat and drink without cost, as were all those who remained in Hava Hall. Gangler said he desired first to ascertain whether there was any person present renowned for his wisdom. "'If thou art not the most knowing,' replied Har, "'I fear thou wilt hardly return safe. But go, stand there below, and propose thy questions. Here sits one who will be able to answer them.'" End of section 42 Section 43 of the Elder Eddas of Seaman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorr Stilleson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Seaman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorr Stilleson by Seaman Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of the Supreme Deity. Gangler thus began his discourse. Who is the first or eldest of the gods? In our language, replied Ha, he is called Afadi, Old Father, or the Father of All. But in the old Asgard he had twelve names. Where is this god? said Ganga. What is his power? And what hath he done to display his glory? 
"'He liveth,' replied Har. "'From all ages he governeth all realms and swayeth all things great and small. "'He hath formed,' added Jaffna, "'heaven and earth, and the air, and all things thereunto belonging. "'And what is more,' continued Thridi, "'he hath made man, and given him a soul which shall live and never perish, "'though the body shall have mouldered away, or have been burnt to ashes.' and all that are righteous shall dwell with them in the place called Gimli, or Bingolf, but the wicked shall go to hell, and thence to Niflhel, which is below, in the ninth world. And where did this god remain before he made heaven and earth? demanded Gangler. He was then, replied Ha, with the Hrimthursar. End of section 43「Section 44 of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Stolison. This is LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Stolison by Simon Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of the primordial state of the universe. But with what did he begin, or what was the beginning of things? demanded Gangler. Here, replied Ha, what is said in the Voluspa. T'was time's first dawn, when not yet was, nor sun nor sea, nor cooling wave, earth was not there. Nor heaven above, not save a void, and yawning gulf, but verdure none. Many ages before the earth was made, added Jaffna, was Niflheim formed, in the middle of which lies the spring called Vergalmir, from which flow twelve rivers, Yol being the nearest to the gate of the abode of death. But first of all, continued Thridi, there was in the southern region, sphere, the world called Muspel. It is a world too luminous and glowing to be entered by those who are not indigenous there. He who sitteth on its borders, or the land sand, to guard it, is named Surtur. In his hand he beareth a flaming falchion, and at the end of the world shall issue forth to combat, and shall vanquish all the gods, and consume the universe with fire. End of section 44 Section 45 of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sekfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Stolzon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sekfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Stolzon by Simon Sekfusson. Translated by Erasmus B. Anderson. Origin of the Hrimthusa, or Frost Giants. Tell me, said Gangler, what was the state of things ere the races mingled and nations came into being? When the rivers that are called Elivaga had flowed far from their sources, replied Har, the venom which they rolled along hardened, as does dross that runs from a furnace, and became ice. When the rivers flowed no longer, and the ice stood still, the vapour arising from the venom gathered over it, and froze to rhyme, and in this manner were formed, in Ginungagap, many layers of congealed vapour, piled one over the other. That part of Ginungagap, added Jaffna, that lies towards the north, was thus filled with heavy masses of jetted vapour and ice, whilst everywhere within were whirlwinds and fleeting mists. But the southern part of Ginumgagap was lighted by the sparks and flakes that flew into it from Muspelheim. Thus, continued Thridi, whilst freezing cold and gathering gloom proceeded from Niflheim, that part of Ginumgagap looking towards Muspelheim was filled with glowing radiancy, the intervening space remaining calm and light as wind-still air. And when the heated blast met the gelid vapour, it melted it into drops, and by the might of him who sent the heat, these drops quickened into life, and took a human semblance. The being thus formed was named Ymir, but the frost giants call him Orgelmir. From him descend the race of the frost giants, Hrimthursar, as it is said in the Voluspa, From Bidolf come all the witches, from Bilmeth all wizards, from Svarthofi all poison seethers, and all giants from Ymir. And the giant Rathbluthnir, when Gangrad asked, Whence came Orgamir, the first of the sons of giants? answered, The Elivagar cast out drops of venom that quickened into a giant. From him spring all our race, and hence are we so strong and mighty. 
"How did the race of Ymir spread itself?" asked Gangler, "or dost thou believe that this giant was a god?" "We are far from believing him to have been a god," replied Har, "for he was wicked, as are all of his race, whom we call Frost giants; and it is said that, when Ymir slept, he fell into a sweat, and from the pit of his left arm was born a man and a woman, and one of his feet engendered with the other a son, from whom descend the Frost giants, and we therefore call Ymir the Old Frost giant." End of the Project Gutenberg Section 46 of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturluson by Simon Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of the cow out Humla and the birth of Odin. Where dwelt Ymir, and on what did he live? asked Gangla. Immediately after the gelid vapors had been resolved into drops, replied Kar, there was formed out of them the cow named out Humla. Four streams of milk ran from her teats, and thus fed she Ymir. But on what did the cow feed? questioned Gangla. The cow, answered Har supported herself by licking the stones that were covered with salt and hoar frost. The first day that she licked these stones, there sprang from them, towards evening, the heads of a man, the second day a head, and on the third an entire man, who was endowed with beauty, agility, and power. He was called Bur, and was the father of Bor, who took for his wife Besla, the daughter of the giant Bolthorn. And they had three sons, Odin, Vili, and Ve. And it is our belief that this Odin, with his brothers, ruleth both heaven and earth, and that Odin is his true name, and that he is the most mighty of all the gods. End of chapter 46 Section 47 of the Elder Eddas of Seaman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Stilderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturluson by Simon Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. How the sons of Bor slew Ymir, and from his body made heaven and earth. Was there, asked Gangler, any kind of equality or any degree of good understanding between these two races? Far from it, replied Ha. For the sons of Bor slew the giant Ymir. And when he fell, there ran so much blood from his wounds, that the whole race of frost giants was drowned in it, except a single giant, who saved himself with his household. He is called by the giants Bergelmir. He escaped by going on board his bark, and with him went his wife, and from them are descended the frost giants. And what became of the sons of Bor, whom ye look upon as gods? asked Gangla. To relate this, replied Har is no trivial matter. They dragged the body of Ymir into the middle of Ginnungagap, and of it formed the earth. From Ymir's blood they made the seas and waters, from his flesh the land, from his bones the mountains, and his teeth and jaws, together with some bits of broken bones, served them to make the stones and pebbles. With the blood that ran from his wounds, added Jafnar, they made the vast ocean, in the midst of which they fixed the earth, the ocean encircling it is a ring, and hardy will he be who attempts to pass those waters. From his skull, continued Thridi, they formed the heavens, which they placed over the earth, and set a dwarf at the corner of each of the four quarters. These dwarfs are called east, west, north, and south. They afterwards took the wandering sparks and red-hot flakes that had been cast out of Muspelheim, and placed them in the heavens, both above and below, to give light unto the world, and assign to every other errand's coruscation a prescribed locality in motion. Hence it is recorded in ancient law that from this time were marked out the days and nights and seasons. Such are the events that took place ere the earth obtained the form it now beareth. Truly great were the deeds ye tell me of, exclaimed Gangler, and wondrous in all its parts is the work thereby accomplished. But how is the earth fashioned? It is round without, replied Ha, 
and encircled by the deep ocean, the outward shores of which were assigned for a dwelling to the race of giants. But within, round about the earth, they, the sons of Bor, raised a bulwark against turbulent giants, employing for this structure Emir's eyebrows. To this bulwark they gave the name Midgard. They afterwards tossed Emir's brains into the air, and they became the clouds, for thus we find it recorded. Of Emir's flesh was formed the earth, of his sweat, blood, the seas, of his bones, the mountains, of his hair, the trees, of his skull, the heavens. But with his eyebrows, the blithe gods built a Midgard for the sons of men, whilst from his brains the lowering clouds were fashioned. End of section 47 Section 48 of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Simon Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of the formation of the first man and woman. To make heaven and earth, to fix the sun and the moon in the firmament, and mark out the days and seasons were indeed important labours, said Gangler. But whence came the men who at present dwell in the world? One day, replied Ha, as the sons of Bor were walking along the sea beach they found two stems of wood, out of which they shaped a man and a woman. The first, Odin, infused into them life and spirit. The second, Vili, endowed them with reason and the power of motion. The third, Ve gave them speech and features, hearing and vision. The man they call Ask, and the woman Embla. From these two descend the whole human race whose assigned dwelling was within Midgard. Then the sons of Bo built in the middle of the universe the city called Asgard, where dwell the gods and their kindred, and from the abode work out so many wondrous things, both on the earth and in the heavens above it. There is in that city a place called Lidskjalf, and when Odin is seated there on his lofty throne, he sees over the whole world, discerns all the actions of men, and comprehends whatever he contemplates. His wife is Frigga, the daughter of Fjorgen, and they and their offspring form the race that we call Aesir, a race that dwells in Asgard the Old, and the regions around it, and that we know to be entirely divine. Wherefore Odin may justly be called All Father, for he is verily the father of all, of gods as well as of men, and to his power all things owe their existence. Earth is his daughter and his wife, and with her he had his first-born son, Asathor, who is endowed with strength and valor, and therefore quelleth he everything that hath life. End of section 48 Section 49 of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Simon Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of Night and Day. A giant called Njorvi, continued Ha, who dwelt in Jotunheim, had a daughter called Night, not who, like all her race, was of dark and swarthy complexion. She was first wedded to a man called Nagulfari, and had by him a son named Od, and afterwards to another man called Anna, by whom she had a daughter called Earth, Jord. She then espoused Deling, of the Aesir race, and the son was Day, Dar, a child light and beauteous like his father. Then took all father, Night and Day, her son, and gave them two horses and two cars, and set them up in the heavens that they might drive successively one after the other, each in twelve hours' time round the world. Night rides first on her horse, calls him Faxi, that every morn, as he ends his course, bedews the earth with the foam that falls from his bit. The horse made use of by day is named Skin Faxi, from whose mane is shed light over the earth and the heavens. End of section 49 Section 50 of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eras of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eras of Snar Stullison by Simon Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus Bjarnason. Of the Sun and Moon. How doth all father regulate the course of the sun and moon? asked Gangler. There was formerly a man, replied Har, named Mundilfari, who had two children so lovely and graceful that he called the male, Mani, Moon, and the female, Sol, Sun, who espoused the man named Glenur. But the gods being incensed at Mundilfari's presumption, took his children and placed them in the heavens, and let Sol drive the horses that draw the car of the sun, which the gods had made to give light to the world out of the sparks that flew from Muspelheim. These horses are called Avark and Ausvil, and under their withers their gods place two skins filled with air to cool and refresh them, or according to some ancient traditions, a refrigerant substance called Isankur. Mani was set to guide the moon in his course, and regulate his increasing and waning aspect. One day he carried off from the earth two children, named Bil and Yuki, and as they were returning from the spring called Burgir, carrying between them the bucket called Ser, on the pole Simur. Vilfin was the father of these children, who always follow Mani, the moon, as we may easily observe even from the earth. End of section 50「Section 51 of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snar Stillison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snar Stillison by Simon Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus V. Anderson. Of the wolves that pursue the sun and moon. But the sun, said Gangler speeds at such a rate as if she feared that someone was pursuing her for her destruction. And well she may, replied Ha, for he that seeks her is not far behind, and she has no way to escape than to run before him. But who is he, asked Gangler, that causes her this anxiety? There are two wolves, answered Ha. The one called Skoll pursues the sun, and it is he that she fears, for he shall one day overtake and devour her. The other, called Hati, the son of Rodvitni, runs before her, and as eagerly pursues the moon that will one day be caught by him. Whence come these wolves? asked Gangler. A hag, replied Har, dwells in a wood, to the eastward of Midgard, called Janvil, the Ironwood, which is the abode of a race of witches called Janvilur. This old hag is the mother of many gigantic sons, who are all of them shaped like wolves. Two of them are the wolves thou askest about. There is one of that race, who is said to be the most formidable of all, called Managam. He will be filled with the life-blood of men who draw near the end, and will swallow up the moon, and stain the heavens and the earth with blood. Then shall the sun grow dim, and the winds howl tumultuously to and fro. End of section 51 Section 52 of The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and The Younger Eddas of Snow Astolison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusson and The Younger Eddas of Snow Astolison by Simon Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of the way that leads to heaven. I must now ask, said Gangler, which is the path leading from earth to heaven? That is a senseless question, replied Ha, with a smile of derision. Hast thou not been told that the gods made a bridge from earth to heaven, and called it Bifrost? Thou must surely have seen it, but perhaps thou callest it the rainbow. It is of three hues, and is constructed with more art than any other work. But strong though it be, it will be broken to pieces when the sons of Muspel, after having traversed great rivers, shall ride over it. Methinks, said Gangler, the gods could not have been in earnest to erect a bridge so liable to be broken down, since it is in their power to make whatever they please. The gods, replied Ha, are not to be blamed on that account. Before this of itself a very good bridge, but there is nothing in nature that can hope to make resistance when the sons of Mospel sally forth to the great combat. End of section 52 
Section 53 of the Elder Eddas of Semen Sigfarsson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Semen Sigfarsson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Semen Sigfarsson. Translated by Rasmus B. Andersen. The Golden Age. What did All Father do after Asgard was made? demanded Gangler. In the beginning, answered Ha, he appointed rulers, and bade them judge with them the fate of men, and regulate the government of the celestial city. They met for this purpose in a place called Idavol, which is in the centre of the divine abode. Their first work was to erect a court or hall, wherein are twelve seats for themselves, besides the throne which is occupied by All Father. This hall is the largest and most magnificent in the universe, being resplendent on all sides, both within and without, with the finest gold. Its name is Glatzheim. They also erected another hall for the sanctuary of the goddesses. It is a very fair structure, and called by men Vingolf. Lastly, they built a smithy, and furnished it with hammers, stongs, and anvils, and with these made all the other requisite instruments, with which they worked in metal, stone, and wood, and composed so large a quantity of the metal called gold, that they made all their movables of it. Hence that age was named the Golden Age. This was the age that lasted until the arrival of the women out of Jotunheim, who corrupted it. End of section 53「and bethought them how the dwarves had been bred in the mould of the earth, just as worms are in a dead body. It was, in fact, in Umir's flesh that the dwarves were engendered, and began to move and live. At first they were only maggots, but by the will of the gods they at length partook both of human shape and understanding, although they always dwell in rocks and caverns. Mosognia and Durin are the principal ones, as it is said in the Voluspa. Then went the rulers there, all gods most holy, to their seats aloft, and counsel together took, who should of dwarves, the race then fashion, from the livid bones and blood of the giant, Mersonia, chief of the dwarfish race, and Duin too, were then created, and like to men, dwarfs in the earth were formed in numbers, as during ordered. End of section 54 Section 55 of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfarsson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfarsson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Shaman Sigfarsson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of the Ash Yggdrasil, Mimir's Well, and the Norns or Destinies. Where, asked Gangler, is the chief or holiest seat of the gods? It is under the Ash Yggdrasil, replied Har, where the gods assemble every day in council. What is there remarkable in regard to that place? said Gangler. That Ash, answered Jafnar, is the greatest and best of all trees. It branches spread over the whole world, and even reach above heaven. It has three roots very wide asunder. One of them extends to the Aesir, another to the Frost Giants in that very place where was formerly Genungagap, and the third stands over Niflheim, and under this root, which is constantly gnawed by Nidhogg, is Hvergelmir. But under the root that stretches out towards the Frost Giant, there is Mimir's well, in which wisdom and wit lay hidden. The owner of this well is called Mimir. He is full of wisdom, because he drinks the waters of the well from the horned Joel every morning. One day All Father came and begged a drop of this water, which he obtained, but was obliged to leave one of his eyes as a pledge for it. The third root of the ash is in heaven, and under it is the holy Urdar found. 
tis here that the gods sit in judgment every day they ride up hither on horseback over bifrost which is called the aesir bridge these are the names of the horses of the aesir sleipnir is the best of them he has eight legs and belongs to odin the others are gladder gilir glair skydbrimir silfrintopper sinir gils falhofnir gultopper and letfiti baldur's horse was burnt with his master's body as for thor he goes on foot and is obliged every day to wade the rivers called gormd and urmd and two others called gerlaun through these shall thor wait every day as he fares to the doomstead under yggdrasil's ash else the aesir bridge would be in flames and boiling hot would become the holy waters but tell me said gangler does fire burn over bifrost that replied har which thou seest red in the bow is burning fire for the frost giants and the mountain giants would go up to heaven by that bridge if it were easy for every one to walk over it there are in heaven many goodly homesteads and none without a celestial ward near the fountain which is under the ash stands a very beauteous dwelling out of which go three maidens named urd ferdandi and skuld these maidens fix the lifetime of all men and are called norns but there are indeed many other norns for when a man is born there is a norn to determine his fate some are known to be of heavenly origin but others belong to the races of the elves and dwarfs as it is said methinks the norns were born far asunder for they are not of the same race some belong to the aesir some to the elves and some are dvalin's daughters but if these norns dispense the destinies of men said gangler they are methinks very unequal in their distribution for some men are fortunate and wealthy others acquire neither riches nor honours some live to a good old age while others are cut off in their prime the norns replied har who are of a good origin are good themselves and dispense good destinies but those men to whom misfortunes happen ought to ascribe them to the evil norns what more wonders hast thou to tell me said gangler concerning the ash what i have further to say respecting it replied har is that there is an eagle perched upon its branches who knows many things between his eyes sits the hawk called fadurfolnir the squirrel named ratatosk runs up and down the ash and seeks to cause strife between the eagle and nidhogg four hearts run across the branches of the tree and bite the buds they are called dane divalin dunir and durator but there are so many snakes with nidhogg in hvergelmir that no tongue can recount them it is also said that the norns who dwell by the urdar fount draw every day water from the spring and with it and the clay that lies around the fount sprinkle the ash in order that its branches may not rot and wither away this water is so holy that everything placed in the spring becomes as white as the film within an eggshell as it is said in the voluspa an ash now i standing named yggdrasil a stately tree sprinkled with water the purest thence come the dewdrops that fall in the dales ever blooming it stands o'er the urdar fountain the dew that falls thence on the earth men call honeydew and it is the food of the bees two fowls are fed in the urdar fount they are called swans and from them are descended all the birds of this species End of section 55. Recording by phone. Section 56 of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigvesson and the Younger Eddas of Snorla Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigvesson and the younger eddas of snorra sturluson by shaman sigvesson translated by rasmus b anderson of the various celestial regions thou tellest me many wonderful things of heaven said gangler but what other homesteads are to be seen there there are many other fair homesteads there replied har one of them is named elfholm alfheim wherein dwell the beings called the elves of light but the elves of darkness live under the earth and differ from the others still more in their actions than in their appearance the elves of light are fairer than the sun but the elves of darkness blacker than pitch there is also a mansion called breidablik which is not inferior to any other in beauty 
and another named glitnir the wall columns and beams of which are of ruddy gold and the roof of silver there is also the stead called himinbjorg that stands on the borders where bifrost touches heaven and the stately mansion belonging to odin called valaskjalf which was built by the gods and roofed with pure silver and in which is the throne called hlitschkjalf when all father is seated on this throne he can see over the whole world on the southern edge of heaven is the most beautiful homestead of all brighter than the sun itself it is called gimli and shall stand when both heaven and earth have passed away and good and righteous men shall dwell therein for everlasting ages but what will preserve this abode when surtur's fire consumes heaven and earth asked gangler we are told replied har that towards the south there is another heaven above this called antlang and again above this a third heaven called Vidblein. in this last we think gimli must be seated but we deem that the elves of light abide in it now End of section 56. Recording by phone. Section 57 of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigvesson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Shaman Sigvesson, translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of the Wind and the Seasons. Tell me, said Gangler, whence comes the wind, which is so strong that it moves the ocean and fans fire to flame, yet, strong though it be, no mortal eye can discern it. Wonderfully, therefore, must it be shapen. I can tell thee all about it, answered Har thou must know that at the northern extremity of the heavens sits a giant called resvelgur clad with eagle's plumes when he spreads out its wings for flight the winds arise from under them tell me further said gangler why the summer should be hot and the winter cold a wise man would not ask such a question which every one could answer replied har but if thou hast been so dull as not to have heard the reason I will rather forgive thee for once asking a foolish question, and suffer thee to remain any longer in ignorance of what ought to have been known to thee. The father of summer is called Svazut, who is such a gentle and delicate being that what is mild is from him called sweet. The father of winter has two names, Vindloni and Vinsval. He is the son of Vazat, and like all his race, has an icy breath and is of a grim and gloomy aspect. End of section 57. Recording by phone. Section 58 of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Shaman Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of Odin. I must now ask thee, said Gangler, who are the gods that men are bound to believe in? There are twelve gods, replied Har, to whom divine honours ought to be rendered. Nor are the goddesses, added Jafnar, less divine and mighty. The first and eldest of the Aesir, continued 3D, is Odin. He governs all things, and although the other deities are powerful, they all serve and obey him as children do their father. Frigga is his wife. She foresees the destinies of men, but never reveals what is to come. For thus it is said that Odin himself told Loki, Senseless Loki, why wilt thou pry into futurity? Frigga alone knoweth the destinies of all, though she telleth them never. Odin is named Alfadir, Allfather, because he is the father of all the gods, and also Valfadir, Choosing Father, because he chooses for his sons all of those who fall in combat. For their abode he has prepared Valhalla and Vingolf, where they are called Einherjar, heroes or champions. Odin is also called Hangagud, Haptagud, and Farmagud, and besides these was named in many ways when he went to King Geirodr, forty-nine names in all. A great many names indeed, exclaimed Gangler. Surely that man must be very wise who knows them all distinctly, 
and can tell on what occasions they were given it requires no doubt replied har a good memory to recollect readily all these names but i will tell thee in a few words what principally contributed to confer them upon him it was the great variety of languages for the various nations were obliged to translate his name into their respective tongues in order that they might supplicate and worship him some of his names however have been owing to adventures that happened to him on his journeys and which are related in old stories nor canst thou ever pass for a wise man if thou art not able to give an account of these wonderful adventures end of section fifty eight recording by phone section fifty nine of the elder eddas of shaman sigfason and the younger eddas of snorra stuleson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by phone the elder eddas of shaman sigfason and the younger eddas of snorra stuleson by shaman sigfason translated by rasmus b anderson of thor i now ask thee said gangler what are the names of the other gods what are their functions and what have they brought to pass the mightiest of them replied har is thor he is called aza thor and alku thor and is the strongest of gods and men his realm is named thrudfung and is mansion bilskirnir in which are five hundred and forty halls it is the largest house ever built Thor has a car drawn by two goats called Tangniost and Tangrisnir. From his driving about in this car, he is called Auku Thor, charioteer Thor. He likewise possesses three very precious things. The first is a mallet called Mjolnir, which both the frost and mountain giants know to their cost when they see it hurled against them in the air, and no wonder, for it has split many a skull of their fathers and kindred the second rare thing he possesses is called the belt of strength or prowess Meginjardir. when he girds it about him his divine might is doubly augmented the third also very precious being his iron gauntlets which he is obliged to put on whenever he would lay hold of the handle of his mallet there is no one so wise as to be able to relate all thor's marvellous exploits yet i could tell thee so many myself that hours would be whiled away ere all that i know had been recounted End of section 59. Recording by phone. Section 60 of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Shaman Sigfason, translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of Baldur. I would rather, said Gangler, hear something about the other Aesir. The second son of Odin, replied Har, is Baldur, and it may be truly said of him that he is the best, and that all mankind are loud in his praise. So fair and dazzling is he in form and features, that rays of light seem to issue from him, and thou mayst have some idea of the beauty of his hair when i tell thee that the whitest of all plants is called baldur's brow baldur is the mildest the wisest and the most eloquent of all the aesir yet such is his nature that the judgment he has pronounced can never be altered he dwells in the heavenly mansion called breidablik in which nothing unclean can enter end of section sixty recording by phone Section 61 of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Shaman Sigfason. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of Njord. The third god, continued Har, is Njord, who dwells in the heavenly region called Noatun. He rules over the winds, and checks the fury of the sea and of fire, and is therefore invoked by seafarers and fishermen. He is so wealthy that he can give possessions and treasures to those who call on him for them. 
yet njord is not of the lineage of the aesir for he was born and bred in vanaheim but the vanir gave him as hostage to the aesir receiving from them in his stead hoenir by this means was peace re-established by the aesir and vanir njord took to wife skadi the daughter of the giant Chiasi. she preferred dwelling in the abode formerly belonging to her father which is situated among rocky mountains in the region called trimheim but njord loved to reside near the sea they at last agreed that they should pass together nine nights in trimheim and then three in noatun one day when njord came back from the mountains to noatun he thus sang of mountains i'm weary not long was i there not more than nine nights but the howl of the wolf methought sounded ill to the song of the swan bird to which skadi sang in reply ne'er can i sleep in my couch on the strand for the screams of the sea-file the mew as he comes every morn from the main is sure to awake me skadi then returned to the rocky mountains and abode in thrymheim there fastening on her snow skates and taking her bow she passes her time in the chase of savage beasts and is called the Ondur goddess or Ondurdis, as it is said thrymheim's the land where thiassi abode that mightiest of giants but snow skating skadi now dwells there i trow in her father's old mansion end of section sixty one recording by phone Section 62 of the Elder Eddas of Siemens Sikkesen and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturesen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Siemens Sikkesen and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturesen by Siemens Sikkesen. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of the God Frey and the Goddess Freya njord had afterwards at his residence at noatun two children a son named frey and a daughter called freya both of them beauteous and mighty frey is one of the most celebrated of the gods he presides over rain and sunshine and all the fruits of the earth and should be invoked in order to obtain good harvests and also for peace he moreover dispenses wealth among men freya is the most propitious of the goddesses her abode in heaven is called folkvang to whatever field of battle she rides she asserts her right to one half of the slain the other half belonging to odin as it is said folkvang tis cold where freya hath right to dispose of the hall seats every day of the slain she chooseth the half and half leaves to odin her mansion called sesrumnir is large and magnificent thence she sallies forth in a cart drawn by two cats she lends a very favourable ear to those who sue to her for assistance. It is from her name that women of birth and fortune are called in our language Freyor. She is very fond of love ditties, and all lovers would do well to invoke her. End of section 62. Recording by phone. Section 63 of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sikvesen and the younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sikvesen and the younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Shaman Sikvesen. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of Tyr. All the gods appear to me, said Gangler to have great power and i am not at all surprised that ye are able to perform so many great achievements since ye are so well acquainted with the attributes and functions of each god and know what is befitting to ask from each in order to succeed but are there any more of them besides those you have already mentioned i answered har there is tyr who is the most daring and intrepid of all the gods tis he who dispenses valour in war hence warriors do well to invoke him it has become proverbial to say of a man who surpasses all others in valour that he is tear strong or valiant as tear a man noted for his wisdom is also said to be wise as tear let me give thee a proof of his intrepidity when the aesir were trying to persuade the wolf fenrir to let himself be bound up with the chain gleipnir 
he fearing that he would never afterwards unloose him only consented on the condition that while they were chaining him he should keep tyr's right hand between his jaws tyr did not hesitate to put his hand in the monster's mouth but when fenrir perceived that the aesir had no intention to unchain him he bit the hand off at that point which has ever since been called the wolf's joint from that time tyr has had but one hand he is not regarded as a peacemaker among men End of section 63. Recording by phone. Section 64 of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigvesen and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Shaman Sigvesen. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of the Other Gods. There is another god, continued Har, named Bragi, who is celebrated for his wisdom, and more especially for his eloquence and correct forms of speech. He is not only eminently skilled in poetry, but the art itself is called from his name Brager which epithet is also applied to denote a distinguished poet or poetess his wife is named iduna she keeps in a box the apples which the gods when they feel old age approaching have only to taste of to become young again it is in this manner that they will be kept in renovated youth until ragnarok methinks interrupted gangler the gods have committed a great treasure to the guardianship and good faith of iduna and hence it happened replied har smiling that they once ran the greatest risk imaginable as i shall have occasion to tell thee when thou hast heard the names of the other deities one of them is heimdall called also the white god he is the son of nine virgins who were sisters and is a very sacred and powerful deity he also bears the appellation of the gold toothed on account of his teeth being of pure gold and also that of Halinskiti. His horse is called Gultop, and he dwells in Himinbjörg at the end of Bifrost. He is the warder of the gods, and is therefore placed on the borders of heaven, to prevent the giants from forcing their way over the bridge. He requires less sleep than a bird, and sees by night, as well as by day, a hundred miles around him. So acute is his ear, that no sound escapes him, for he can ever hear the grass growing on the earth, and the wool on a sheep's back. He has a horn called the Gjalla horn which is heard throughout the universe his sword is called hofud head end of section 64 recording by phone section 65 of the elder eddas of shaman sigvesen and the younger eddas of snorra sturluson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigvesen and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Shaman Sigvesen. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Hodur the Blind, Assassin of Baldur. Among the Aesir, continued Har, we also reckon Hodur, who is blind, but extremely strong. Both gods and men would be very glad if they never had occasion to pronounce his name for they will long have cause to remember the deed perpetrated by his hand another god is vidar surnamed the silent who wears very thick shoes he is almost as strong as thor himself and the gods place great reliance on him in all critical conjunctures vali another god is the son of odin and rinda he is bold in war and an excellent archer another is called ulur who is the son of sif and stepson of thor he is so well skilled in the use of the bow and can go so fast on his snow skates that in these arts no one can contend with him he is also very handsome in his person and possesses every quality of a warrior wherefore it is befitting to invoke him in single combats the name of another god is forseti who is the son of baldur and nanna the daughter of nef he possesses the heavenly mansion called glitnir and all disputants at law who bring their cases before him go away perfectly reconciled his tribunal is the best that is to be found among gods or men 
End of section 65. Recording by phone. Section 66 of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturluson by Shaman Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of Loki and his Progeny. There is another deity, continued Har, reckoned in the number of the Aesir, whom some call the calumniator of the gods, the contriver of all fraud and mischief, and the disgrace of gods and men. His name is Loki or Lopter. He is the son of the giant Farbauti. His mother is Laufi or Nal. His brothers are Bailist and Helblindi. Loki is handsome and well made, but of a very fickle mood, and most evil disposition. He surpasses all beings in those arts called cunning and perfidy. Many a time he has exposed the gods to very great perils, and often extricated them again by his artifices. His wife is called Siguna, and their son Nari. Loki, continued Har, has likewise had three children by Angerbodi, a giantess of Jotunheim. The first is the wolf Fenrir, the second Jormungand, the Midgard serpent, the third Hela, death. The gods were not long ignorant that these monsters continued to be bred up in Jotunheim, and having had recourse to divination, became aware of all the evils they would have to suffer from them. Their being sprung from such a mother was a bad presage, and from such a sire was still worse. All father therefore deemed it advisable to send one of the gods to bring them to him. When they came, he threw the serpent into that deep ocean by which the earth is engirdled. But the monster has grown to such an enormous size that, Holding his tail in his mouth, he encircles the whole earth. Hela he cast into Niflheim, and gave her power over nine worlds, regions, into which she distributes those who are sent to her, that is to say, all who die through sickness or old age. Here she possesses a habitation protected by exceedingly high walls and strongly barred gates. Her hall is called Elvidnir, hunger is her table, starvation her knife, delay her man slowness her maid precipice her threshold care her bed and burning anguish forms the hangings of her apartments the one half of her body is livid the other half the colour of human flesh she may therefore easily be recognised the more so as she has a dreadfully stern and grim countenance the wolf fenrir was bred up among the gods but tear alone had the daring to go and feed him Nevertheless, when the gods perceived that he every day increased prodigiously in size, and that the oracles warned them that he would one day become fatal to them, they determined to make a very strong iron fetter for him, which they called lading. Taking this fetter to the wolf, they bade him try his strength on it. Fenrir, perceiving that the enterprise would not be very difficult for him, let them do what they pleased, and then, by great muscular exertion, burst the chain and set himself at liberty. The gods, having seen this, made another fetter, half as strong again as the former, which they called Dromi, and prevailed on the wolf to put it on, assuring him that, by breaking this, he would give an undeniable proof of his vigour. The wolf saw well enough that it would not be so easy to break this fetter, but, finding at the same time that his strength had increased since he broke Laden, and thinking that he could never become famous without running some risk, voluntarily submitted to be chained. When the gods told him that they had finished their task, Fenrir shook himself violently, stretched his limbs, rolled on the ground, and at last burst his chains, which flew in pieces all around him. He then freed himself of Dromi, which gave rise to the proverb, to get loose out of lading, or to dash out of Dromi, when anything is to be accomplished by strong efforts. End of section 66. Recording by phone. Section 67 of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturluson by Shaman Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. 
Binding the Wolf Fenrir. After this, the god despaired of ever being able to bind the wolf, wherefore Allfather sent Skirnir, the messenger of Frey, into the country of the dark elves, Svartalfaheim, to engage certain dwarfs to make the fetter called Gleipnir. It was fashioned out of six things, to wit, the noise made by the footfall of a cat, the beards of women, the roots of stones, the sinews of bears, the breath of fish, and the spittle of birds. Though thou mayest not have heard of these things before, thou mayest easily convince thyself that we have not been telling thee lies. Thou must have seen that women have no birds, that cats make no noise when they run, and that there are no roots under stones. Now I know what has been told thee to be equally true, although there may be some things thou art not able to furnish a proof of. I believe what thou hast told me to be true, replied Gangler, for what thou hast adduced in corroboration of thy statement is conceivable, but how was the fetter smithied? This I can tell thee, replied Har, that the fetter was as smooth and soft as a silken string, and yet, as thou wilt presently hear, of very great strength. When it was brought to the gods, they were profuse in their thanks to the messenger for the trouble he had given himself, and taking the wolf with them to the island called Lingvi in the lake Amsvartnir, they showed him the cord and expressed their wish that he would try to break it, assuring him at the same time that it was somewhat stronger than its thinness would warrant a person in supposing it to be. They took it themselves, one after another, in their hands, and after attempting in vain to break it, said, Thou alone, Fenrir, art able to accomplish such a feat. Methinks, replied the wolf, that I shall acquire no fame in breaking such a slender cord, but if any artifice has been employed in making it, slender though it seems, it shall never come on my feet. The gods assured him that it would easily break a limber silken cord, since he had already burst asunder iron fetters of the most solid construction. But if thou shouldst not succeed in breaking it, they added, thou wilt show that thou art too weak to cause the gods any fear, and we will not hesitate to set thee at liberty without delay. I fear me much, replied the wolf, that if you once bind me so fast that I shall be unable to free myself by my own efforts, you will be in no haste to unloose me. Loath am I, therefore, to have this cord round round me. But in order that you may not doubt my courage, I will consent, provided one of you put his hand into my mouth as a pledge that ye intend me no deceit. The gods wistfully looked at each other, and found that they had only the choice of two evils, until Tyr stepped forward and intrepidly put his right hand between the monster's jaws. Hereupon the gods, having tied up the wolf, he forcibly stretched himself, as he had formerly done, and used all his might to disengage himself, but the more efforts he made, the tighter became the cord, until all the gods, except Tyr, who lost his hand, burst into laughter at the sight. When the gods saw that the wolf was effectually bound, they took the chain called Galgia, which was fixed to the fetter, and drew it through the middle of a rock named Gjol, which they sank very deep into the earth. Afterwards, to make it still more secure, they fastened the end of the cord to a massive stone called Thviti, which they sank still deeper. The wolf made in vain the most violent efforts to break loose, and opening his tremendous jaws endeavoured to bite them. The god seeing this, thrust his sword into his mouth, which pierced his underjaw to the hilt, so that the point touched the palate. He then began to howl horribly, and since that time the foam flows continually from his mouth in such abundance that it forms the river called Vaughn. There he will remain until Ragnarok. Verily, said Gangler, an evil progeny is that of Loki, yet most mighty and powerful. But since the gods have so much to fear from the wolf, why did they not slay him? The gods have so much respect for the sanctity of their peace-steads, replied Har, that they would not stain them with the blood of the wolf, although prophecy had intimated to them that he must one day become the bane of Odin. End of section 67. Recording by Phil. Section 68 of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sukvesen and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturlsen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sikvesen and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturlsen by Shaman Sikvesen. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of the Goddesses. Tell me now, said Gangler, 
which are the goddesses the first replied har is frigga who has a magnificent mansion called fensalir the second is saga who dwells at sokvabek a very large and stately abode the third is air the best of all in the healing art the fourth named gefjon is a maid and all those who die maids become her handmaidens the fifth is fulla who is also a maid and goes about with her hair flowing over her shoulders and her head adorned with a gold ribbon she is entrusted with the toilet and slippers of frigga and admitted into the most important secret of that goddess freya is ranked next to frigga she is wedded to a person called odur and their daughter named nossa is so very handsome that whatever is beautiful and precious is called by her name nosir but odur left his wife in order to travel into the very remote countries since that time freya continually weeps and her tears are drops of pure gold she has a great variety of names for having gone over many countries in search of her husband each people gave her a different name she is thus called mardol horn geffen and seer and also vanadis she possesses the necklace Brising. the seventh goddess is shofna who delights in turning men's hearts and thoughts to love hence a wooer is called from her name shafni the eighth called lofna is so mild and gracious to those who invoke her that by a peculiar privilege which either allfather himself or frigga has given her she can remove every obstacle that may prevent the union of lovers sincerely attached to each other hence her name is applied to denote love and whatever is beloved by men Fora, the ninth goddess listens to the oaths that men take and particularly to the troth plighted between man and woman and punishes those who keep not their promises she is wise and prudent and so penetrating that nothing remains hidden from her sin the tenth keeps the door in the hall and shuts it against those who ought not to enter she presides at trials when any thing is to be denied on oath whence the proverb sin negation is set against it when aught is denied helena the eleventh has the care of those whom frigga intends to deliver from peril snotra the twelfth is wise and courteous and men and women who possess these qualities have her name applied to them gna the thirteenth is the messenger that frigga sends into the various worlds on her errands she has a horse that can run through air and water called hofbarnir once as she drove out certain vanir saw her car in the air and one of them exclaimed what flieth there what goeth there in the air aloft what glideth she answered i fly not though i go and glide through the air on hofvartnir who sires hamskerpir and dam gartrofa sol and bill are also reckoned among the goddesses but their nature has already been explained to thee there are besides these a great many other goddesses whose duty it is to serve in valhalla to bear in the drink and take care of the drinking horns and whatever belongs to the table they are named in Grimnismal and are called Valkyrjor. Odin sends them to every field of battle to make choice of those who are to be slain and to sway the victory. Gudur, Rota, and the youngest of the Norns, Skuld, also ride forth to choose the slain and turn the combat. Jord, Earth, the mother of Thor, and Rinda, the mother of Vali, are also reckoned among the goddesses. End of section 68. Recording by phone. Section 69 of the Elder Eddas of Shaman Sikvesen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shaman Sikvesen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Shaman Sikvesen. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of Frey and Gerda. There was a man, continued Har, named Gimir, who had for wife Arboda, of the race of the mountain giants. Their daughter is Gerda, who is the most beautiful of all women. One day, Frey having placed himself in Fieskjalf, to take a view of the whole universe, perceived, as he looked towards the north, a large and stately mansion which a woman was going to enter, and as she lifted up the latch of the door so great a radiancy was thrown from her hand, that the air and waters and all worlds were illuminated by it 
at this sight frey as a just punishment for his audacity in mounting on that sacred throne was struck with sudden sadness insomuch so that on his return home he could neither speak nor sleep nor drink nor did any one dare to inquire the cause of his affliction but njord at last sent for skirnir the messenger of frey and charged him to demand of his master why he thus refused to speak to any one skirnir promised to do this though with great reluctance fearing that all he had to expect was a severe reprimand he however went to frey and asked him boldly why he was so sad and silent frey answered that he had seen a maiden of such surpassing beauty that if he could not possess her he should not live much longer and that this was what rendered him so melancholy go therefore he added and ask her hand for me and bring her here whether her father be willing or not and i will amply reward thee skirnir undertook to perform the task provided he might be previously put in possession of frey's sword which was of such excellent quality that it would of itself strew a field with carnage whenever the owner ordered it frey impatient of delay immediately made him a present of the sword and skirnir set out on his journey and obtained the maiden's promise that within nine nights she would come to a place called barry and there wed frey skirnir having reported the success of his message frey exclaimed long as one night long are two nights but how shall i hold out three shorter hath seemed a month to me oft than oft is longing time the half frey having thus given away his sword found himself without arms when he fought with bailey and hence it was that he slew him with a stag's antlers but it seems very astonishing interrupted gangder that such a brave hero as frey should give away his sword without keeping another equally good for himself he must have been in a very bad plight when he encountered bailey and methinks must have mightily repented him of the gift that combat replied har was a trifling affair frey could have killed bailey with a blow of his fist had he felt inclined but the time will come when the sons of muspel shall issue forth to the fight and then indeed will frey truly regret having parted with his falchion end of section sixty nine recording by phone Section 70 of the Elder Eddas of Shimon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Elder Eddas of Shimon Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorra Sturluson by Shimon Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of the Joys of Valhalla if it be as thou hast told me said gangler that all men who have fallen in fight since the beginning of the world are gone to odin in valhalla what has he to give them to eat for methinks there must be a great crowd there what thou sayest is quite true replied har the crowd there is indeed great but great though it be it will still increase and will be thought too little when the wolf cometh but however great the band of men in valhalla may be the flesh of the boar Seremnir will more than suffice for their sustenance. For although this boar is sodden every morning, he becomes whole again every night. But there are a few, methinks, who are wise enough to give thee, in this respect, a satisfactory answer to thy question. The cook is called Andrimnir, and the kettle Eldrimnir. As it is said, Andrimnir cooks in Eldrimnir, Seremnir. Tis the best of flesh, though few know how much is required for the Einherjar but has odin said gangler the same food as the heroes odin replied har gives the meat that is set before him to two wolves called geri and freki for he himself stands in no need of food wine is for him both meat and drink two ravens sit on odin's shoulders and whisper in his ear the tidings and events they have heard and witnessed they are called hugin and munin he sends them out at dawn of day to fly over the whole world and they return at eve towards meal-time hence it is that odin knows so many things and is called the raven's god as it is said hugin and munin each dawn take their flight earth fields over i fear me for hugin lest he come not back but much more for munin what have the heroes to drink said gangler in sufficient quantity to correspond to their plentiful supply of meat do they only drink water 
a very silly question is that replied har dost thou imagine that all father would invite kings and jarls and other great men and give them nothing to drink but water in that case methinks many of those who had endured the greatest hardships and received deadly wounds in order to obtain access to valhalla would find that they had paid too great a price for their water drink and would indeed have reason to complain were they there to meet with no better entertainment but thou wilt see that the case is quite otherwise for the she-goat named hydron stands above valhalla and feeds on the leaves of a very famous tree called lerath and from her teats flows mead in such great abundance that every day a stoop large enough to hold more than would suffice for all the heroes is filled with it verily said gangler a mighty useful goat is this and methinks the tree she feeds on must have very singular virtues still more wonderful replied har is what is told of the stag eikdjernir this stag also stands over valhalla and feeds upon the leaves of the same tree and whilst he is feeding so many drops fall from his antlers down into hvergelmir that they furnish sufficient water for the rivers that issuing thence flow through the celestial abodes wondrous things are these which thou tellest me of said gangler and valhalla must needs be an immense building but methinks there must often be a great press at the door among such a number of people constantly thronging in and out why dost thou not ask replied har how many doors there are and what are their dimensions then wouldst thou be able to judge whether there is any difficulty in going in and out know then that there is no lack of either seats or doors as it is said in Grimnismal, five hundred doors and forty more methinks are in valhalla eight hundred heroes through each door shall issue forth against the wolf to combat a mighty band of men must be in valhalla said gangler and methinks odin must be a great chieftain to command such a numerous host but how do the heroes pass their time when they are not drinking every day replied har as soon as they have dressed themselves they ride out into the court or field and there fight until they cut each other to pieces this is their pastime but when mealtime approaches they remount their steeds and return to drink in valhalla as it is said the einherja all on odin's plain hew daily with each other while chosen the slain are from the fray they then ride and drink ill with the aesir thou hast thus reason to say that odin is great and mighty for there are many proofs of this as it is said in the very words of the aesir the ash yggdrasil is the first of trees as skidbladnir of ships odin of aesir sleipnir of steeds bifrost of bridges bragi of bards habrok of hawks and garm of hounds end of section seventy recording by phone Section 71 of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fatima Ansari, from the beautiful land of Kashmir. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by simon sigfusen translated by rasmus b anderson of the horse sleipnir thou madest mention said gangler of the horse sleipnir to whom does he belong and what is there to say respecting him thou seemest to know nothing either about sleipnir or his origin replied har but thou wilt no doubt find what thou wilt hear worthy of thy notice once on a time when the gods were constructing their abodes and had already finished midgard and valhalla a certain artificer came and offered to build them in the space of three half years a residence so well fortified that they should be perfectly safe from the incursion of the frost giants and the giants of the mountains even although they should have penetrated within midgard but he demanded for his reward the goddess freya together with the sun and the moon after long deliberation the aesir agreed to his terms provided he would finish the whole work himself without any one's assistance and all within the space of one winter but if anything remained unfinished on the first day of summer 
he should forfeit the recompense agreed on. On being told these terms, the artificer stipulated that he should be allowed the use of his horse, called Svadilfari, and this, by the advice of Loki, was granted to him. He accordingly set to work on the first day of winter, and, during the night, let his horse draw stone for the building. The enormous size of the stone struck the Aesir with astonishment, and they saw clearly that the horse did one half more of the toilsome work than his master. Their bargain, however, had been concluded in the presence of witnesses, and confirmed by solemn oaths, for without these precautions a giant would not have thought himself safe among the Aesir, especially when Thor returned from an expedition he had then undertaken towards the east against evil demons. As the winter drew to a close, the building was far advanced, and the bulwarks were sufficiently high and massive to render this residence impregnable. In short, when it wanted but three days to summer, the only part that remained to be finished was the gateway. Then sat the gods on their seats of justice and entered into consultation, inquiring of one another who among them could have advised to give Freya away to Jotunheim or to plunge the heavens in darkness by permitting the giant to carry away the sun and moon. They all agreed that no one but Loki, the son of Loife, and the author of so many evil deeds could have given such bad counsel, and that he should be put to a cruel death if he did not contrive some way or other to prevent the artificer from completing his task in obtaining the stipulated recompense. They immediately proceeded to lay hands on Loki, who, in his fright, promised upon oath that let it cost him what it would, he would so manage matters that the man should lose his reward. That very night, when the artificer went with Svadilfari for building stone, a mare suddenly ran out of a forest and began to neigh. The horse, being thus excited, broke loose and ran after the mare into the forest which obliged the man to run after his horse. And thus, between one and the other, the whole night was lost, so that at dawn the work had not made the usual progress. The man, seeing that he had no other means of completing his task, resumed his own gigantic stature, and the gods now clearly perceived that it was in reality a mountain giant who had come amongst them. No longer regarding their oaths, they therefore called on Thor, who immediately ran to their assistance, and lifting up his mallet, Mjolnir, paid the workman his wages, not with the sun and moon, and not even by sending him back to Jotunheim, for with the first blow he shattered the giant's skull to pieces, and hurled him headlong into Nifalhel. But Loki had run such a race with Svadilfari that shortly after he bore a grey foal with eight legs. This is the horse Sleipnir, which excels all horses ever possessed by gods or men. End of section 71。section 72 of the Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fatima Ansari, from the beautiful land of Kashmir. The Elder Eddas of Simon Sigfusen and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson, by Simon Sigfusen. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of the ship Skidbladnir. What hast thou to say? demanded Gangler of Skidbladnir, which thou toldest me was the best of ships. Is there no other ship as good or as large? Skidbladnir, replied Har, is without doubt the best and most artfully constructed of any. But the ship Nagfar is of larger size. They were dwarfs, the sons of Ivaldi who built Skidbladnir, and made a present of her to Frey. She is so large that all the Aesir with their weapons and war stores find room on board her. As soon as the sails are set, 
a favorable breeze arises and carries her to her place of destination and she is made of so many pieces and with so much skill that when she is not wanted for a voyage frey may fold her together like a piece of cloth and put her in his pocket a good ship truly is skidbladnir said gangler and many cunning contrivances and spells must no doubt have been used in her construction end of section seventy two Section 73 of the Elder Edas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Edas of Snor Sturlson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Edas of Simon Sigfusson and the Younger Edas of Snor Sturlson by Simon Sigfusson, translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Thor's adventures on his journey to the land of the giants. But tell me, he, Gangler, continued, did it ever happen to Thor in his expeditions to be overcome either by spells or by downright force? Few can take upon them to affirm this replied Har, and yet it has often fared hard enough with him, but had he in reality been worsted in any rencounter, there would be no need to make mention of it, since all are bound to believe that nothing can resist his power. It would, therefore, appear, said Gangler, that I have asked of you things that none of you are able to tell me of, there are indeed some such rumors current among us, answered Jafnar, but they are hardly credible. However, there is one sitting here can impart them to thee, and thou shouldst the rather believe him, for never having yet uttered an untruth, he will not now begin to deceive thee with false stories. Here then will I stand, said Gangler and listen to what ye have to say, but if ye cannot answer my question satisfactorily, I shall look upon you as vanquished. Then spoke Thridi and said, We can easily conceive that thou art desirous of knowing these tidings, but it behooves thee to guard a becoming silence respecting them. The story I have to relate is this. One day the god Thor set out in his car drawn by two he-goats and accompanied by loki on a journey night coming on they put up at a peasant's cottage where thor killed his goats and after flaying them put them in the cattle when the flesh was sodden he sat down with his fellow traveller to supper and invited the peasant and his family to partake of his repast the peasant's son was named Salvi, and his daughter Roska. Thor bade them throw all the bones into the goat's skins, which were spread out near the fireplace. But young Thialfi broke one of the shank bones with his knife to come to the marrow. Thor, having passed the night in the cottage, rose at the dawn of day, and when he was dressed, took his mallet, Mjolnir, and lifting it up, consecrated the goat's skins, which he had no sooner done, than the two goats reassumed their wonted form. Only that one of them now limped on one of its hind legs. Thor, perceiving this, said that the peasant, or one of his family, had handled the shank bone of this goat too roughly for he saw clearly that it was broken it may readily be imagined how frightened the peasant was when he saw thorn knit his brows and grasp the handle of his mallet with such force that the joints of his fingers became white from the exertion fearing to be struck down by the very looks of the god 
the peasant and his family made joint suit for pardon offering whatever they possessed as an atonement for the offence committed thor seeing their fear desisted from his wrath and became more placable and finally contented himself by requiring the peasant's children thialfi and roska who became his bond servants and have followed him ever since leaving his goats with the peasant thor proceeded eastward on the road to jotunheim until he came to the shores of a vast and deep sea which having passed over he penetrated into a strange country along with his companions loki thialfi and roska they had not gone far before they saw before them an immense forest through which they wandered all day thialfi was of all men the swiftest of foot he bore thor's wallet but the forest was a bad place for finding anything eatable to stow in it when it became dark they searched on all sides for a place where they might pass the night and at last came to a very large hall with an entrance that took up the whole breadth of one of the ends of the building here they chose them a place to sleep in but towards midnight were alarmed by an earthquake which shook the whole edifice thor rising up called on his companions to seek with him a place of safety on the right they found an adjoining chamber into which they entered but while the others trembling with fear crept into the furthest corner of this retreat thor remained at the doorway with his mallet in his hand prepared to defend himself whatever might happen a terrible groaning was heard during the night and at dawn of day thor went out and observed lying near him a man of enormous bulk who slept and snored pretty loudly thor could now account for the noise they had heard overnight and girding on his belt of prowess increased that divine strength which he now stood in need of the giant awakening rose up and it is said that for once in his life thor was afraid to make use of his mallet and contented himself by simply asking the giant his name my name is skrimir said the other but i need not ask thy name for i know thou art the god thor but what hast thou done with my glove and stretching out his hand skrimir picked up his glove which thor then perceived was what they had taken overnight for a hall the chamber where they had sought refuge being the thumb skrimir then asked whether they would have his fellowship and thor consenting the giant opened his wallet and began to eat his breakfast thor and his companions having also taken their morning repast though in another place skrimir proposed that they should lay their provisions together which thor also assented to the giant then put all the meat into one wallet which he slung on his back and went before them taking tremendous strides the whole day and at dusk sought out for them a place where they might pass the night under a large oak tree skrimir then told them that he would lie down to sleep but take ye the wallet he added and prepare your supper skrimir soon fell asleep and began to snore strongly but incredible though it may appear it must nevertheless be told that when thor came to open the wallet he could not untie a single knot nor render a single string looser than it was before seeing that his labor was in vain thor became wroth and grasping his mallet with both hands while he advanced a step forward launched it at the giant's head skrimir awakening merely asked whether a leaf had not fallen on his head and whether they had supped and were ready to go to sleep thor answered that they were just going to sleep and so saying 
went and let himself down under another oak tree but sleep came not that night to thor and when he remarked that skrymir snored again so loud that the forest re-echoed with the noise he arose and grasping his mallet launched it with such force that it sunk into the giant's skull up to the handle skrymir awakening cried out what's the matter did an acorn fall in my, on my head how fares it with thee thor but thor went away hastily saying that he had just then awoke and that as it was only midnight there was still time for sleep he however resolved that if he had an opportunity of striking a third blow it should settle all matters between them a little before daybreak he perceived that skrymir was again fast asleep and again grasping his mallet dashed it with such violence that it forced its way into the giant's cheek up to the handle but skrymir sat up and stroking his cheek said are there any birds perched on this tree methought when i awoke some moss from the branches fell on my head what art thou awake thor methinks it is time for us to get up and dress ourselves but you have not now a long way before you to the city called utgard i have heard you whispering to one another that i am not a man of small dimensions but if you come into utgard you will see there are many men much taller than myself wherefore i advise you when you come there not to make too much of yourselves for the followers of utgard loki will not brook the boasting of such mannequins as you are the best thing you could do would probably be to turn back again but if you persist in going on take the road that leads eastward for mine now lies northward to those rocks which you may see in the distance hereupon he threw his wallet over his shoulders and turned away from them into the forest and i could never hear that thor wished to meet with him a second time thor and his companions proceeded on their way and towards noon descried a city standing in the middle of a plain it was so lofty that they were obliged to bend their necks quite back on their shoulders ere they could see to the top of it on arriving at the walls they found the gateway closed with a gate of bars strongly locked and bolted thor after trying in vain to open it crept with his companions through the bars and thus succeeded in gaining admission into the city seeing a large palace before them with the door wide open they went in and found a number of men of prodigious stature sitting on benches in the hall going further they came before the king utgard loki whom they saluted with great respect their salutations were however returned by a contemptuous look from the king who after regarding them for some time said with a scornful smile it is tedious to ask for tidings of a long journey yet if i do not mistake me that stripling there must be a thor perhaps he added addressing himself to thor thou mayst be taller than thou appearest to be but what are the feats that thou and thy fellows deem yourselves skilled in for no one is permitted to remain here who does not in some feat or other excel all other men the feat i know replied loki is to eat quicker than anyone else and in this i am ready to give a proof against anyone here who may choose to compete with me that will indeed be a feat said utgar loki if thou performest what thou promisest and it shall be tried forthwith he then ordered one of his men who was sitting at the further end of the bench and whose name was logi to come forward and try his skill with loki a trough filled with flesh meat 
having been set on the hall floor loki placed himself at one hand and logi at the other and each of them began to eat as fast as he could until they met in the middle of the trough but it was found that loki had only eaten the flesh whereas his adversary had devoured both flesh and bone and the trowel to boot all the company therefore adjudged that loki was vanquished utgard loki then asked what feat the young man who accompanied thor could perform thialfi answered that he would run a race with any one who might be matched against him the king observed that skill in running was something to boast of but that if the youth would win the match he must display great agility he then arose and went with all who were present to a plain where there was a good ground for running on and calling a young man named huggy bade him run a match with thialfi in the first course huggy so much outstripped his competitor that he turned back and met him not far from the starting place thou must ply thy legs better thialfi said utgard loki if thou wilt win the match though i must needs say that there never came a man here swift of foot than thou art in the second course thialfi was a full bow shot from the goal when huggy arrived at it most bravely dost thou run thialfi said utgard loki though thou wilt not methinks win the match but the third course must decide they accordingly ran a third time but huggy had already reached the goal before thialfi had got half away all who were present then cried out that there had been a sufficient trial of skill in this kind of exercise utgar loki then asked thor in what feats he would choose to give proofs of that dexterity for which he was so famous thor replied that he would begin a drinking match with any one utgard loki consented and entering the palace bade his cup-bearer bring the large horn which his followers were obliged to drink out of when they had trespassed in any way against established usage the cup-bearer having presented it to thor utgard loki said whoever is a good drinker will empty that horn at a single draught though some men make two of it but the most puny drinker of all can do it at three thor looked at the horn which seemed of no extraordinary size though somewhat long however as he was very thirsty he set it to his lips and without drawing breath pulled it as long and as deeply as he could that he might not be obliged to make a second draught of it but when he set the horn down and looked in he could scarcely perceive that the liquor was diminished tis well drunken exclaimed utgar loki though nothing much to boast of and i would not have believed it had been told me that asa thor could not have taken a greater draught but thou no doubt meanest to make amends at the second pull thor without answering went to it again with all his might but when he took the horn from his mouth it seemed to him as if he had drunk rather less than before although the horn could now be carried without spilling how now thor said utgar loki thou must not spare thyself more in performing a feat than befits thy skill but if thou meanest to drain the horn at the third draught thou must pull deeply and i must needs say that thou wilt not be called so mighty a man here as thou art among the azure 
if thou showest no greater prowess in other feats than methinks will be shown in this thor full of wrath again set the horn to his lips and exerted himself to the utmost to empty it entirely but on looking and found that the liquor was only a little lower upon which he resolved to make no further attempt but gave back the horn to the cup-bearer i now see plainly said utgar loki that thou art not quite so stout as we thought thee but wilt thou try any other feat though methinks thou art not likely to bear any prize away with thee hence i will try another feat replied thor and i am sure such draughts as i have been drinking would not have been reckoned small among the Azir. but what new trial hast thou to propose we have a very trifling game here answered utgard loki in which we exercise none but children it consists in merely lifting my cat from the ground nor should i have dared to mention such a feat to other thor if i had not already observed that thou art by no means what we took thee for as he finished speaking a large gray cat sprung on the hall floor thor advancing put his hand under the cat's belly and did his utmost to raise him from the floor but the cat bending his back had notwithstanding all thor's efforts only one of his feet lifted up seeing which thor made no further attempt this trial has turned out said utgard loki just as i imagined it would the cat is large but thor is little in comparison to our men little as ye call me answered thor let me see who amongst you will come hither now i am in wrath and wrestle with me i see no one here said utgar loki looking at the men sitting on the benches who would not think it beneath him to wrestle with thee let somebody however call hither that old crone my nurse eli and let thor wrestle with her if he will she has thrown to the ground many a man not less strong and mighty than this thor is a toothless old woman then entered the hall and was told by utgar loki to take hold of thor the tale is shortly told the more thor tightened his hold on the crone the firmer she stood at length after a very violent struggle thor began to lose his footing and was finally brought down upon one knee utgar loki then told them to desist adding that thor had now no occasion to ask anyone else in the hall to wrestle with him and it was also getting late he therefore showed thor and his companions to their seats and they passed the night there in good cheer the next morning at break of day thor and his companions dressed themselves and prepared for their departure utgard loki then came and ordered a table to be set for them on which there was no lack either of victuals or drink after the repast utgard loki led them to the gate of the city and on parting asked thor how he thought his journey had turned out and whether he had met with any man stronger than himself thor told him that he could not deny but that he had brought great shame on himself and what grieves me most he added is that ye will call me a man of little worth nay said utgar loki it behooves me to tell thee the truth now thou art out of the city which so long as i live and have my way thy shalt never re-enter and by my troth had i known beforehand that thou hadst so much strength in thee and wouldst have brought me so near to a great mishap i would not have suffered thee to enter this time know then that i have all along deceived thee by my illusions 
first in the forest where i arrived before thee and there thou wert not able to untie the wallet because i had bound it with iron wire in such a manner that thou couldst not discover how the knot ought to be loosened after this thou gavest me three blows with thy mallet the first though the least would have ended my days had it fallen on me but i brought a rocky mountain before me which thou didst not perceive and in this mountain thou wilt find three glens one of them remarkably deep these are the dints made by thy mallet i have made use of similar illusions in the contests ye have had with my followers in the first loki like hunger itself devoured all that was set before him but loki was in reality nothing else than ardent fire and therefore consumed not only the meat but the trowel which held it huggy with whom thialfi contended in running was thought and it was impossible for thialfi to keep pace with that when thou in thy turn didst try to empty the horn thou didst perform by my troth a deed so marvellous that had i not seen it myself i should never have believed it for one end of that horn reached the sea which thou wast not aware of but when thou comest to the shore thou wilt perceive how much the sea has sunk by thy draughts which have caused what is now called the ebb thou didst perform a feat no less wonderful by lifting up the cat and to tell thee the truth when we saw that one of his paws was off the floor we were all of us terror-stricken for what thou tookest for a cat was in reality the great midgard serpent that encompassed the whole earth and he was then barely long enough to enclose it between his head and tail so high had thy hand raised him up towards heaven thy wrestling with eli was also a most astonishing feat for there was never yet a man nor ever shall be whom old age for such in fact was eli will not sooner or later lay low if he abide her coming but now as we are going to part let me tell thee that it will be better for both of us if thou never come near me again for shouldst thou do so i shall again defend myself by other illusions so that thou wilt never prevail against me on hearing these words thor in a rage laid hold of his mallet and would have launched it at him but utgard loki had disappeared and when thor would have returned to the city to destroy it he found nothing around him but a verdant plain proceeding therefore in his way he returned without stopping to thrudvang but he had already resolved to make that attack on the midgard serpent which afterwards took place i trust concluded thridi that thou wilt now acknowledge that no one can tell thee truer tidings than those thou hast heard respecting this journey of thor to jutenheim end of section seventy three section number seventy four of the elder eddas of simon sigfusen and the younger eddas of snorra sturlason this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jeff burke the elder eddas of simon sigfusen and the younger eddas of snorra sturlason by simon sigfusen translated by rasmus b anderson how thor went to fish for the midgard serpent i find by your account said gangler that utgard loki possesses great might in himself though he has recourse to spells and illusions 
but his power may be seen by his followers being in every respect so skilful and dexterous but tell me did thor ever avenge this affront it is not unknown replied har though nobody has talked of it that thor was determined to make amends for the journey just spoken of and he had not been long at home ere he set out again so hastily that he had neither his car nor his goats nor any followers with him he went out of midgard under the semblance of a young man and came at dusk to the dwelling of a giant called himir here thor passed the night but at break of day when he perceived that himir was making his boat ready for fishing he arose and dressed himself and begged the giant would let him row out to sea with him himir answered that a puny stripling like he was could be of no great use to him besides he added thou wilt catch thy death of cold if i go so far out and remain so long as i am accustomed to do thor said that for all that he would row as far from the land as himir had a mind and was not sure which of them would be the first who might wish to row back again at the same time he was so enraged that he felt sorely inclined to let his mallet ring on the giant's skull without further delay but intending to try his strength elsewhere he stifled his wrath and asked himir what he meant to bait with himir told him to look out for a bait himself thor instantly went up to a herd of oxen that belonged to the giant and seizing the largest bull that bore the name of himinbriot wrung off his head and returning with it to the boat put out to sea with himir thor rowed aft with two oars and with such force that himir who rowed at the prow saw with surprise how swiftly the boat was driven forward he then observed that they were come to the place where he was wont to angle for flatfish but thor assured him that they had better go on a good way further they accordingly continued to ply their oars until himir cried out that if they did not stop they would be in danger from the great midgard serpent notwithstanding this thor persisted in rowing further and in spite of himir's remonstrances was a great while before he would lay down his oars he then took out a fishing line extremely strong furnished with an equally strong hook on which he fixed the bull's head and cast his line into the sea the bait soon reached the bottom and it may be truly said that thor then deceived the midgard serpent not a whit less than utgard loki had deceived thor when he obliged him to lift up the serpent in his hand for the monster greedily caught at the bait and the hook stuck fast in his pallet stung with a pain the serpent tugged at the hook so violently that thor was obliged to hold it fast with both hands by the pegs that bear against the oars but his wrath now waxed high and assuming all his divine power he pulled so hard at the line that his feet forced their way through the boat and went down to the bottom of the sea whilst with his hands he drew up the serpent to the side of the vessel it is impossible to express by words the dreadful scene that now took place thor on one hand darting looks of ire at the serpent while the monster rearing his head spouted out floods of venom upon him it is said that when the giant himir beheld the serpent he turned pale and trembled with fright and seeing moreover that the water was entering his boat on all sides he took out his knife just as thor raised his mallet aloft and cut the line on which the serpent sunk again under the water thor however launched his mallet at him and there are some who say that it struck off the monster's head at the bottom of the sea but one may assert with more certainty that he still lives and lies in the ocean thor then struck himir such a blow with his fist nigh the ear that the giant fell headlong into the water and thor wading with rapid strides soon came to the land again end of section seventy four Section 75 of the Elder Eddas of Saemon Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. The Elder Eddas of Saemon Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorre Sturluson by Saemon Sigfason. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. The Death of Baldur the Good. Verily, said Gangler, 
It was a famous exploit which Thor performed on that journey. But did any other such events take place among the Aesir? Ay, replied Har, I can tell thee of another event which the Aesir deemed of much greater importance. Thou must know, therefore, that Baldur the Good, having been tormented with terrible dreams indicating that his life was in great peril, communicated them to the assembled Aesir, who resolved to conjure all things to avert from him the threatened danger. Then Frigga exacted an oath from fire and water, from iron and all other metals, as well as from stones, earths, diseases, beasts, birds, poisons, and creeping things, that none of them would do any harm to Baldur. When this was done, it became a favorite pastime of the Asir at their meetings, to get Baldur to stand up and serve them as a mark, some hurling darts at him, some stones, while others hewed at him with their swords and battle-axes, for do they what they would, none of them could harm him. And this was regarded by all as a great honor shown to Baldur. But when Loki, the son of Lofi, beheld the scene, he was sorely vexed that Baldur was not hurt. Assuming, therefore, the shape of a woman, he went to Fenselir, the mansion of Frigga. That goddess, when she saw the pretended woman, inquired of her if she knew what the Aesir were doing at their meetings. She replied that they were throwing darts and stones at Baldur without being able to hurt him. Ay, said Frigga, neither metal nor wood can hurt Baldur, for I have exacted an oath from all of them. What? exclaimed the woman. Have all things sworn to spare Baldur? All things, replied Frigga, except one little shrub that grows on the eastern side of Valhalla, and is called mistletoe, and which I thought too young and feeble to crave an oath from. As soon as Loki heard this, he went away, and resuming his natural shape, cut off the mistletoe, and repaired to the place where the gods were assembled. There he found Hodur standing apart, without partaking of the sports, on account of his blindness, and going up to him said, Why dost thou not also throw something at Baldur? Because I am blind, answered Hodur, and see not where Baldur is, and have moreover nothing to throw with. Come then, said Loki, do like the rest, and show honour to Baldur by throwing this twig at him, and I will direct thy arm toward the place where he stands. Hodur then took the mistletoe, and under the guidance of Loki darted it at Baldur, who pierced through and through, fell down lifeless. Surely never was there witnessed, either among gods or men, a more atrocious deed than this. When Baldur fell, the Aesir were struck speechless with horror, and then they looked at each other, and all were of one mind to lay hands on him who had done the deed, but they were obliged to delay their vengeance out of respect for the sacred place, peace stead, where they were assembled. They at length gave vent to their grief by loud lamentations, though not one of them could find words to express the poignancy of his feelings. Odin especially was more sensible than the others of the loss they had suffered, for he foresaw what a detriment Baldur's death would be to the Aesir. When the gods came to themselves, Frigga asked who among them wished to gain all her love and good will. For this, said she, shall he have who will ride to Hel and try to find Baldur and offer Hela a ransom if she will let him return to Asgard. Whereupon Hermod, surnamed the Nimble, the son of Odin, offered to undertake the journey. Odin's horse Sleipner was then led forth, on which Hermod mounted, and galloped away on his mission. The Asir then took the dead body and bore it to the seashore, where stood Baldur's ship Ringhorn, which passed for the largest in the world. But when they wanted to launch it in order to make Baldur's funeral pile on it, they were unable to make it stir. In this conjecture they sent to Jotunheim for a certain giantess named Rokin, who came mounted on a wolf, having twisted serpents for a bridle. As soon as she alighted, 
Odin ordered four berserkir to hold her steed fast, who were, however, obliged to throw the animal on the ground, ere they could effect their purpose. Hyrokin then went to the ship, and with a single push set it afloat, but the motion was so violent that the fire sparkled from the rollers and the earth shook all around. Thor, enraged at the sight, grasped his mallet, and but for the interference of the Aser would have broken the woman's skull. Baldur's body was then borne to the funeral pile on board the ship, and this ceremony had such an effect on Nanna, the daughter of Nep, that her heart broke with grief, and her body was burnt on the same pile with her husband's. Thor then stood up and hallowed the pile with Mjolnir, and during the ceremony kicked a dwarf named Litur, who was running before his feet, into the fire. There was a vast concourse of various kinds of people at Baldur's obsequies. First came Odin, accompanied by Frigga, the Valkyr and his ravens. Then Frey in his car drawn by a boar named Golin Bursty, or Slidrug Tanny. Heimdall rode his horse named Gultop, and Freya drove in her chariot drawn by cats. There were also a great many frost giants and giants of the mountains present. Odin laid on the pile the gold ring called Draupnir, which afterwards acquired the property of producing each ninth night eight rings of equal weight. Baldur's horse was led to the pile fully caparisoned, and consumed in the same flames as the body of his master. End of section 75 Section 76 of the Elder Eddas of Saman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Saman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Saman Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Baldur in the Abode of the Dead. Meanwhile, Hermod was proceeding on his mission. For the space of nine days and as many nights, he rode through deep glens so dark that he could not discern anything until he arrived at the river Yol, which he passed over on a bridge covered with glittering gold. Modgudur, the maiden who kept the bridge, asked him his name and lineage telling him that the day before five bands of dead persons had ridden over the bridge, and did not shake it as much as he alone. But, she added, thou hast not death's hue on thee. Why then ridest them here on the way to hell? I ride to hell, answered Hermod, to seek Baldur. Hast thou perchance seen him pass this way? Baldur, she replied, hath ridden over Jarl's bridge. But there below, towards the north, lies the way to the abodes of death. Hermod then pursued his journey until he came to the barred gates of hell. Here he alighted, girthed his saddle tighter, and, remounting, clapped both spurs to his horse, who cleared the gate by a tremendous leap without touching it. Hermod then rode on to the palace, where he found his brother Baldur occupying the most distinguished seat in the hall, and passed the night in his company. The next morning he besought Hela, death, to let Baldur ride home with him, assuring her that nothing but lamentations were to be heard among the gods. Hela answered that it should now be tried whether Baldur was so beloved as he was said to be. If, therefore, she added, all things in the world, both living and lifeless, weep for him, then shall he return to the Aesir. But if any one thing speak against him, or refuse to weep, he shall be kept in hell. Hermod then rose, and Baldur led him out of the hall, and gave him the ring Draupnir, to present as a keepsake to Odin. Nana also sent Frigga a linen cassock and other gifts, and to Fulla a gold fingering. Hermod then rode back to Asgard, and gave an account of all he had heard and witnessed. 
the gods upon this dispatched messengers throughout the world to beg everything to weep in order that baldur might be delivered from hell all things very willingly complied with this request both men and other living beings as well as earths and stones and trees and metals just as thou must have seen these things weep when they are brought from a cold place into a hot one as the messengers were returning with the conviction that their mission had been quite successful they found an old hag named thaukt sitting in a cavern and begged her to weep baldur out of hell it was strongly suspected that this hag was no other than loki himself who never ceased to work evil among the Asir. End of section 76section seventy seven of the elder eddas of Samen sigvason and the younger eddas of snorri sturluson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the elder eddas of Samen sigvason and the younger eddas of snorri sturluson by Samen sigvason translated by rasmus b anderson the flight and punishment of loki evil are the deeds of loki truly said gangler first of all in his having caused baldur to be slain and then preventing him from being delivered out of hell but was he not punished for these crimes ay replied har and in such a manner that he will long repent having committed them when he perceived how exasperated the gods were he fled and hid himself in the mountains. There he built him a dwelling with four doors, so that he could see everything that passed around him. Often in the daytime he assumed the likeness of a salmon, and concealed himself under the waters of a cascade named Frannangursfors, where he employed himself in divining and circumventing whatever stratagems the Aesir might have recourse to in order to catch him one day as he sat in his dwelling he took flax and yarn and worked them into meshes in the manner that nets have since been made by fishermen odin however had descried his retreat out of lidskjalf and loki becoming aware that the gods were approaching threw his net into the fire and ran to conceal himself in the river when the gods entered the house Kvasir, who was the most distinguished among them all for his quickness and penetration, traced out in the hot embers the vestiges of the net which had been burnt, and told Odin that it must be an invention to catch fish. Whereupon they set to work, and wove a net after the model they saw imprinted in the ashes. This net, when finished, they threw into the river in which Loki had hidden himself, Thor held one end of the net, and all the other gods laid hold of the other end, thus jointly drawing it along the stream. Notwithstanding all their precautions, the net passed over Loki, who had crept between two stones, and the gods only perceived that some living thing had touched the meshes. They therefore cast their net a second time, hanging so great a weight to it that it everywhere raked the bed of the river but loki perceiving that he had but a short distance from the sea swam onwards and leapt over the net into the waterfall the asir instantly followed him and divided themselves into two bands thor wading along in midstream followed the net whilst the others dragged it along towards the sea loki then perceived that he had only two chances of escape either to swim out to sea or to leap again over the net he chose the latter, but as he took a tremendous leap, Thor caught him in his hand. Being, however, extremely slippery, he would have escaped, had not Thor held him fast by the tail. And this is the reason why salmons have had their tails ever since so fine and thin. The gods, having thus captured Loki, dragged him without commiseration into a cavern, wherein they placed three sharp-pointed rocks, boring a hole through each of them. Having also seized Loki's children, Vali and Nari, they changed the former into a wolf, 
and in this likeness he tore his brother to pieces and devoured him. The gods then made cords of his intestines, with which they bound Loki on the points of the rocks, one cord passing under his shoulders, another under his loins, and a third under his hams, and afterwards transformed these cords into thongs of iron. Skadi then suspended a serpent over him in such a manner that the venom should fall on his face, drop by drop. But Siguna, his wife, stands by him, and receives the drops as they fall in a cup, which she empties as often as it is filled. But while she is doing this, venom falls upon Loki, which makes him howl with horror, and twist his body about so violently that the whole earth shakes, and this produces what men call earthquakes. There will Loki lie until Ragnarok. End of section 77、section、78 of the Elder Eddas of Saman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Saman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Saman Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Of Ragnarok, or the Twilight of the Gods and the Conflagration of the Universe. I have not heard of Ragnarok, said Gangler. What hast thou to tell me about it? There are many very notable circumstances concerning it, replied Har, which I can inform thee of. In the first place will come the winter, called Fimble Winter, during which snow will fall from the four corners of the world, the frosts will be very severe, the wind piercing, the weather tempestuous, and the sun impart no gladness. Three such winters shall pass away without being tempered by a single summer. Three other similar winters follow, during which war and discord will spread over the whole globe. Brethren, for the sake of mere gain, shall kill each other, and no one shall spare either his parents or his children. Then shall happen such things as may truly be accounted great prodigies. The wolf shall devour the sun, and a severe loss will that be for mankind. The other wolf will take the moon, and this too will cause great mischief. Then the stars shall be hurled from the heavens, and the earth so violently shaken that trees will be torn up by the roots. The tottering mountains tumble headlong from their foundations, and all bonds and fetters be shivered in pieces. Fenrir then breaks loose, and the sea rushes over the earth on account of the Midgar serpent turning with giant force and gaining the land. On the waters floats the ship Nagelfar, which is constructed of the nails of dead men. For which reason great care should be taken to die with paired nails, for he who dies with his nails unpaired supplies materials for the building of this vessel, which both gods and men wish may be finished as late as possible. But in this flood shall Nagelfar float, and the giant Hrym be its steersman. The wolf Fenrir advancing opens his enormous mouth, the lower jaw reaches to the earth and the upper one to heaven, and would in fact reach still farther were there space to admit of it. Fire flashes from his eyes and nostrils. The Midgard serpent, placing himself by the side of the wolf, vomits forth floods of poison which overwhelm the air and the waters. Amidst this devastation, heaven is cleft in twain, and the sons of Muspel ride through the breach. Sutur rides first, and both before and behind him flames burning fire. His sword outshines the sun itself. Bifrost, as they ride over it, breaks to pieces. Then they direct their course to the battlefield called Vigrid. Thither also repair the wolf Fenrir, and the Midgard serpent, and also Loki, with all the followers of Hel, and Hrym, with all the Hrym Thursar. 
but the sons of Muspel keep their effulgent bands apart on the field of battle, which is one hundred miles long on every side. Meanwhile, Heimdall stands up, and with all his force sounds the yellow horn to arouse the gods, who assemble without delay. Odin then rides to Mimir's well, and consults Mimir how he and his warriors ought to enter into action. The ash Yggdrasil begins to shake, nor is there anything in heaven or earth exempt from fear at that terrible hour. The Aser and all the heroes of Valhalla arm themselves, and speed forth to the field, led on by Odin, with his golden helm and resplendent cuirass, and his spear called Gangnir. Odin places himself against the wolf Fenrir. Thor stands by his side, but can render him no assistance, having himself to combat with the Midgard serpent. Frey encounters Sutcher, and terrible blows are exchanged ere Frey falls, and he owes his defeat to his not having that trusty sword he gave to Skirnir. That day the dog Garm, who had been chained in the Gnipa cave, breaks loose. He is the most fearful monster of all, and attacks Tyr, and they kill each other. Thor gains great renown for killing the Midgard serpent, but at the same time recoiling nine paces falls dead upon the spot, suffocated by the floods of venom which the dying serpent vomits forth upon him. The wolf swallows Odin, but at that instant Vidar advances, and setting his foot on the monster's lower jaw, seizes the other with his hand, and thus tears and rends him till he dies. Vidar is able to do this because he wears those shoes for which stuff has been gathering in all ages, namely the shreds of leather which are cut off to form the toes and heels of shoes, and it is on this account that those who would render a service to the Asir should take care to throw such shreds away. Loki and Heimdall fight, and mutually kill each other. After this, Surtur darts fire and flame over the earth, and the whole universe is consumed. End of section 78Section 79 of the Elder Eddas of Saman Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Saman Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Saman Sigfason. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Abodes of Future Bliss and Misery. What will remain, said Gangler, after heaven and earth and the whole universe shall be consumed, and after all the gods and the heroes of Valhalla and all mankind shall have perished? For ye have already told me that every one shall continue to exist in some world or other throughout eternity. There will be many abodes, replied Thridi, some good, others bad. The best place of all to be in will be Gimli, or heaven, and all who delight in quaffing good drink will find a great store in the hall called Brimir, which is also in heaven, in the region Okolni. There is also a fair hall of ruddy gold called Sindri, which stands on the mountains of Nida, Nidafjol. In those halls righteous and well-minded men shall abide. In Nastrond there is a vast and direful structure with doors that face the north. It is formed entirely of the backs of serpents, wattled together like wicker work. But the serpents' heads are turned towards the inside of the hall, and continually vomit forth floods of venom, in which wade all those who commit murder, or who forswear themselves. End of section 79 Section 80 of the Elder Eddas of Saman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Saman Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Saman Sigfusson. 
Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson The Renovation of the Universe Will any of the gods survive? And will there be any longer a heaven and an earth? demanded Gangler. There will arise out of the sea, replied Har, another earth most lovely and verdant, with pleasant fields where the grain shall grow unsown. Vidar and Vali shall survive. Neither the flood nor Surtur's fire shall harm them. They shall dwell on the plain of Ida, where Asgard formerly stood. Thither shall come the sons of Thor, Modi and Magni, bringing with them their father's mallet Mjolnir. Baldur and Hoder shall also repair thither from the abode of death, Hel. There shall they sit and converse together, and call to mind their former knowledge and the perils they underwent, and the fight of the wolf Fenrir and the Midgar serpent. There too shall they find in the grass those golden tablets, orbs which the Asir once possessed. As it is said, there dwell Vidar and Vali in the gods' holy seats, when slaked Surtur's fire is, but Modi and Magni will Mjolnir possess and strife put an end to. Thou must know, moreover, that during the conflagration caused by Surtur's fire, a woman named Leif, life, and a man named Lifthrasir lie concealed in Hodmimir's forest. They shall feed on morning dew, and their descendants shall soon spread over the whole earth. But what thou wilt deem more wonderful is, that the sun shall have brought forth a daughter more lovely than herself, who shall go in the same track formerly trodden by her mother. And now, continued Thridi, if thou hast any further questions to ask, I know not who can answer thee, for I never heard tell of any one who could relate what will happen in the other ages of the world. Make, therefore, the best use thou canst of what has been imparted to thee. Upon this Gangler heard a terrible noise all around him. He looked everywhere, but could see neither palace nor city, nor anything save a vast plain. He therefore set out on his return to his own kingdom, where he related all that he had heard and seen, and ever since that time these tidings have been handed down by oral tradition. End of section 80section eighty one of the elder eddas of samen sigfason and the younger eddas of snorra sturlison this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. the elder eddas of samen sigfason and the younger eddas of snorra sturlison by samen sigfason translated by rasmus b anderson aegir's journey to asgard Aegir, who was well skilled in magic, once went to Asgard, where he met with a very good reception. Supper time being come, the twelve mighty Asir, Odin, Thor, Njord, Frey, Tyr, Heimdall, Bragi, Vidar, Vali, Ullur, Hoinir, and Forseti, together with the Asinur, Frigga, Freya, Gefion, Iduna, Gerda, Siguna, Fulla, and Nanna, seated themselves on their lofty doom seats in a hall around which were ranged swords of such surpassing brilliancy that no other light was requisite they continued long at table drinking meat of a very superior quality while they were emptying their capacious drinking horns agir who sat next to bragi requested him to relate something concerning the asir Bragi instantly complied with his request by informing him of what had happened to Iduna. End of section 81 Section 82 of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfason and the Younger Eddas by Snorri Sturluson by Samen Sigfason. 
Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson Iduna and her Apples Once, he said, when Odin, Loki, and Hoenir went on a journey, they came to a valley where a herd of oxen were grazing, and being sadly in want of provisions, did not scruple to kill one for their supper. Vain, however, were their efforts to boil the flesh. They found it, every time they took off the lid of the kettle, as raw as when first put in. While they were endeavouring to account for this singular circumstance, a noise was heard above them, and on looking up they beheld an enormous eagle perched on the branch of an oak tree. "'If ye are willing to let me have my share of the flesh,' said the eagle, "'it shall soon be boiled.' And on their assenting to this proposal, it flew down and snatched up a leg and two shoulders of the ox, a proceeding which so incensed Loki that he laid hold of a large stock and made it fall pretty heavily on the eagle's back. It was, however, not an eagle that Loki struck, but the renowned giant Thiassi, clad in his eagle plumage. Loki soon found this out to his cost, for while one end of the stock stuck fast to the eagle's back, he was unable to let go his hold of the other end, and was consequently trailed by the eagle-clad giant over rocks and forests, until he was almost torn to pieces. Loki in this predicament began to sue for peace, but Thiassi told him that he should never be released from his hold until he bound himself by a solemn oath to bring Iduna and her apples out of Asgard. Loki very willingly gave his oath to effect this object, and went back in a piteous plight to his companions. On his return to Asgard, Loki told Iduna that, in a forest at a short distance from the celestial residence, he had found apples growing, which he thought were of a much better quality than her own, and that at all events it was worth while making a comparison between them. Iduna, deceived by his words, took her apples, and went with him into the forest. But they had no sooner entered it than Thiassi, clad in his eagle plumage, flew rapidly towards them, and catching up Iduna, carried her treasure off with him to Jotunheim. The gods, being thus deprived of their renovating apples, soon became wrinkled and grey. Old age was creeping fast upon them, when they discovered that Loki had been, as usual, the contriver of all the mischief that had befallen them. They therefore threatened him with condign punishment if he did not instantly hit upon some expedient for bringing back Iduna and her apples to Asgard. Loki, having borrowed from Freya her falcon plumage, flew into Jotunheim, and finding that Thiassi was out at sea fishing, lost no time in changing Iduna into a sparrow, and flying off with her. But when Thiassi returned and became aware of what had happened, he donned his eagle plumage and flew after them. When the Asir saw Loki approaching, holding Iduna transformed into a sparrow between his claws and Thiassi with his outspread eagle wings ready to overtake him, they placed on the walls of Asgard bundles of chips, which they set fire to the instant that Loki had flown over them, and as Thiassi could not stop his flight, the fire caught his plumage, and he thus fell into the power of the Asir, who slew him within the portals of the celestial residence. When these tidings came to Thiassi's daughter, Skadi, she put on her armor and went to Asgard, fully determined to avenge her father's death. But the Asir, having declared their willingness to atone for the deed, an amicable arrangement was entered into. Skadi was to choose a husband in Asgard, and the Asir were to make her laugh, a feat which she flattered herself it would be impossible for any one to accomplish. Her choice of a husband was to be determined by a mere inspection of the feet of the gods, it being stipulated that the feet should be the only part of their persons visible until she had made known her determination. In inspecting the row of feet placed before her, Skadi took a fancy to a pair, which she flattered herself from their fine proportions, must be those of Baldur. They were, however, Njord's, and Njord was accordingly given her for a husband, and as Loki managed to make her laugh by playing some diverting antics with a goat, 
the atonement was fully effected. It is even said that Odin did more than had been stipulated by taking out Thiasi's eyes and placing them to shine as stars in the firmament. End of section 82section eighty three of the elder eddas of Samen Sigfusson and the younger eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The elder eddas of Samen Sigfusson and the younger eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Samen Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. The Origin of Poetry. Agir having expressed the wish to know how poetry originated, Bragi informed him that the Asir and Vanir, having met to put an end to the war which had been long carried on between them, a treaty of peace was agreed to, and ratified by each party spitting into a jar. As a lasting sign of the amity which was thenceforth to subsist between the contending parties, the gods formed out of this spittle a being to whom they gave the name of Kvasir, and whom they endowed with such a high degree of intelligence that no one could ask him a question that he was unable to answer. Kvasir then traversed the whole world to teach men wisdom, but was at length treacherously murdered by the dwarfs Fjallar and Galar, who, by mixing up his blood with honey, composed a liquor of such surpassing excellence that whoever drinks of it acquires the gift of song. When the Asir inquired what had become of Kvasir, the dwarfs told them that he had been suffocated with his own wisdom, not being able to find any one who by proposing to him a sufficient number of learned questions might relieve him of its superabundance. Not long after this event, Fialar and Galar managed to drown the giant Gillig and murder his wife, deeds which were avenged by their son Suttung, taking the dwarfs out to sea and placing them on a shoal which was flooded at high water. In this critical position they implored Suttung to spare their lives and accept the verse-inspiring beverage which they possessed as an atonement for having killed their parents. Suttung, having agreed to these conditions, released the dwarfs, and carrying the mead home with him, committed it to the care of his daughter Gunlauth. Hence poetry is indifferently called Kvasir's blood, Suttung's mead, the dwarfs' ransom, etc. End of section 83 Section 84 of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfusson and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Samen Sigfusson. Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson. Odin Beguiles the Daughter of Baugi. Asir then asked how the gods obtained possession of so valuable a beverage, on which Bragi informed him that Odin, being fully determined to acquire it, set out for Jotunheim, and after journeying for some time, came to a meadow in which nine thralls were mowing. Entering into conversation with them, Odin offered to wet their sights, an offer which they gladly accepted, and finding that the whetstone he made use of had given the sights an extraordinary sharpness, asked him whether he was willing to dispose of it. Odin, however, threw the whetstone in the air, and in attempting to catch it as it fell, each thrall brought his sight to bear on the neck of one of his comrades, so that they were all killed in this scramble. Odin took up his night's lodging at the house of Suttung's brother, Baugi, who told him that he was sadly at a loss for laborers, his nine thralls having slain each other. Odin, who went under the name of Bolverk, said that for a draught of Suttung's mead he would do the work of nine men for him. The terms agreed on, Odin worked for Baugi the whole summer, but Suttung was deaf to his brother's entreaties, and would not part with a drop of his precious liquor, 
which was carefully preserved in a cavern under his daughter's custody. Into this cavern Odin was resolved to penetrate. He therefore persuaded Baugi to bore a hole through the rock, which he had no sooner done than Odin, transforming himself into a worm, crept through the crevice, and resuming his natural shape, won the heart of Gunlauth. After passing three nights with a fair maiden, he had no great difficulty in inducing her to let him take a draught out of each of the three jars, called Odhrorir, Bodn, and Son, in which the mead was kept. But wishing to make the most of his advantage, he pulled so deep that not a drop was left in the vessels. Transforming himself into an eagle, he then flew off as fast as his wings could carry him, but Satan, becoming aware of the stratagem, also took upon himself an eagle's guise and flew after him. The Asir, on seeing him approach Asgard, set out in the yard all the jars they could lay their hands on, which Odin filled by discharging through his beak the wonder-working liquor he had drunken. He was, however, so near being caught by Satan that some of the liquor escaped him by an impure vent, and as no care was taken of this, it fell to the share of the poet-tasters. But the liquor discharged in the jars was kept for the gods, and for those men who have sufficient wit to make a right use of it. Hence poetry is also called Odin's booty, Odin's gift, the beverage of the gods, etc., etc. End of section 84 End of the Elder Eddas of Samen Sigfason and the Younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson by Samen Sigfason Translated by Rasmus B. Anderson